Section 24 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 57 The Irish Church, Part 2. Public expectation was not kept long in suspense. A few days after the debate on Mr. Maguire's motion, Mr. Gladstone gave a notice of a series of resolutions on the subject of the Irish State Church. The resolutions were three in number. The first declared that in the opinion of the House of Commons it was necessary that the established Church of Ireland should cease to exist as an establishment, due regard being had to all personal interests and to all individual rights of property. The second resolution pronounced it expedient to prevent the creation of new personal interests by the exercise of any public patronage and the third asked for an address to the queen praying that her majesty would place at the disposal of parliament her interest in the temporalities of the irish church the subject of these resolutions was simply to prepare for the actual disestablishment of the church by providing that no further appointments should be made and that the act of patronage should be stayed until Parliament should decide the fate of the whole institution. On March 30, 1868, Mr. Gladstone proposed his resolutions. Not many persons could have had much doubt as to the result of the debate, but if there were any such, their doubts must have begun to vanish when they read the notice of amendment to the resolutions which was given by Lord Stanley. The amendment proclaimed even more surely than the resolutions the impending fall of the Irish Church. Lord Stanley must have been supposed to speak in the name of the government and the Conservative Party, and his amendment merely declared that the House, while admitting that considerable modifications in the temporalities of the Church in Ireland might appear to be expedient, was of opinion that any proposition tending to the disestablishment or disendowment of that church ought to be reserved for the decision of the new parliament mr gladstone seized on the evidence offered by the terms of such an amendment he observed that before the hour at which notice was given of that amendment he had thought that the thread of the remaining life of the irish established church was short but since the notice was given he thought it shorter still for as mr gladstone put it suppose his resolutions had been declarations calling for the abolition of the house of lords was it possible to conceive that the government would have met them by an amendment admitting that the constitution of the upper house might appear to stand in need of considerable modification but offering the opinion that any proposal tending to the abolition of that house ought to be left to the decision of a new parliament if such an amendment were offered by the government, the whole country would at once understand that it was not intended to defend the existence of the House of Lords. So the country now understood, with regard to the Irish Church. Lord Stanley's amendment asked only for delay. It did not plead that tomorrow would be sudden. It only asked that the stroke of doom should not be allowed to fall on the Irish Church today. The debate was one of great power and interest. Some of the speakers were heard at their very best. Mr. Bright made a speech which was well worthy of the occasion in the orator. Mr. Gathorne Hardy was in his very element. He flung aside all consideration of amendment, compromise, or delay, and went in for a vehement defense of the Irish Church. He spoke in the spirit of Mr. Rouer's famous Jamais. Mr. Hardy was not a debater of keen logical power, nor an orator of genuine inspiration, but he always could rattle a defiant drum with excellent effect. He beat the war drum this time with tremendous energy. On the other hand, Mr. Lowe threw an intensity of bitterness remarkable even for him into the unsparing logic with which he assailed the Irish church. That church, he said, was like an exotic brought from a far country, tended with infinite pains and useless trouble, 
It is kept alive with the greatest difficulty and at great expense in an uncongenial climate and an ungrateful soil. The curse of barrenness is upon it. It has no leaves, puts forth no blossom, and yields no fruit. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Not the least remarkable speech of the debate was made by Lord Cranbourne, who denounced the government of which he was not long since a member, with an energy of hatred almost like ferocity. He accused his late colleagues of having in every possible way betrayed the cause of conservatism, and he assailed Mr. Disraeli personally, in a manner which made older members think of the days when Mr. Disraeli was denouncing Sir Robert Peel. No eloquence and no invective, however, could stay the movement begun by Mr. Gladstone. When the division was called, there were 270 votes for the amendment and 331 against it. The doom of the Irish Church was pronounced by a majority of 61. Mr. Disraeli made a wild effort by speech and by letter to get up an alarm in the country on the score of some imaginary alliance or conspiracy between high church ritualists and Irish Romanists. The attempt was a complete failure. There was only a little flash. No explosion came. The country did not show the slightest alarm. An interval was afforded for agitation on both sides. The House of Commons had only decided against Lord Stanley's amendment. Mr. Gladstone's resolutions had yet to be discussed. Lord Russell presided at a great meeting held in St. James's Hall for the purpose of expressing public sympathy with the movement to disestablish the Irish Church. Many meetings were held by those on the other side of the question as well. But it was obvious to everyone that there was no great force in the attempt at a defense of the Irish Church. That institution had, in truth, a position which only became less and less defensible the more it was studied. Every example and argument drawn from the history of the Church of England was but another condemnation of the Church of Ireland. During one of the subsequent debates in the House of Lords, Lord Derby introduced with remarkable effect an appropriate quotation from Scott's Guy Mannering, he was warning his listeners that if they helped the enemies of the Irish Church to pull it down, they would be preparing the way for the destruction of the English Church as well. He turned to that striking passage in Guy Mannering, where Meg Merrilies confronts the Laird of Ellangowan about the eviction of the gypsies, and warns him that, This day have ye quenched seven smoking hearths. See if the fire in your ain parlour burn the blither for that. Ye have riven the thack off seven cotter houses. Look if your ain roof tree stand the faster. Nothing could be more apt as a political appeal or more effective in a rhetorical sense than this quotation. But it did not illustrate the relations between the English and the Irish Church. The real danger to the English Church would have been a protracted and obstinate maintenance of the Church of Ireland. It is not necessary here to enter upon any of the general arguments for or against the principle of a state church, but it will be admitted by every one that the claim made on behalf of the Church of England is that it is the church of the great majority of the English people, and that it has a spiritual work to do, which the majority of the nation admit to be its appropriate task. To maintain the Church of England on that ground is only to condemn the Church of Ireland. The more strongly an Englishman was inclined to support his own church, the more anxious he ought to have been to repudiate the claim of the Irish Church to a similar position. The state church in Ireland was like a mildewed ear blasting its wholesome brother. If the two institutions had to stand or fall together, there could be but one end to the difficulty. Both must fall. Mr. Gladstone's first resolution came to a division about a month after the defeat of Lord Stanley's amendment. It was carried by a majority somewhat larger than that which had rejected the amendment. 330 votes were given for the resolution, 265 against it. The majority for the resolution was therefore 65. Mr. Disraeli quietly observed that the government must take some decisive step in consequence of that vote, 
and a few days afterwards it was announced that as soon as the necessary business could be got through, Parliament would be dissolved and an appeal made to the country. On the last day of July the dissolution took place and the elections came on in November. Not for many years had there been so important a general election. The keenest anxiety prevailed as to its results. The new constituencies created by the Reform Bill were to give their votes for the first time. The question at issue was not merely the existence of the Irish State Church. It was a general struggle of advanced liberalism against Toryism. No one could doubt that Mr. Gladstone, if he came into power, would enter on a policy of more decided liberalism than had ever been put into action since the days of the Reform Bill of Lord Grey and Lord John Russell. The result of the elections was, on the whole, what might have been expected. The Liberals had a great majority. But there were many curious and striking instances of the growing strength of conservatism in certain parts of the country. Lancashire, once a very stronghold of Liberalism, retained only Tories for its county divisions, and even in most cases elected Tories to represent its boroughs. Eight conservatives came in for the county of Lancaster, and among those whom their election displaced were no less eminent persons than Mr. Gladstone and Lord Hartington. Mr. Gladstone was defeated in southwest Lancashire, but the result of the contest had been generally anticipated, and therefore some of his supporters put him up for Greenwich also, and he was elected there. He had been passing step by step from less popular to more popular constituencies. From the University of Oxford he had passed to the Lancashire Division, and now, from the Lancashire constituency, he went on to a place where the liberal portion of the electors were inclined for the most part to be not merely radical but democratic. The contest in North Lancashire was made more interesting than it would otherwise have been by the fact that it was not alone a struggle between opposing principles and parties, but also one between two great rival houses. Lord Hartington represented the great Cavendish family. Mr. Frederick Stanley was the younger son of Lord Derby. Lord Hartington was defeated by a large majority and was left out of Parliament for a few months. He was afterwards elected for the Radnor Boroughs. Mr. Mill was defeated at Westminster. His defeat was brought about by a combination of causes. He had been elected in a moment of sudden enthusiasm, and the enthusiasm had now had time to cool away. He had given some offence in various quarters by a too great independence of action and of expression. On many questions of deep interest, he had shown that he was entirely out of harmony with the views of the vast majority of his constituents, whatever their religious denomination might be. He had done some things which people called eccentric, and an English popular constituency does not love eccentricity. His opponent, Mr. W. H. Smith, was very popular in Westminster and had been quietly canvassing it for years. Perhaps it may be hinted, too, that Mr. Mill's manly resolve not to pay any part of his election expenses did not contribute to make him a favorite candidate with a certain proportion of the constituency. He was known to be a generous and charitable man. He gave largely out of his modest fortune toward any purpose which he thought deserving of support. But he disapproved of the principle of calling on a candidate to pay for permission to perform very onerous public duties, and he would not consent to recognize the principle by contributing anything toward the cost of his own candidature. This was against him in the mind of many. In every great constituency there is a certain proportion of voters who like the idea of a man's being liberal of his money in a contest, even though they do not expect to have any share of it. Some of the Westminster electors had probably grown tired of being represented by one who was called a philosopher. Some other prominent public men lost their seats. Mr. Roebuck was defeated in Sheffield. His defeat was partly due to the strong stand he had made against the trades unions, but still more to the bitterness of the hostility he had shown to the northern states during the American Civil War. Mr. Milner Gibson and Mr. Bernal Osborne were also unseated. 
the latter got into Parliament again. The former disappeared from public life. He had done good service at one time as an ally of Cobden and Bright. Mr. Lowe was elected the first representative of the University of London, on which it will be remembered the Conservative Reform Bill had conferred a seat. Mr. Disraeli afterwards humorously claimed the credit of having enabled Mr. Lowe to carry on his public career by providing for him the only constituency in England which would have accepted him as its representative. One curious fact about the elections was that the extreme Democratic candidates and those who were called the working men's candidates were in every instance rejected. This was the first general election with household suffrage in boroughs and the lowered franchise in counties. It might have been supposed that the votes of the working men of the people who live in those small houses would have decided many a contest in favor of the candidates representing their cause or their class. But the candidates who appealed especially to working men failed in every instance to secure election. Mr. Ernest Jones, Mr. Beals, Mr. Mason Jones, Mr. Odger, Mr. Bradley tried and failed. Either our new masters were not so powerful as they were expected to prove, or they were very much like our old masters in their taste for representation. The new Parliament was to all appearance less marked in its liberalism than that which had gone before it. But so far as mere numbers went, the Liberal Party was much stronger than it had been. In the new House of Commons it could count upon a majority of about a hundred and twenty, whereas in the late Parliament it had but sixty. Mr. Gladstone, it was clear, would now have everything in his own hands, and the country might look for a career of energetic reform. While the debates on Mr. Gladstone's resolutions were still going on, there came to England the news that Lord Broome was dead. He had died at Caen in his ninetieth year. His death was a quiet passing away from a world that had well nigh forgotten him. Seldom has a political career been so strangely cut short as that of Lord Broom. From the time when the Whig administration was formed without him, he seemed to have no particular business in public life. He never had from that hour the slightest influence on any political party or any political movement. His restless figure was seen moving about the House of Lords, like that of a man who felt himself out of place there, and was therefore out of humor with himself and his company. He often took part in debate, and for many years he continued to show all the fire and energy of his earlier days. But of late he had almost entirely dropped out of politics. Happily for him, the Social Science Association was formed, and he acted for a long time as its principal guide, philosopher, and friend. He made speeches at its meetings, presided at many of its banquets, and sometimes showed that he could still command the resources of a mass of eloquence. His social science had a curious air of unreality about it. It seemed as if it had been hastily put together out of that penny cyclopedia in which at one time he had so much concern. The men of the younger generation looked at him with interest and wonder. They found it hard to realize the fact that only a few years before he was one of the most conspicuous and energetic figures in political agitation. Now he seemed oddly like some dethroned king who occupies his leisure in botanical studies, some once famous commander long out of harness who amuses himself with learning the flute. There were some who forgot Broom, the great reformer, altogether and only thought of Broom, the patron and orator of the Social Science Association. He passed his time between Caen, which he may be said to have discovered, and London. At one time he had had the idea of actually becoming a citizen of France, being of opinion that it would set a good example for the brotherhood of peoples if he were to show how a man could be a French and an English citizen at the same time. He had outlived nearly all his early friends and foes. Melbourne, Gray, Durham, Campbell, Lyndhurst had passed away. The death of Lyndhurst had been a great grief to him. It is said that in his failing later years he often directed his coachman to drive him to Lord Lyndhurst's house, as if his old friend and gossip were still among the living. At last 
Broom began to give unmistakable signs of vanishing intelligence. His appearances in public were mournful exhibitions. He sometimes sat at a dinner party and talked loudly to himself of something which had no concern with the time, the place, or the company. His death created but a mere momentary thrill of emotion in England. He had made bitter enemies and cherished strong hatreds in his active years, and like all men who have strong hatreds, he had warm affections too. But the close friends and the bitter enemies were gone alike had passed like snow long, long ago with the time of the Barmecides, and the agitation about the Irish church was scarcely interrupted for a moment by the news of his death. Broom's writings are not read now. No one turns to his speeches, those speeches that once set England aflame. His philosophy, his learning, his science, his Greek, were all so curiously superficial that it is no wonder if enemies sometimes declared them to be mere sham. As the memoirs of his contemporaries begin to be published, we receive more and more evidence of the prodigious vanity which made Broom believe that no one could do anything so well in any department as he could do everything in every department. The Edinburgh Review he appears to have regarded as a means by which he was to display the genius and acquirements, and others were to puff the speeches of Henry Broom. A strange sight was seen one day at a meeting of the Social Science Association when Lord Broom, then on the eve of his complete intellectual decline, introduced to the company a man so old that he seemed to belong to an elder world altogether. A man with a wasted, wrinkled, wizard-like face, who wore a black silk skull cap and a gabardine. This was Robert Owen, and it was Owen's last appearance in public. He died a few days after in his ninetieth year. Broom at that time was ten years younger, and he introduced Owen with all the respectful and almost filial carefulness which sturdy youth might show to sinking age. For the moment, it would almost seem as if the self-conceit which made Broom believe himself a great critic and a great Greek scholar had made him also believe that for him time was nothing and that he was still a young man. End of section 24section 25 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 58, Irish Ideas, Part 1. Seventy years before Mr. Gladstone's accession to the office of First Lord of the Treasury, Fox had enunciated the principle that Ireland ought to be governed by Irish ideas. I would have the Irish government, said Fox in 1797, regulated by Irish notions and Irish prejudices, and I firmly believe, according to an Irish expression, that the more she is under Irish government, the more she will be bound to English interests. Now, for the first time, a great statesman at the head of an English government was about to make an effort at the practical realization of Fox's principle. At all other times, even the most considerate of English ministers had only thought of doing good to Ireland after the English notion of what was good. The highest idea of statesmanship went no farther than that of giving Ireland what were called equal laws with England. What England had and liked must be the best for Ireland. Such was the position assumed with quiet, sincere complacency in the course of many a parliamentary debate. What more, it was asked, can Ireland want? Has she not equal laws with England? We have a state church. She has a state church. She has the same land laws that are found to suit England, or at least that are found to suit the landlord class in England. What can England do for her more than to give her the same legislation that England herself enjoys? Now, for the first time, the man at the head of an English government was equal to an acknowledgment of what one might have thought the simple and elementary fact in politics, that the system which is a blessing to one country may be a curse to its neighbor. That which is called equality of system is sometimes only such equality 
is that illustrated by the too often quoted yet very appropriate example of procrustes bed ireland had been stretched upon that bed for centuries often with the best possible intentions on the part of some well-meaning political procrustes who could not for the life of him see why she should not like to be lengthened or shortened pulled this way or that in order to bring her into seeming harmony with the habitudes and constitutional systems of england the parliament which was called together in the close of 1868 was known to have before it this great task of endeavouring to govern ireland according to irish ideas mr gladstone had proclaimed this purpose himself he had made it known that he would endeavour to deal with ireland's three great difficulties the state church the tenure of land and the system of national education men's minds were wrought up to the enterprise the country was in a temper to try heroic remedies the public were tired with a government which merely tinkered at legislation putting in a little patch here and stopping up for the moment a little hole there perhaps therefore there was a certain disappointment as the general character of the new parliament began to be understood the eminent men on whom all eyes turned in the old parliament were to be seen of all eyes in the new it was clear that mr gladstone would be master of the situation but there did not seem anything particularly hero-like in the general aspect of the new house of commons its composition was very much the same as that of the old vast sums of money had been spent upon the elections rich men were as before in immense preponderance elder and younger sons of great families were as many as ever the english constituencies under the new suffrage were evidently no whit less fond of lords no whit less devoted to wealth than they had been under the old not a single man of extreme democratic opinions had a seat in the new house of commons where any marked change had been made it showed itself in removing such men from parliament rather than in returning them to it mr disraeli did not meet the new parliament as prime minister he decided very properly that it would be a mere waste of public time to wait for the formal vote of the house of commons which would inevitably command him to surrender he at once resigned his office and mr gladstone was immediately sent for by the queen and invited to form an administration mr gladstone it would seem was only beginning his career he was nearly sixty years of age but there were scarcely any evidences of advancing years to be seen on his face and he had all the fire of proud indomitable youth in his voice and his manner he had come into office at the head of a powerful party there was hardly anything he could not do with such a following and with such personal energy the government he formed was one of remarkable strength the one name upon its list after that of the prime minister himself which engaged the interest of the public was that of mr bright speaking to his birmingham constituents on his re-election after accepting the office of the president of the board of trade mr bright referred to his new position in a few sentences of impressive and dignified eloquence he had not sought office he said it had come to him i should have preferred much to remain in the common rank of the simple citizenship in which heretofore i have lived there is a charming story contained in a single verse of the old testament which has often struck me as one of great beauty many of you will recollect that the prophet in journeying to and fro was very hospitably entertained by what is termed in the bible a shunammite woman in return for the hospitality of his entertainment he wished to make her some amends and he called her and asked her what there was that he should do for her shall i speak for thee to the king or to the captain of the host and it has always appeared to me a great answer that the shunamite woman returned she said i dwell among my own people when the question was put to me whether i would step into the position in which i now find myself the answer from my heart was the same i wish to dwell among my own people it was impossible however that a ministry could now be formed without mr bright's name appearing in it mr gladstone at first offered him the office of secretary of state for india the state of mr bright's health would not allow him to undertake 
the very laborious duties of such a place, and probably in any case it would have been repugnant to his feelings to accept a position which might have called on him to give orders for the undertaking of a war. Every man in a cabinet is, of course, responsible for all its acts, but there is still an evident difference so far as personal feeling is concerned between acquiescing in some inevitable policy of war and actually directing that war shall be made. The position of President of the Board of Trade was that which had been offered by Lord Palmerston to Mr. Bright's old friend Richard Cobden, and it seemed in every way well suited to Mr. Bright himself. Many men felt a doubt as to the possibility of Mr. Bright subduing his personal independence and his outspoken ways to the discipline and reticence of a cabinet, and Mr. Bright himself appeared to be a little afraid that he would be understood as thoroughly approving of every measure in which he might, by official order, feel compelled to acquiesce. He cautioned his Birmingham constituents not to believe that he had changed any of his opinions until his own voice publicly proclaimed the change, and he made what might almost be called an appeal to them to remember that he was now one man serving in a band of men, no longer responsible only for himself, no longer independent of the acts of others. Lord Granville was secretary for the colonies under the new administration, Lord Clarendon foreign secretary, the Duke of Argyll was entrusted with the Indian office, Mr. Cardwell, to all appearance, one of the coldest and least warlike of men, was made secretary for war, and had in his charge one of the greatest reforms of the administration. Lord Hartington, Lord Dufferin, Mr. Childers, and Mr. Bruce had places assigned to them. Mr. Laird became first commissioner of public works, Mr. W. E. Forster had the office of vice president of the council, and came in for work hardly less important than that of the prime minister himself. The Lord Chancellor was Lord Hatherley, formerly Sir William Page Wood. Many years before, when Lord Hatherley was only known as a rising man among advanced liberals, and when Mr. Bright was still regarded by all true conservatives as a radical demagogue, Mr. Bright and Mr. Wood were talking of the political possibilities of the future. Mr. Bright jestingly expressed a hope that whenever he came to be member of a cabinet, Mr. Wood might be Lord Chancellor. Nothing could then have seemed less likely to come to pass. As Lord Hatherley and Mr. Bright met on their way to Windsor to wait on the Queen, Mr. Bright reminded his colleague of the jest that had apparently been prophetic. Mr. Gladstone went to work at once with his Irish policy. The new Parliament was opened by commission on December 10th for the election of Speaker and the swearing-in of the members. The real work of the session began on the 16th of the following February, 1869. The royal speech declared that the ecclesiastical arrangements of Ireland would be brought under the consideration of the House at a very early date, and that the legislation which will be necessary in order to their final adjustment, will make the largest demands on the wisdom of Parliament. The Queen expressed her conviction that Parliament, in considering that legislation, would be governed by the constant aim to promote the welfare of religion through the principles of equal justice, to secure the action of the undivided feeling and opinion of Ireland on the side of loyalty and law, to efface the memory of former contentions and to cherish the sympathies of an affectionate people. On March 1st, the Prime Minister introduced his measure for the disestablishment and the partial disendowment of the Irish State Church. He introduced the measure in a speech which occupied more than three hours in the delivery, but which even Mr. Disraeli admitted did not contain one sentence that the subject and the argument could well have spared. The proposals of the government were that the Irish Church should almost at once cease to exist as a state establishment and should pass into the condition of a free Episcopal Church. As a matter of course, the Irish bishops were to lose their seats in the House of Lords. A synodal or governing body was to be elected from the clergy and laity of the Church and was to be recognized by the government and duly incorporated. The union between the Churches of England and Ireland was to be dissolved, and the Irish ecclesiastical courts were to be abolished. 
There were various and complicated arrangements for the protection of the life interests of those already holding positions in the Irish Church, and for the appropriation of the fund which would return to the possession of the state when all these interests had been fairly considered and dealt with. It must be owned that the government dealt with vested interests in no niggard spirit. If they erred at all, they erred on the side of too much generosity. But they had arrayed against them adversaries so strong that they probably felt it absolutely necessary to buy off some of the opposition by a liberal compensation to all those who were to be deprived of their dignity as clergymen of a state church. When, however, all had been paid off who could establish any claim, and some perhaps who had in strict fairness no claim whatever, there remained a large fund at the disposal of the government. This they resolved to set apart for the relief of unavoidable suffering in Ireland. It was not made very clear in the bill itself what the precise purposes were to which the surplus was to be applied, and there was a good deal of disputation afterwards as to the appropriation of the money. Mr. Gladstone's words and the words used in the preamble of the bill were the relief of unavoidable calamity and suffering. Mr. Gladstone spoke of making provision for the blind, the deaf, and the dumb, for reformatories, the training of nurses, and the support of county infirmaries. In a speech delivered at a later stage of the debate, Mr. Bright asked the House whether it would not be better to dispose of the money in such charitable dealing than in continuing to maintain three times the number of clergymen that could be of the slightest use to the church with which they were connected. We can, he said, do but little, it is true. We cannot re-illume the extinguished lamp of reason. We cannot make the deaf to hear. We cannot make the dumb to speak. It is not given to us from the thick film to purge the visual ray, and on the sightless eyeballs pour the day. But at least we can lessen the load of affliction, and we can make life more tolerable to vast numbers who suffer. The sum to be disposed of was very considerable. The gross value of the Irish church property was estimated at sixteen millions. From this sum would have to be deducted nearly five millions for the vested interests of incumbents, one million seven hundred thousand for compensation to curates and lay compensations, half a million for private endowments, for the Maynooth grant and the Regium Donum, about a million and a quarter there would be left nearly nine millions for any beneficent purpose on which the government and the country should make up their minds. The Maynooth Grant and the Regium Donum were to go with the Irish Church, and the same principle of compensation was to be applied to those who were to be deprived of them. The Regium Donum was an allowance from the sovereign for the maintenance of Presbyterian ministers in Ireland. It was begun by Charles the Second and let drop by James, but was restored by William the Third. William felt grateful for the support given him by the Presbyterians in Ireland during his contest with James, and indeed had little preference for one form of the Protestant faith over another. William, in the first instance, fixed the grant as a charge upon the customs of Belfast. The Maynooth grant has been already described in these pages. Both these grants, each a very small thing in itself, now came to an end, and the principle of equality among the religious denominations of Ireland was to be established. End of section 25section 26 of a history of our own times volume 4 by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 58 irish ideas part 2 we need not carry the reader through the long course of the debates which took place in the house of commons the bill was stoutly resisted by mr disraeli and his party they resisted it as a whole and they also fought it in detail. They proposed amendment after amendment in committee, and did all they could to stay its progress, as well as to alter some of its arrangements. But there did not seem to be much of genuine earnestness in the speeches made by Mr. Disraeli. The fact that resistance was evidently hopeless 
had no doubt some effect upon the style of his eloquence. His speeches were amusing rather than impressive. They were full of good points. They sparkled with happy illustrations and allusions, odd conceits and bewildering paradoxes. But the orator had evidently no faith in the cause he advocated, no faith, that is to say, in the possibility of its success. He must have seen too clearly that the church as a state establishment in Ireland was doomed, and he had not that intensity of interest in its maintenance which would have made him fight the course, as he had fought many a course before, with all the passionate eloquence of desperation. One of his lieutenants, Mr. Gathorne Hardy, was more effective as a champion of the sinking Irish church than Mr. Disraeli proved himself to be. Mr. Hardy was a man so constituted as to be only capable of seeing one side of a question at a time. He was filled with the conviction that the government were attempting an act of spoliation and sacrilege, and he stormed against the meditated crime with a genuine energy which occasionally seemed to supply him with something like eloquence. A peculiar interest attached to the part taken in the debate by Sir Roundell Palmer, it was natural that Sir Roundell Palmer should be with Mr. Gladstone. Everyone expected in the first instance that he would have held high office in the new administration. He was one of the very foremost lawyers and the best parliamentary debaters of the day, and the Woolsack seemed to be his fitting place. But Sir Roundell Palmer could not conscientiously agree to the disestablishment of the Irish State Church. He was willing to consent to very extensive alterations and reductions in the establishment, but he would not go with Mr. Gladstone all the way to the abolition of the church, and he therefore remained outside the ministry and opposed the bill. Some of the debates in the House of Lords were more interesting than those in the Commons. We have already referred to the eloquence and fervor with which Lord Derby opposed the proposition of the government. Two speeches delivered from the bench where the bishops sit attracted special attention. One may be said to have marked the close, the other the opening of a career. One was by Dr. Thurwall, Bishop of St. David's. The other by Dr. McGee, Bishop of Peterborough. The Bishop of St. David's spoke in favor of the bill and addressed himself particularly to the demolition of the superstitious sophism which would lead people to believe that the revenues of a purely human institution like the Irish Church were the sacred possession of heaven, and that to touch them even with the hand of reforming legislation would be an act of sacrilege. Dr. Thurwall well maintained on this occasion his noble reputation, both as an orator and as a man of intellect. Mr. Mill, in his autobiography, has given an interesting account of his first hearing Dr. Thurwall at one of the public discussions of a society in London some forty years before. The speaker with whom I was most struck, Mr. Mill says, was Thurwall the historian, since Bishop of St. David's, then a chancery barrister, unknown except by a high reputation for eloquence acquired at the Cambridge Union before the era of Austin and Macaulay. His speech was an answer to one of mine. Before he had uttered ten sentences, I set him down as the best speaker I had ever heard, and I have never since heard anyone whom I placed above him. Dr. McGee, on the other hand, was only beginning his career in the House of Lords. He had been but a short time Bishop of Peterborough. He had been raised to the Episcopal bench, it was said, chiefly because Mr. Disraeli, when in office, believed he saw in him the capacity to make a great parliamentary debater and champion of the political interests of the Church. Dr. McGee delivered a speech of remarkable fluency, energy, and vividness, a speech which might fairly be classed among the best efforts of the leading orators on either side of the controversy. It was more like the speech of a layman than of a prelate, although indeed it recalled, in some of its pugnacious passages, the recollection of the fighting bishops of the Middle Ages. If the fate of the Irish Church could have been averted or even postponed by impassioned eloquence, the Bishop of Peterborough might alone have done something to stay the stroke of doom. 
but the fate of the institution was sealed at the moment that Mr. Gladstone returned from the general elections in command of a liberal majority. The House of Lords were prudent enough not to set themselves against the clear declaration of national opinion. Many amendments were introduced and discussed, and some of these led to a controversy between the two Houses of Parliament, but the controversy ended in compromise. There were at one time rumours that the peers would reject or greatly delay the bill, and Mr. Bright wrote an angry letter on the subject addressed to a Birmingham meeting, in which he warned the House of Lords that by throwing themselves athwart the national course they might meet with accidents not pleasant for them to think of. Such a letter coming from a cabinet minister created a good deal of amazement and was made the subject of some sharp discussion in both Houses of Parliament. It was clear that Mr. Bright did not intend to allow his official position to interfere greatly with the emphatic nature of his utterances on public questions. Shocked and scandalized, as some of the peers professed to be, it is not impossible that the letter did some public service by virtue of its very indiscretion. It may have given timely warning to the House of Lords of the dangerous agitation that would arise if they were to set themselves in deliberate opposition to the will of the vast majority of the people. Rumors, too, were in circulation about the same time of the determination of the government to create new peers in such a number as to make passing the bill a certainty. Happily, however, it proved that there was no need for any such intervention on the part of the ministers and the crown. The time had gone by when the House of Lords cared to exhibit itself as a mere instrument of resistance to the measures of the representative chamber. The most formidable step the peers took was to carry on the debate on the second reading of the bill until three o'clock in the morning. The second reading was carried by 179 to 146 votes, and the remainder of the work done by the Lords was only a series of attempts, generally unsuccessful, to obtain here and there a small compromise on some of the less important clauses of the bill. On July 26th, 1869, the measure for the disestablishment of the Irish Church received the royal assent. Meanwhile, the wildest excitement prevailed out of doors among the defenders of the state church, Furious denunciations of the government resounded from platform and from pulpit. Even in measured and solemn convocation itself, the most impassioned and vehement outcries were heard. One divine spoke of the measure as a great national sin. Another stigmatized it as altogether ungodly, wicked, and abominable. A third called upon the queen to interfere personally and exhorted her rather to jeopardize her crown in the effort than leave the Irish church to be destroyed before her eyes. A great meeting was held in Exeter Hall at which Mr. Gladstone was stigmatized as a traitor to his queen, his country, and his God, and one reverend gentleman described the government as a cabinet of brigands. At a meeting held in Ireland, a Protestant clergyman reminded the pastors of every Protestant church that sooner than give their churches up to any apostate system, a barrel of gunpowder and a box of matches would send them flying to the winds of heaven. This was, however, only superfluous fury. No one proposed to turn the Protestant clergymen out of their churches. It is not impossible that the fiery ecclesiastic who gave this Guy Fox advice was himself ministering in a church which had been taken by force from its Catholic owners. The agitation against the bill produced, however, no sensible effect upon the mind of the country at large. It thundered and blazed for a few days or weeks here and there, and then, after occasional grumblings and sputterings, sank into mere silence. The Irish Church was therefore disestablished, and it was to a certain extent disendowed, only to a certain extent. As fortunate as Cleopatra, it contrived to retain enough to purchase what it had made known. The time during which the measure was in progress was turned to good account by the authorities of the establishment. The bill provided that no new interests should be created in the interval between its passing 
and the actual disestablishment, which was to take place on January 1, 1871. But while the measure was still under discussion, some of the rulers of the church thought it convenient to create as many new interests as possible. New curates entitled to compensation were made with an astonishing rapidity, and the incomes of some of the clergy were increased with liberal hand. Some sharp controversy was afterwards created by the manner in which the period of grace was thus turned to worldly and profitable account, and there can be little doubt that the effect of the policy of disestablishment was deprived of some of its satisfactory influence on the mind of Ireland by the over-liberal opportunities for compensation allowed to vested interests. It would be impossible, however, not to admit that the difficulties in Mr. Gladstone's way must have warned him that a rigorous dealing with such interests would prove dangerous to the success of his measure. The great fact was that by disestablishing the Irish Church, he proclaimed that the policy of religious ascendancy was banished forever from Ireland, and that the reign of equality had begun. Lord Derby did not long survive the passing of the measure which he had opposed with such fervor and so much pathetic dignity. His last speech was that which he delivered in the House of Lords against the second reading of the Irish Church Bill on June 17, 1869. I am an old man, he said. I have already passed three score years and ten. My official life is entirely closed. My political life is nearly so and in the course of nature my natural life cannot now be long. It was sooner ended, perhaps, than anyone expected who heard him deliver that last eloquent protest against a measure of reform which he was unable to resist. He died before the Irish state church had ceased to live. Doomed as it was, it outlasted its eloquent champion." In the interval between the passing and the practical operation of Mr. Gladstone's bill, on October 23rd, Lord Derby died at Knowsley, the residence of the Stanleys in Lancashire. His death made no great gap in English politics. He had for some time ceased to assert any really influential place in public affairs. His career had been eminent and distinguished, but its day had long been done. Lord Derby never was a statesman. He was not even a great leader of a party but he was a splendid figurehead for conservatism in or out of power. He was on the whole a superb specimen of the English political nobleman, proud of soul but sweet in temper and genial in manner, dignified as men are who feel instinctively that dignity pertains to them, and therefore never think of how to assert or to maintain it. He was eminently fitted by temperament, by nature, and by fortune for the place it was given him to hold. His parliamentary oratory has already become a tradition. It served its purpose admirably for the time. It showed, as Macaulay said, that Lord Derby possessed the very instinct of parliamentary debate. It was not weighted with the thought which could have secured it a permanent place in political literature, nor had it the imagination which would have lifted it into an atmosphere above the level of Hansard. In Lord Derby's own day, the unanimous opinion of both Houses of Parliament would have given him a place among the very foremost of parliamentary orators. Many competent judges went so far as to set him distinctly above all living rivals. Time has not ratified this judgment. It is impossible that the influence of an orator could have faded so soon if he had really been entitled to the praise which many of his contemporaries would freely have rendered to Lord Derby. The charm of his voice and style, his buoyant readiness, his rushing fluency, his rich profusion of words, his happy knack of illustration, allusion, and retort, all these helped to make men believe him a much greater orator than he really was. Something, too, was due to the influence of his position. It seemed a sort of condescension on the part of a great noble that he should consent to be an eloquent debater also, and to contend in parliamentary sword-play against professional champions like Peel and O'Connell and Broom. 
it must count for something in Lord Darby's fame that while far inferior to any of these men in political knowledge and in mental capacity, he could compare as an orator with each in turn, and were it but for his own day, were it but while the magic of his presence and his voice was yet a living influence, could be held by so many to have borne without disadvantage the test of comparison. When the Irish church had been disposed of, Mr. Gladstone at once directed his energies to the Irish land system. The state church had been declared by many to be merely a sentimental grievance. The land system of Ireland, if it was to be accounted a grievance at all, must have been acknowledged to be one of a terribly practical character. Ireland is essentially an agricultural country. It has few manufactures, not many large towns. Dublin, Belfast, Cork, Limerick, Waterford. These are the only towns that could be called large. Below these we come to places that in most other countries would be spoken of as villages or hamlets. The majority of the population of Ireland live on the land and by the land. The condition of the Irish tenantry may be painted effectively in a single touch when it is said that they were tenants at will. That fact would of itself be almost enough to account for the poverty and misery of the agricultural classes in Ireland. But there were other conditions, too, which tended the same way. The land of Ireland was divided among a comparatively small number of landlords, and the landlords were, as a rule, strangers, the representatives of a title acquired by conquest. Many of them were habitual absentees, who would as soon have thought of living in Ashanti as in Munster or Connaught. An able writer, Mr. James Godkin, in his Land War in Ireland, endeavors to make the condition of Ireland clear to English readers by asking them to consider what England would be under similar circumstances. Imagine, he says, that in consequence of rebellions against the Normans, the land of England had been confiscated three or four times after desolating wars and famines, so that all the native proprietors were expelled, and the land was parceled out to French soldiers and adventurers, on condition that the foreign planters should assist in keeping down the mere English by force of arms. Imagine that the English, being crushed by a cruel penal code for a century, were allowed to reoccupy the soil as mere tenants at will, under the absolute power of their French landlords. If all this be imagined by English legislators and English writers, they will be better able to understand the Irish land question and to comprehend the nature of Irish difficulties, as well as the justice of feeble, insincere, and baffled statesmen in casting the blame of Irish misery and disorder on the unruly and barbarous nature of Irishmen. In truth, the Irish agricultural population turned out exactly as any other race of human beings would have done under similar conditions. They held the land which was their only means of living at the mercy of the landlord or his agent. They had no interest in being industrious and improving their land. If they improved the patch of soil they worked on, their rent was almost certain to be raised, or they were turned out of the land without receiving a farthing of compensation for their improvements. End of section 26. Section 27 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 58, Irish Ideas, Part Three. Of course, there were many excellent landlords, humane and kindly men, men too who saw the wisdom of being humane and kind. But in the majority of cases, the landlords and the agents held firmly by what seemed to them the right of property, the right to get as high a price for a piece of land as it would fetch in open competition. The demand for land was so great the need of land was so vital that men would offer any price for it. Men would offer prices which they must have known they could never pay, 
which they must have known the land would never enable them to pay. Offering land for hire in Ireland was like offering money on loan to needy spendthrifts. Any terms would be snatched at by the desperate borrower today, no matter what was to happen tomorrow. When the tenant had got hold of his piece of land, he had no idea of cultivating it to the best of his strength and opportunities. Why should he? The moment his holding began to show a better appearance, that moment he might look to having his rent raised, or to being turned out in favor of some competitor who offered higher terms for occupation. Why should he improve? Whenever he was turned out of the land, he would have to leave his improvements for the benefit of the landlord or the newcomer. He was therefore content to scratch the soil instead of really cultivating it. He extracted all he could from it in his short day. He lived from hand to mouth, from hour to hour. The whole system of feudal tenure of land under a master was new to Ireland. It began with Ireland's conquest, and it was identified in the mind of the Irish peasant with Ireland's degradation. Everything was there that could make oppression bitter. The landlord began to be looked upon at last as the tenant's natural enemy. Ribbon societies were formed for the protection of the tenant. The protection afforded was only too often that of terrorism and assassination. The ribbonism of the south and west of Ireland was as strictly the product of the land system of the country as the trades union outrages in England were the offspring of the unequal and unjust legislation that gave all the power to the master and lent no protection to the workmen. All the while, five out of every six English writers and political speakers were discoursing gravely on the incurable idleness and lawlessness of the Celtic race and the Irish peasant. The law gave the Irish tenant no security for the fruit of his labor, and Englishmen wondered that he was not laborious. The law told him that when he had sown, he should not be entitled to reap, and Englishmen were angry that he would not persist in sowing. Imperial legislation showed itself his steadfast enemy, and Englishmen marveled at his want of respect for the law. In one province of Ireland, indeed, a better condition of things existed. Over the greater part of Ulster, the tenant rights system prevailed. This system was a custom merely, but it had gradually come to acquire something like the force of law. The principle of tenant right was that a man should be allowed to remain in undisturbed possession of his holding as long as he paid his rent, that he should be entitled on giving up the land to compensation for unexhausted improvements, and that he should be at liberty to sell the goodwill of his farm for what it would fetch in the market. The tenant was free to do what a man who has a long lease of any holding may do, he might sell to any bidder of whom his landlord approved the right to enter on the occupancy of the place. Wherever this tenant right principle prevailed, there was industry, there was prosperity. Where it did not prevail was the domain of poverty, idleness, discontent, and crime. The one demand of the Irish agricultural population everywhere was for some form of fixity of tenure, let it be sought by legalizing the Ulster custom everywhere, or by declaring that men should hold their land as long as they paid a fair rent, to be fixed by authorized and impartial valuation, or by some plan of establishing a peasant proprietary. Let the demand be made as it would, there was substantially one demand and one only, security of tenure. The demand was neglected or refused by generations of English statesmen, chiefly because no statesman would take the trouble to distinguish between words and things, between shadowy pedantic theories and clear substantial facts. Tenant right, said Lord Palmerston amid the cheers of an assembly mainly composed of landlords, is landlords wrong. Lord Palmerston forgot that the landlord, like everyone else in the Commonwealth, holds even his dearest rights of property, subject to the condition that his assertion of them is not inconsistent with the general wheel. The landlord holds his land as the shipowner holds his ship, 
and the railway company its lines of rail, subject to the right of the state to see that the duties of possession are properly fulfilled, and that the ownership is not allowed to become a public danger and a nuisance. Land is, from its very nature, from the fact that it cannot be increased in extent, and that the possession by one man is the exclusion of another, land is the form of property over which the state would most naturally be expected to reserve a right of ultimate control. Yet English statesmen for generations complacently asserted the impossibility of any legislative interference with the right of the landlord, as if legislation had not again and again interfered with the right of the factory owner, the owner of mines, the possessor of railway shares, the shopkeeper, the right of the master over his apprentice, the mistress in the hire of her maid of all work. Long years before Lord Palmerston talked so decisively of the landlord's right, a man of far more truly conservative mind than Lord Palmerston had defined in a few sentences the limits of private or corporate rights. In his speech on Fox's East India measure, Burke frankly met this difficulty about individual and corporate rights. He was speaking for the moment especially of chartered corporations, but of course a single owner of property can claim no greater right than a company of property owners. It has been said, if you violate this charter, what security has the charter of the bank in which public credit is so deeply concerned, and even the charter of London, in which the rights of so many subjects are involved? I answer, in the like case they have no security at all. No, no security at all. If the bank should, by every species of mismanagement, fall into a state similar to that of the East India Company, if it should be oppressed with demands it could not answer, engagements which it could not perform, and with bills for which it could not procure payment, no charter should protect such mismanagement from correction and such public grievances from redress. If the city of London had the means and the will of destroying an empire, and of cruelly oppressing and tyrannizing over millions of men as good as themselves, the charter of the city of London would prove no sanction to such tyranny and such oppression. Charters are kept when their purposes are maintained. They are violated when the privilege is supported against its end and its object. If ever there was a creature of law and of authority acting in place of law, it was the landlordism of Ireland. It was a plantation made by the orders of English sovereigns and governments. It was not a growth of the soil. It was strictly an exotic. It was imposed upon the country and the people. It could not plead in support of any of its alleged rights, even that prescriptive title which grows up with the growth of an institution that has held its place during all the ages to which tradition or memory goes back. The landlordism of Ireland was, compared with most European institutions, a thing of the day before yesterday. It was the creation of conquest, the impost of confiscation. It could plead no title whatever to maintain an unlimited right of action in opposition to the welfare of the people on whom it was forced. At least it could claim no such title when once the time had passed away which insisted that the right of conquest superseded all other human rights, that the tenant, like the slave, had no rights which his master was bound to respect and that the common weal meant simply the interests and privileges of the ruling class. The moment the title of the Irish land system came to be fairly examined, it was seen to be full of flaws. It was dependent on conditions that had never been fulfilled. It had not even made the landlord class prosperous. It had not even succeeded, as no doubt some of its founders intended that it should succeed, in colonizing the island with English and Scotch settlers. When the famine of 1846 and 1847 had tried the whole system with its gaunt, stern hand, legislation had perforce to interfere with the fancied rights of landlordism 
and invent a new judicial machinery for taking from the broken-down owner what he could keep no longer with profit to himself or the country. For generations the land-tenure system of Ireland had been the subject of parliamentary debate and parliamentary inquiry. The Devon Commission had made ample investigation of its principles and its operation. Mr. Sharman Crawford had in vain devoted an honest life to the advocacy of tenant right. Mr. Cardwell, Mr. Chichester Fortescue, Lord Nass, had introduced measures trying more or less feebly to deal with Irish land tenure. Nothing came of all this. The supposed right of the landlord stopped the way. The one simple demand of the occasion was, as we have shown, security of tenure, and it was an article of faith with English statesmanship until Mr. Gladstone's time that security for the tenant was confiscation for the landlord. Mr. Gladstone came into power full of genuine reforming energy and without the slightest faith in the economic wisdom of our ancestors. In a speech delivered by him during his electioneering campaign in Lancashire, he had declared that the Irish upas tree had three great branches, the state church, the land tenure system, and the system of education, and that he meant to hew them all down if he could. His figure of speech met with a good deal of contemptuous literary criticism, but it expressed a very resolute purpose. On February 15th, 1870, Mr. Gladstone introduced his Irish Land Bill into the House of Commons. The measure was one of far greater importance as regarded its principles than it proved to be in its practical operation. In plain words, what it did was to recognize the fact that the whole system of land tenure in Ireland, so far as it was the creature of law, was based upon a wrong principle. Mr. Gladstone's measure overthrew once for all the doctrine of the landlord's absolute and unlimited right. It recognized a certain property or partnership of the tenant in the land which he tilled. Mr. Gladstone took the Ulster tenant right, as he found it, and made it a legal institution. In places where the Ulster practice, or something analogous to it, did not exist, he threw upon the landlord the burden of proof as regarded the right of eviction. The tenant disturbed in the possession of his land could claim compensation for improvements, and the bill reversed the existing assumption of the law by presuming all improvements to be the property of the tenant, and leaving it to the landlord, if he could, to prove the contrary. The bill established a special judicial machinery for carrying out its provisions. It allowed the tribunals thus instituted to take into consideration not merely the strict legal conditions of each case, but also any circumstances that might affect the claim of the tenant as a matter of equity. Mr. Gladstone's great object was to bring about a state of things by virtue of which a tenant should not be dispossessed of his holdings so long as he continued to pay his rent, and should in any case be entitled to full compensation for any substantial improvements which his energy or his capital might have effected. The bill met on the whole with a cordial reception from the Irish members of Parliament, although some of its clauses were regarded with a doubt and disfavour which subsequent events, we believe, showed to be well-founded. Mr. Gladstone allowed landlords, under certain conditions, to contract themselves out of the provisions of the bill, and these conditions were so largely availed of in some parts of Ireland that there were more evictions after the bill had become law than before it had yet been thought of. On this ground, the measure was actually opposed by a small number of the popular representatives of Ireland. The general opinion, however, then and since was that the bill was of inestimable value to Ireland in the mere fact that it completely upset the fundamental principle on which legislation had always previously dealt with Irish land tenure. It recognized a certain ownership on the part of the tenant as well as that of the landlord. The new principle thus introduced might well be denounced as revolutionary by certain startled Irish landlords. It put an end to the reign of the landlord's absolute power. It reduced the landlord to the level of every other proprietor. 
of every other man in the country who had anything to sell or to hire. It recognized the palpable fact that there are certain conditions which make the ownership of land a more responsible possession than the ownership of property which admits of limitless expansion. The existing system of legislation had been founded not merely on injustice, but on untruth. It had denied the presence of conditions which were as certain and as palpable as the substance of the land itself. Therefore, the new legislation might, in one sense, have well been called revolutionary. It decided once for all against Lord Palmerston's famous dogma and declared that tenant right was not landlord's wrong. That was in itself a revolution. The bill passed without substantial alteration. The Conservatives as a party did not vote against the second reading. A division was forced on, but only eleven members voted against the motion that the bill be read a second time, and of these, only two or three belonged to the Conservative Party, and only one, Mr. Henley, was of any mark among the Conservatives. The small minority was chiefly made up of Irish members, who thought the bill inefficient and unsatisfactory. Long discussions in committee followed, but the only serious attempt made to interfere with the actual principle of the measure, an attempt embodied in an amendment moved by Mr. Disraeli, was defeated by a majority of more than seventy votes. The bill was read a third time in the Commons on May 30th. A debate of three nights took place in the House of Lords on the motion for the second reading, and many nights of discussion were occupied in committee. On August 1st, 1870, the bill received the royal assent. The second branch of the upas tree had been hewn down, but the woodsman's axe had yet to be laid to a branch of a tougher fibre, well calculated to turn the edge of even the best weapon and to jar the strongest arm that wielded it. Mr. Gladstone had dealt with church and land. He had yet to deal with university education. He had gone with Irish ideas thus far. End of section 27. Section 28 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 59 Reformation in a Flood, Part 1. On June 10th, 1870, men's minds were suddenly turned away from thought of political controversy by a melancholy announcement in the morning papers. The Irish Land Bill, the question of national education, the curiously ominous look of affairs in France, where the emperor had just been obtaining by means of the plebiscite a new guarantee of order and liberty, the terrible story of the capture and massacre of young English tourists by Greek brigands in the neighborhood of Marathon, these and many other exciting topics were forgotten for the hour, and the thoughts of millions were suddenly drawn away to a country house near the Gad's Hill of Shakespeare, on the road to Rochester, where the most popular author of his day was lying dead. On the evening of June 8th, Mr. Dickens became suddenly seized with paralysis. He fell into an unconscious state and continued so until his death the evening after. The news was sent all over the country on the 10th and brought a pang as of personal sorrow into almost every home. Dickens was not of an age to die, he had scarcely passed his prime. Born early in February 1812, he had not gone far into his fifty-ninth year. In another part of this work, an attempt has been made to do justice to Dickens as a novelist. Here it is only necessary to record the historical fact of his death and of the deep impression that it made. No author of our time came near him in popularity. Perhaps no English author ever was so popular during his own life. To an immense number of men and women in these countries, Dickens stood for literature. To not a few, his cheery teaching was sufficient as philosophy and even as religion. Soon after his death, as might have been expected, 
a certain reaction took place, and for a while it became the fashion to smile quietly at Dickens' teaching and his influence. That mood, too, will have its day and will pass. It may be safely predicted that Dickens will be found to have made a firm place in English literature, although that place will probably not be so high as his admirers would once have claimed for him. Londoners were familiar with Dickens's personal appearance, as well as with his writings, and certain London streets did not seem quite the same when his striking face and energetic movements could be seen there no more. It is likely that Dickens overworked his exuberant vital energy, his superb resources of physical health and animal spirits. In work and play, in writing and in exercising, he was unsparing of his powers. Like the lavish youth with the full purse and Gil Blas, he appeared to believe that his stock could never be spent. Men who were early companions of his, and who had not half his vital power, outlived him many years. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, although his own desire was to be laid quietly in Rochester Churchyard it was held that the National Cemetery claimed him. We cannot help thinking it a pity the claim was made. All true admirers of Scott must be glad that he rests in his dear and congenial Dryborough. Most of the admirers of Dickens would have been better pleased to think that he lay beneath the green turf of the ancient churchyard in venerable and storied Rochester amid the scenes that he loved and taught so many others to love. Nothing in modern English history is like the rush of the extraordinary years of reforming energy on which the new administration had now entered. Mr. Gladstone's government had to grapple with five or six great questions of reform, any one of which might have seemed enough to engage the whole attention of an ordinary administration. The new prime minister had pledged himself to abolish the state church in Ireland and to reform the Irish land tenure system. He had made up his mind to put an end to the purchase of commissions in the army. Recent events and experiences had convinced him that it was necessary to introduce the system of voting by secret ballot. He accepted for his government the responsibility of originating a complete scheme of national education. Meanwhile, there were many questions of the highest importance in foreign policy waiting for solution. The American government did what every cool and well-informed observer must have known they would do. They pressed for a settlement of the claims arising out of the damage done by the Alabama and other southern cruisers, which had been built in English dockyards and had sailed from English ports. In the mid-career of the government, the war broke out between France and Prussia. Russia took advantage of the opportunity to insist that the Treaty of Paris must be altered by the cancelling of the clause which formally and in perpetuity refused to every power the right of having a fleet in the Black Sea. Each of these questions was of capital importance. Each might have involved the country in war. It required no common energy and strength of character to keep closely to the work of domestic reform, amid such exciting discussions in foreign policy all the while, and with the war trumpet ringing for a long time in the ears of England. Mr. Forster's education bill may be said to have been run side by side with the Irish land bill. The government undertook a great and a much-needed work when it set about establishing a national system of elementary education, the manner in which England had neglected the education of her poor children had long been a reproach to her civilization. She was behind every other great nation in the world. She was behind most countries that in no wise professed to be great. Prussia and nearly all the German countries were centuries in advance of her. So were some, if not actually all, of the American states. We have already shown in these pages by what pitiful patchwork of compromises and makeshift expedients England had been trying to put together something like a plan for the instruction of the children of the poor. Private charity was eked out in a parsimonious and miserable manner by a scanty dole from the state, and as a matter of course, where the direst poverty prevailed, 
and naturally brought the extremest need for assistance to education, there the wants of the place were least efficiently supplied. For years the statesmanship of England had been kept from any serious attempt to grapple with the evil by the doctrine that popular education ought not to be the business of a government. The idea prevailed that education conducted by the state would be something un-English, something which might do very well for Germans and Americans and other such people, but which was entirely unsuited to the manly independence of the true Britain. It therefore came about that more than two-thirds of the children of the country were absolutely without instruction. One of the first great tasks which Mr. Gladstone's government undertook was to reform this condition of things and to provide England for the first time in her history with a system of national education. On February 17, 1870, Mr. Forster introduced a bill having for its object to provide for public elementary education in England and Wales. The basis of the measure was very simple, but also very comprehensive. Mr. Forster proposed to establish a system of school boards in England and Wales, and to give to each board the power to frame bylaws compelling the attendance of all children from five to twelve years of age within the school district. The government did not see their way to a system of direct and universal compulsion. They therefore fell back on a compromise by leaving the power to compel in the hands of the local authorities. Existing schools were in many instances to be adopted by the bill and to receive government aid on condition that they possessed a certain amount of efficiency in education, that they submitted themselves to the examination of an undenominational inspector, and that they admitted a conscience clause as part of their regulations. The funds were to be procured partly by local rate, partly by grants from the Treasury, and partly by the fees paid in the paying schools. There were, of course, to be free schools provided, where the poverty of the population was such as, in the opinion of the local authorities, to render gratuitous instruction indispensable. The bill at first was favorably received, but the general harmony of opinion did not last long. The task proved to be one of the most difficult that the government could have undertaken. The whole body of the English and Welsh nonconformists soon declared themselves in strong hostility to some of the bill's provisions. Mr. Forster found, when he came to examine into the condition of the machinery of education in England, that there was already a system of schools existing under the charge of religious bodies of various kinds, the state church and the Roman Catholic Church and other authorities. These he proposed to adopt as far as possible into his scheme, to affiliate them, as it were, to the governmental system of education. But he had to make some concession to the religious principle on which such schools were founded. He could not by any stroke of authority undertake to change them into secular schools. He therefore proposed to meet the difficulty by adopting regulations compelling every school of this kind, which obtained government aid or recognition, to accept a conscience clause, by means of which the religious convictions of parents and children should be scrupulously regarded in the instruction given during the regular school hours. On this point, the nonconformists as a body broke away from the government. They laid down the broad principle that no state aid whatever should be given to any schools but those which were conducted on strictly secular and undenominational principles it ought to be superfluous to say that the nonconformists did not object to the religious instruction of children. It ought not to be supposed for a moment that they attached less importance to religious instruction than any other body of persons. Their principle was that public money, the contribution of citizens of all shades of belief, ought only to be given for such teaching as the common opinion of the country was agreed upon. The contribution of the Jew, they argued, ought not to be exacted in order to teach Christianity. The Protestant ratepayer ought not to be compelled to pay for the instruction of Roman Catholic children in the tenets of their faith. 
the Irish Catholic in London or Birmingham, ought not to be called upon to pay in any way for the teaching of distinctively Protestant doctrine. Therefore, they said, let us at any cost establish a strictly national and secular system in our public elementary schools. Let us teach there what we are all agreed upon, and let us leave the duty of teaching religion to the ministers of religion and to the parents of the children. About the truths of arithmetic and geography, about spelling and writing, we are all agreed. Let our common contributions be given to common instruction, and let each denomination provide in its own way for the religious training of its young people. This way of looking at the question left out of notice one most important element in the controversy, the existence of large bodies of citizens who conscientiously objected to any school teaching which was divorced from religious instruction, and who did not believe that there could be any education in the true sense without the influence of religion accompanying and inspiring it. We shall not here discuss the relative worth of these two opposing and irreconcilable theories of public education. The fact that they existed made it well-nigh impossible for the government to satisfy the demands of the nonconformists. Mr. Forster could not admit the principle for which they contended. He could not say that it would be a fair and equal plan to offer secular education, and that alone, to all bodies of the community, for he was well aware that there were such bodies who were conscientiously opposed to what was called secular education, and who could not agree to accept it. He therefore acknowledged existing and very palpable facts, and endeavored to establish a system which should satisfy the consciences of all the denominations. But the nonconformists would not meet him on this ground. They set up their shibboleth of undenominational education, they made a fetish of their theory of state aid, and they fought Mr. Forrester long and ably and bitterly. The liberal minister was compelled to accept more than once the aid of the conservative party, for that party as a whole adopted the principle which insisted on religious instruction in every system of national education. It more than once happened, therefore, that Mr. Forster and Mr. Gladstone found themselves appealing to the help of conservatives and of Roman Catholics against that dissenting body of Englishmen who were usually the main support of the Liberal Party. It happened, too, very unfortunately, that at this time Mr. Bright's health had so far given way as to compel him to seek complete rest from parliamentary duties. His presence and his influence with the nonconformists might perhaps have tended to moderate their course of action and to reconcile them to the policy of the government even on the subject of national education. But his voice was silent then and for long after. The split between the government and the nonconformists became something like a complete severance. Many angry and bitter words were spoken in the House of Commons on both sides. On one occasion there was an almost absolute declaration on the part of Mr. Gladstone and of Mr. Mial, a leading nonconformist, that they had parted company forever. The education bill was nevertheless a great success. The school boards became really valuable and powerful institutions, and the principle of the cumulative vote was tested for the first time in their elections. When school boards were first established in the great cities, their novelty and the evident importance of the work they had to do attracted to them some of the men of most commanding intellect and position. The London School Board had as its chairman, for instance, Lord Lawrence, the great Indian statesman, lately a viceroy, and for one of its leading members, Professor Huxley. An important peculiarity of the school boards, too, was the fact that they admitted women to the privileges of membership, and this admission was largely availed of. Women voted, proposed amendments, sat on committees, and in every way took their part of the duties of citizenship in the business of national education. When the novelty of the system wore off, some of the more eminent men gradually fell out of the work, but the school boards never failed to maintain a high and useful standard of membership. They began and continued to be strictly representative institutions. 
from the peer to the working man, from evangelical churchman to Catholic, from nonconformist to rationalist, from old-fashioned middle-class paterfamilias to eager young woman, shrilly representing the rights of her sex, they became a mirror of English public and business life. Most of their work, even still, remains to be done. The school system of the country needs many improvements and many relaxations, probably before it can be pronounced to be in fair working order. Its existence has, in many parts of England, brought thus far not peace but a sword. The struggle between the conscientious belief of one class of persons and the political dogma of another is still going on. Many attempts were made to induce the government to go as far as direct compulsory education, and much dissatisfaction was expressed at the refusal of ministers to venture on the adoption of such a principle. It is therefore not unreasonable to say that the national system of education has hardly yet had a fair and full trial. But so far as it has gone, there can be no doubt of the success it has achieved. No man exists who would, if he could, see England return to the condition of things which prevailed before the days of the Gladstone administration. But it must be owned that the Gladstone administration was weakened and not strengthened by its education scheme. One of the first symptoms of coming danger to Mr. Gladstone's government was found in the estrangement of the English nonconformists. They clung to their adopted principle with a genuine Puritan pertinacity. They admitted no respect of persons where that was concerned. Honest, conscientious, and narrow, they were ready to sacrifice any party and any minister rather than tolerate concession or compromise. End of section 28. Section 29 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 59 Reformation in a Flood, Part 2. The government were a little unfortunate, too, as regarded another great reform, that of the organization of the army. Mr. Cardwell, the war minister, brought forward a scheme for the reconstruction of the army by combining under one system of discipline the regular troops, the militia, the volunteers, and the reserve. One most important part of the scheme was the abolition of the purchase system for officers' commissions and the substitution of promotion according to merit. Except in certain regiments and in certain branches of the service outside England itself, the rule was that an officer obtained his commission by purchase. Promotion was got in the same way. An officer bought a step up in the service. A commission was a vested interest, a personal property. The owner had paid so much for it, and he expected to get so much for it when he thought fit to sell it. The regulation price recognized by law and the horse guards was not by any means the actual price of the commission. It became worth much more to the holder, and of course he expected to get its real price, not its regulation or nominal and imaginary price. The regulation price was to the real price what the cost of the ticket bought at the door of an Italian theatre is to the sum which has to be paid inside for a seat from which to see the play. This anomalous and extraordinary system had grown up with the growth of the English army, until it seemed, in the eyes of many, an essential condition of the army's existence. It found defenders almost everywhere. Because the natural courage, energy, and fighting power of Englishmen, Irishmen, and Scotchmen had made a good army in spite of this unlucky practice, because the army did not actually collapse or wither away under its influence, many men were convinced that the army could not get on without it. The abolition of the purchase system had been advocated by generations of reformers without much success. For years, a stout old soldier, Sir de Lacey Evans, had made an annual motion on the subject which was regarded by not a few as merely one of the necessary bores of parliamentary life. 
More lately, Mr. Trevelyan had taken up the cause with vivacity, spirit, and good effect. Lord Stanley had always supported the proposed reform, as he had supported the system of open competition for appointments in the civil service. But the question did not become really pressing and practical until Mr. Gladstone, on his accession to power, resolved to include it on his list of reforms. Of course, Mr. Cardwell's proposition was bitterly and pertinaciously opposed. The principle of army purchase was part of a system in which large numbers of the most influential class had a vested interest. It was part of the aristocratic principle. To admit men to commissions in the army by pure merit and by mere competition would be to deprive the service of its specially aristocratic character. Few of those who opposed the reform on this ground were actually conscious that they were fighting merely for the maintenance of a class privilege and a selfish advantage. They had schooled themselves into the conviction that the aristocratic system was the only principle of existence for an English army, that a system of open promotion by merit would be too French or too American or something of the kind and it would fill the higher places in the service with persons of no rank and of vulgar habits, and they had worked themselves into the belief that in resisting Mr. Cardwell's measure they were performing a patriotic duty. A large number of the conservative party set themselves, therefore, not merely to oppose, but to obstruct the bill. They proposed all manner of amendments and raised all manner of discussions, in which the same arguments were repeated over and over again by the same speakers in almost the same words. Men who had never before displayed the slightest interest in the saving of the public money were now clamorous opponents of the bill on the ground that the abolition of purchases would render necessary the outlay of a large sum for compensation to officers thus deprived of their vested interests. This outlay the liberal government usually censured by their opponents on the ground of their pinching parsimony were quite willing to meet. Mr. Cardwell was prepared to make provision for it. Economy, however, became suddenly a weapon in the hands of some of the conservatives. The session was going on, and there seemed little prospect of the opposition being discouraged or slackening in their energy. The government began to see that it would be impossible to carry through the vast and complicated scheme of army reorganization which they had introduced, and Mr. Gladstone was resolved that the system of purchase must come to an end. It was thought expedient at last, and while the bill was still fighting its way through committee, to abandon a great part of the measure and persevere for the present only with those clauses which related to the abolition of the system of purchase. Under these conditions, the bill passed its third reading in the Commons on July 3, 1871, not without a stout resistance at the last, and not by a very overwhelming majority. This condition of things gave the majority in the House of Lords courage to oppose the scheme. A meeting of Conservative peers was held, and it was resolved that the Duke of Richmond should offer an amendment to the motion for the second reading of the Army Purchase Bill. The Duke of Richmond was exactly the sort of man that a party under such conditions would agree upon as the proper person to move an amendment. He was an entirely respectable and safe politician, a man of great influence so far as dignity and territorial position were concerned, a seemingly moderate Tory who showed nothing openly of the merely partisan and yet was always ready to serve his party. When the motion for the second reading came on, the Duke of Richmond moved an amendment declaring that the House of Lords was unwilling to agree to the motion until a comprehensive and complete scheme of army reorganization should have been laid before it. This amendment was cleverly constructed. It did not pledge the House of Lords to reject the bill. It did not directly oppose the second reading. It merely said that before passing the second reading, the House was anxious to know more fully the plans of the government for the general reorganization of the army. The government had brought in a scheme of vast reorganization and had then withdrawn nearly all of it, with the avowed intention of introducing it again at a more convenient opportunity. 
it looked reasonable enough, therefore, that the House of Lords should hesitate about abandoning the system of purchase, before knowing exactly what the government proposed to do as a supplement and consequence of so important a measure. But, of course, the object of the House of Lords was not to obtain further information, it was simply to get rid of the bill for the present. The amendment of the Duke of Richmond was adopted. Then Mr. Gladstone took a course which became the subject of keen and embittered controversy. Purchase in the army was permitted only by royal warrant. The whole system was the creation of royal regulation. The House of Commons had pronounced against the system. The House of Lords had not pronounced in favor of it. The House of Lords had not rejected the measure of the government, but only expressed a wish for delay and for further information. Delay, however, would have been fatal to the measure for that session. Mr. Gladstone, therefore, devised a way for checkmating what he knew to be the design of the House of Lords. It was an ingenious plan. It was almost an audacious plan. It took the listener's breath away to hear of it. Mr. Gladstone announced that as the system of purchase was the creation of royal regulation, he had advised the Queen to take the decisive step of cancelling the royal warrant which made purchase legal. A new royal warrant was therefore immediately issued, declaring that on and after November 1st following, all regulations made by Her Majesty or any of her predecessors regulating or fixing the prices at which commissions might be bought or in any way authorizing the purchase or sale of such commissions should be cancelled. As far as regarded purchase, therefore, the controversy came suddenly to an end. The House of Lords had practically nothing to discuss. All that was left of the government scheme on which the peers could have anything to say was that part of the bill which provided compensation for those whom the abolition of the system of purchase would deprive of certain vested interests. For the Lords to reject the bill as it now stood would merely be to say that such officers should have no compensation. The Lords were, to use a homely expression, sold. To adopt a phrase which would have been good English once, and would not have been too strong to illustrate their own views of what had happened, they were bubbled. Astonishment fell upon the minds of most who heard Mr. Gladstone's determination. After a moment of bewilderment, it was received with a wild outburst of liberal exaltation. It was felt to be a splendid party triumph. The House of Lords had been completely foiled. The tables had been turned on the peers. They were as utterly baffled as Sir Giles' overreach in Massinger's play, when, pulling out the document on which he is to rely, he finds it only a fair skin of parchment with neither wax nor words. What prodigy is this? I am o'erwhelmed with wonder, an astounded peer might have exclaimed. What subtle spirit hath raised out the inscription? Nothing was left for the House of Lords but to pass the bill as quickly as possible, coupling its passing, however, with a resolution announcing that it was passed only in order to secure to officers of the army the compensation they were entitled to receive, and censuring the government for having attained, by the exercise of the prerogative and without the aid of Parliament, the principal object which they contemplated in the bill. The House of Lords was then completely defeated. The system of purchase in the army was abolished by one sudden and clever stroke. The government were victorious over their opponents. Yet the hearts of many sincere liberals sank within them as they heard the announcement of the triumph. Mr. Disraeli condemned in the strongest terms the sudden exercise of the prerogative of the crown to help the ministry out of a difficulty and many a man of mark and influence on the liberal benches felt that there was a good ground for the strictures of the leader of the opposition. Mr. Fawcett, in particular, condemned the act of the government. He insisted that if it had been done by a Tory minister, it would have been passionately denounced by Mr. Gladstone amid the plaudits of the whole liberal party. Mr. Fawcett was a man who occupied a remarkable position in the House of Commons. 
in his early manhood he met with an accident which entirely destroyed the sight of his eyes he made the noble resolve that he would nevertheless follow unflinchingly the career he had previously mapped out for himself and would not allow the terrible calamity he had suffered to drive him from the active life of the political world his tastes were for politics and political economy he published a manual of political economy he wrote largely on the subject in reviews and magazines he was elected professor of the science in his own university cambridge he was in politics as well as in economics a pupil of mr mill and with the encouragement and support of mr mill he became a candidate for a seat in parliament he was a liberal of the most decided tone but he was determined to hold himself independent of party he stood for southwark against mr laird in 1857 and was defeated he contested cambridge and brighton at subsequent elections and at last in 1865 he was successful at brighton he was not long in the house of commons before it was acknowledged that his political career was likely to be something of a new force in parliament a remarkably powerful reasoner he was capable notwithstanding his infirmity of making a long speech full of figures and of statistical calculations his memory was fortunately so quick and powerful as to enable him easily to dispense with all the appliances which even well-trained speakers commonly have to depend upon when they enter into statistical controversy in parliament he held faithfully to the purpose with which he had entered it and was a thorough liberal in principles but absolutely independent of the expedients and sometimes of the mere discipline of party if he believed that the liberal ministers were going wrong he censured them as freely as though they were his political opponents on this occasion he felt strongly about the course mr gladstone had taken and he expressed himself in language of unmeasured condemnation it seems hard to understand how any independent man could have come to any other conclusion the exercise of the royal prerogative was undoubtedly legal much time was wasted in testifying to its legality the question in dispute was whether its sudden introduction in such a manner was a proper act on the part of the government whether it was right to cut short by virtue of the queen's prerogative a debate which had previously been carried on without the slightest intimation that the controversy was to be settled in any other way than that of the ordinary parliamentary procedure there seems to be only one reasonable answer to this question the course taken by mr gladstone was unusual unexpected unsustained by any precedent it was a mere surprise it was not fair to the house of lords it was not worthy of the occasion or the ministry or the liberal principles they professed great stress was laid upon an opinion which was obtained from sir roundell palmer in justification of the action of the government but sir roundell palmer merely gave it as his opinion that the issuing of the warrant cancelling purchase was within the constitutional power of the crown on that subject there could be no reasonable doubt but that was not the question which people were discussing so eagerly they were asking whether it was fair to begin a measure of reform on the ordinary principles of parliamentary procedure and suddenly to bring it to a close by the unexpected intervention of the royal prerogative on this question the only one really at issue sir roundell palmer's letter was a condemnation not a justification of the course taken by the government i should have been glad sir roundell palmer wrote to mr cardwell if it had been generally and clearly understood from the beginning that subject to the sense of parliament being ascertained with reference to the point of compensation the form of procedure would be that which was eventually adopted because it is certainly an evil that the adoption of one constitutional mode of procedure rather than another should appear to arise from an adverse vote of the house of lords the introduction of the prerogative in this curious way did much to damage the influence of mr gladstone's government every one in the end came to approve of the principle of promotion in the army by merit and the abolition of the anomalous system of purchase 
but this great reform could at most have been delayed for only a single session by the House of Lords. It would have been carried as the ballot was carried the moment it was sent up a second time from the representative chamber. It is not even certain that the House of Lords, if firmly met, would have carried their opposition long enough to delay the measure for a single session. In any case, the time lost would not have counted for much. Better by far to have waited another session than to have carried the point at once by a stroke of policy which seemed impatient, petulant, and even unfair. It is evident that among the independent men of his own party, Mr. Gladstone suffered discredit by the manner in which he swept the purchase system away and bade his will avouch it. Among the many influences already combining to weaken his authority, the impression produced by this stroke of policy was not the least powerful. The ballot bill was not carried without a struggle. It was introduced by Mr. Forster on February 20, 1871, and was a measure embodying some remarkable changes. Its principal object was, of course, the introduction of the system of secret voting. This Mr. Forster proposed to do by compelling each voter to use only an official voting paper, which he was to obtain at the polling place and there alone. Entering the polling place, the voter was to go to the official in charge and mention his name and his place of residence. The official, having ascertained that he was properly on the register, would hand him a stamped paper on which to inscribe his vote. The voter was to take the paper into a separate compartment and there privately mark a cross opposite the printed name of the candidate for whom he desired to record his vote. He was then to fold up the paper in such a manner as to prevent the mark from being seen, and in the presence of the official, drop it into the urn for containing the votes. By this plan, Mr. Forster proposed not only to obtain secrecy, but also to prevent personation. The bill likewise undertook to abolish the old practice of nominating candidates publicly by speeches at the hustings. Instead of a public nomination, it was intended that the candidates should be nominated by means of a paper containing the names of a proposer and seconder and eight assenters, all of whom must be registered voters. This paper being handed to the returning officer would constitute a nomination. Thus was abolished one of the most characteristic and time-honored peculiarities of electioneering. Every humorous writer, every satirist with pencil or pen from Hogarth to Dickens, had made merry with the scenes of the nomination day. No ceremonial could be at once more useless and more mischievous. In England, the candidates were proposed and seconded in face of each other on a public platform, in some open street or marketplace, in the presence of a vast tumultuous crowd, three-fourths of whom were generally drunk, and all of whom were inflamed by the passion of a furious partisanship. Fortunate indeed was the orator whose speech was anything more than a dumb show. The conservative part of the crowd usually made it a point of honor not to listen to the liberal candidate or allow him to be heard. The liberal partisan in the street was equally resolute to drown the eloquence of the Tory candidate. Brass bands and drums not unusually accompanied the efforts of the speakers to make themselves heard. Brickbats, dead cats, and rotten eggs came flying like bewildering meteors around the ears of the rival politicians on the hustings. The crowds generally enlivened the time by a series of faction fights among themselves. Anything more grotesque, more absurd, more outrageous, it would be impossible to imagine. The bill introduced by Mr. Forster would have deserved the support of all rational beings if it proposed no greater reform than simply the abolition of this abominable system, but the ballot had long become an indispensable necessity. Bribery, corruption, intimidation were the monstrous outcome of the system of open voting. Yet for long years no reform had seemed more unlikely than the adoption of the ballot. In Mr. Grote's days there used to be an annual debate on the motion in favor of the ballot, and Mr. Grote generally found himself supported by a very respectable minority and by some speakers of great influence. Still his proposal was even then regarded by Parliament and the public in general rather as a crotchet 
than as a practical scheme. In the song of the box, Thomas Moore made easy ridicule of Grote in his ballot, and oh, when at last even this greatest of Grotes must bend to the power that at every door knocks, may he drop in the urn like his own silent votes, and the tomb of his rest be a large ballot box. End of section 29. Section 30 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 59, Reformation in a Flood, Part 3. Lord Palmerston made precisely the same joke years after about Mr. Henry Barclay and his annual motion for the adoption of the ballot. He expressed a hope that when the inevitable hour came for Mr. Barclay to quit the scene of his mortal labours, his tomb might be made in the likeness of a ballot-box. Lord Palmerston evidently was not acquainted with Moore's lines about Mr. Grote, and was under the impression that he was making an original joke. In Mr. Barclay's hands, the ballot debate became less important than it had been with Mr. Grote. On one remarkable occasion, indeed, Mr. Barclay contrived to carry a sort of snap vote against the government. The division was taken unexpectedly in a very thin house, and 86 voted for the ballot and 80 against it. But nothing came of this, and the whole question seemed at one time in a fair way to be classed with Mr. Spooner's motion for the withdrawal of the Maynooth Grant, or Mr. Newdigate's appeal for the inspection of convents. Lord Palmerston used to argue complacently that the franchise was not a right but a trust, that the trust was exercised on behalf of the community in general, and that the voter was bound to discharge his duty in public so that those for whom he acted should know that he was acting fairly. This way of treating the question held out a temptation to long and futile controversy as to whether the franchise was or was not the right of a free man, and in what we may call the metaphysics of the subject, the really practical object of the discussion became lost. Lord Palmerston's description of the franchise did not in the slightest degree affect the argument in favor of the ballot. If the franchise was a trust, and only a trust, there was none the less necessity that the trustee should be so protected as to enable him to discharge his trust conscientiously and properly. The objection to the open vote was that, in a vast number of instances, the voter could not safely vote according to his conscience and his convictions. If he was a tenant, he was in terror of his landlord. If he was a workman, he was afraid of his employer. If he was a small shopkeeper in a country town, he was in dread of offending some wealthy customer. If he was a timid man, he shrank from exposing himself to the violence of the mob. In many cases, a man giving a conscientious vote would have had to do so with the certainty that he was bringing ruin upon himself and his family. In Ireland, the conflicting power of the landlord and of the crowd made the vote a mere sham. A man in many places dared not vote but as the landlord bade him. Sometimes when he thought to secure his safety by pleasing the landlord, he ran serious risk of offending the crowd who supported the popular candidate. Voters were dragged to the poll like slaves or prisoners by the landlord and his agents. It was something worse than ridiculous to tell the House of Commons and the public that it was necessary such a system should be kept up because it enabled everybody to see that the voter properly discharged his trust. Yet this argument about the trust and the need of publicity was almost the only piece of reasoning which for many years Lord Palmerston thought it worth his while to offer to the House of Commons. Mr. Mill, who had begun by advocating the ballot, became an opponent of the system, chiefly on the ground that it was unmanly to conceal one's vote. This way of arguing the question only furnished one other illustration of the generous weakness which impaired the effect of much of Mr. Mill's 
political and social philosophy, the tendency to construct systems based on what Burke called the heroic virtues, the belief that human affairs can be regulated on the assumption that all men can not only become heroic, but that they can be heroic always. It would be a nobler world indeed if in the giving of our votes, as in everything else, we could all make up our minds to do right and to defy the consequences. It would be a far finer sight for the moralist or the philosopher to see a concourse of Irish tenants going openly to the poll to vote against their landlords and calmly accepting eviction as a consequence, than to see the same men screened from the penalty of their patriotic conduct by the mechanical protection of the ballot. The small shopkeeper who offended his most influential customer in the cause of what he believed to be the right would be a nobler subject for contemplation than the small shopkeeper enabled to do as he thought right without any risk or loss. But an electoral system constructed on these lofty principles would be sure to turn out exactly as the open voting system proved to be, a source of almost boundless demoralization. It is curious to note that in one of the very speeches in which he condemned the ballot on this higher ground, Mr. Mill actually quoted with approval that sentence of profound practical philosophy in which Burke declared that the system which lays its foundations in rare and heroic virtues will be sure to have its superstructure in the basest profligacy and corruption. A change, however, suddenly took place in English public feeling. The gross and growing profligacy and violence which disgraced every election began to make men feel that something must be done to get rid of such hideous abuses. Mr. Bright had always been an earnest advocate of the ballot system, and partly, no doubt, under his influence, and partly by the teaching of experience and observation, Mr. Gladstone became a convert to the same opinion. In 1869, a committee of the House of Commons was appointed on the motion of Mr. Bruce, the Home Secretary, to inquire into the manner of conducting parliamentary and municipal elections. Lord Hartington was president of the committee. Its report was, on the whole, decidedly in favor of the principle of secret voting. Public opinion came round in a moment. Not many years had passed since the very words, secret voting, used to be considered enough to stigmatize the ballot and to make all true men disclaim any approval of it. Now, under the impulse of that marvelous breath of reforming energy which was scattering so many ancient traditions, the repugnance to the secret vote seemed to have disappeared. We are speaking now of the public out of doors, for a great many members of both Houses of Parliament were still unconverted. Mr. Forster's bill was stoutly resisted by the Conservatives. It was not merely resisted in the ordinary way. Its progress was delayed by that practice of talking against time, which has more recently become famous under the name of obstruction. A good many Liberal members liked the ballot in their hearts little better than the Tories did. The bill contained a wise and just proposal for throwing the legitimate expense of elections on the public rates. This was rejected in committee by a large majority. A similar proposal, it may be stated, was introduced again and again in more or less differing forms during the progress of the ballot bills, and it was invariably rejected. The majority of the House of Commons is composed of rich men. The majority, it is not unfair to say, is composed also of men who are not recommended to their constituencies by great intellect or distinguished public services. There will always, therefore, be many persons found to object to any change of system which tends to place a poor man and a rich man more nearly on a footing of equality in the candidature for a seat in Parliament. The long delays which interposed between the introduction of Mr. Forster's bill and its passing through the House of Commons gave the House of Lords a plausible excuse for rejecting it altogether. The bill was not read a third time in the Commons until August 8th. It was not sent up to the Lords until the 10th of that month, a date later than that usually fixed for the close of the session. 
Lord Shaftesbury moved that the bill be rejected on the ground that there was no time left for a proper consideration of it, and his motion was carried by ninety-seven votes to forty-eight. The manner in which the measure had been dealt with in the House of Commons made it seem clear to the Lords that there was really a very general feeling of dislike to the ballot among the members of the representative chamber, and emboldened them to think that they would be rendering a grateful service by throwing it out. The House of Lords was right enough in assuming that many members of the House of Commons were not particularly anxious for the introduction of the ballot. The proposal of the government was welcome to the voters in general, but it was naturally regarded with hostile feelings by many men who felt small assurance that their seats would be safe if the franchise were to be exercised by everyone in security and independence. The ballot was introduced, we do not hesitate to say, in defiance of the secret prejudices of the majority of the House of Commons which consented to pass it. Mr. Gladstone was determined to pass it in the interest of the voters, of political independence, and of public morals. He was now as thoroughly convinced as Mr. Bright himself that the ballot in these countries would be the very keystone of political independence. Recent publications have enabled us to know that on one occasion at least, Lord Palmerston did all he could privately to encourage the House of Lords to reject an important measure introduced and passed in the Commons by his own Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Gladstone. This fact, which would be incredible if it were not made known upon authority impossible to question, was not likely to furnish an example which Mr. Gladstone would follow. Mr. Gladstone accepted the decision of the Lords as a mere passing delay, and with the beginning of the next session the ballot came up again. It was presented in the form of a bill to amend the laws relating to procedure at parliamentary and municipal elections, and it included, of course, the introduction of the system of secret voting. The bill passed quickly through the House of Commons. Those who most disliked it began to see that they must make up their minds to meet their fate. When the bill went up to the Lords, an amendment was introduced into it with the view of making the ballot optional. This preposterous alteration was, of course, objected to by the Commons, and finally the House of Lords gave it up. There would obviously be no protection whatever for the class of voters whom it was necessary to protect if the ballot was made simply optional. The tenant who exercised his option of voting secretly against his landlord might just as well have voted openly. The landlord would not be slow to assume that the secrecy was adopted for the purpose of giving a vote against him. At the instance of the House of Lords, however, the ballot was introduced as an experiment, and the act was passed to continue in force for eight years, that is, until the end of 1880. We may anticipate matters a little by saying that no measure of reform introduced through all that session of splendid reforming energy has given more universal satisfaction or worked with happier effect than the ballot. There is indeed much still to be done to purify the electoral system. The ballot has not extinguished corruption in small boroughs. It is still perfectly possible to carry on the most demoralizing system of bribery there. The plan of what we may call payment by results still flourishes in many a small constituency. It is quietly given out that if a certain candidate be elected, there will be money flowing through the borough after the election and every voter who is open to corruption goes to the polling place determined to vote for this candidate, because he knows that his vote adds to the chances of the boroughs coming in for the refreshing golden shower. Probably nothing could put a stop to the corruption in very small boroughs, but their utter disfranchisement, or some system which would group several of them into one constituency. But in all other objects sought by the Ballot Act, it has been successful it has put an end to an enormous amount of corruption, and it may be said to have almost altogether extinguished the illegitimate influence of the landlord, the employer, and the patron. During a debate on women's suffrage in 1871, Mr. Gladstone stated that if the ballot were once introduced, there would be no harm done by allowing women to vote. Nearly ten years have passed since that remarkable declaration, 
and the proposal to extend the franchise to female householders does not seem to have made much practical progress. But it must be admitted that the adoption of the ballot makes a great difference in the conditions of the controversy. It was one thing to ask that women should have imposed on them the duty of going up to the open poll and recording their votes in public, and quite another thing to ask that they should be allowed to enter a quiet compartment of the polling place and record an independent vote under the saving shelter of the ballot. The University Tests Bill was one of the great measures carried successfully into legislation during this season of unparalleled activity. The effect of this bill was to admit all lay students of whatever faith to the universities of Oxford and Cambridge on equal terms. This settled practically a controversy and removed a grievance which had been attracting keen public interest for at least five and thirty years. Gradually, the restrictions which Oxford and Cambridge drew around their systems of education had been relaxed. Dissenters had been admitted first to the advantages of education within the sphere of the universities, and next to the honors which success in the university course was fitted to command. Twice over, within a very few years, had a measure for the purpose been carried through the commons, only to be rejected by the lords. In this busy year of 1871, the Liberal government introduced the bill again, and this time, after some remonstrances and futile struggle, the Conservative majority in the House of Lords allowed their prejudices to succumb and affirmed the principle of religious equality in the distribution of the honours which the two universities have to reward to those who win success as students within the sphere of their teaching. The government also passed a trades union bill, moderating, as has already been shown, the legislation which bore harshly on the workmen. They established by Act of Parliament the Local Government Board, a new department of the administration entrusted with the care of the public health, the control of the poor law system, and all regulations applying to the business of districts throughout the country. The government repealed the ridiculous and almost forgotten ecclesiastical titles bill. The popularity of Mr. Gladstone's government was all the time somewhat impaired by the line of action, and even perhaps by the personal deportment of some of its members. Mr. Lowe's budgets were not popular, and Mr. Lowe had a taste for sarcasm which it was pleasant, no doubt, to indulge in at the expense of heavy men, but which was, like other pleasant things, a little dangerous when enjoyed too freely. One of Mr. Lowe's budgets contained a proposition to make up for deficiency of income by a tax on matches. It seems not unlikely that the whole proposition first arose in Mr. Lowe's mind in connection with a pretty play upon words which he offered as its motto, Ex Luce Lucellum, he suggested should be a device imprinted on every taxed matchbox. The joke had to be explained. Its humor wholly vanishes when it is put into English. A little profit out of light. Not much drollery in that, surely. The country laughed at the joke and not with it. The match trade rose up in arms against the proposal. It was shown that that trade was really a very large one, employing vast numbers of poor people, both in the manufacture and the sale, especially in the East End of London, and it was proved that the imposition recommended by Mr. Lowe would put out the light most effectually. All the little boys and girls of the metropolis whose poor bread, whose miserable lucellum depended on that trade, arose in infantile insurrection against Mr. Lowe. There were vast processions of matchmakers and match-sellers to Palace Yard to protest against the tax. The contest was pitiful, painful, ludicrous. No ministry could endure it long. Mr. Lowe, who had not the slightest idea when he proposed his tax of being regarded as a worse than Lucifer by the vendors of Lucifer matches, was only too glad to withdraw from his unenviable position. It was not pleasant to be regarded as a sort of ogre by thousands of poor little ragged boys and girls. Mr. Lowe had ventured on the proposal chiefly because of the example of the United States, 
where the whole system and social conditions were so different from ours as to afford no guarantee whatever that a tax which is found endurable by the one community is likely to be found endurable by the other he withdrew his unlucky proposal along with his ill-omened joke and set himself to work to repair by other ways and means the ravages which warlike times had made in his financial system no particular harm was done to anybody but the government they were made to seem ridiculous the miserable match tax was just the sort of thing to impress the popular mind as something niggling paltry and pitiful mr lowe did not hear the end of it for a long time the attempt and not the deed confounded him another member of the administration mr ayrton a man of much ability but still more self-confidence was constantly bringing himself and his government into quarrels he was blessed with a gift of offence if a thing could be done either civilly or rudely mr ayrton was pretty sure to do it rudely he was impatient with dull people and did not always remember that those unhappy persons not only have their feelings but sometimes have their votes he quarrelled with officials he quarrelled with the newspapers he seemed to think a civil tongue gave evidence of a feeble intellect he pushed his way along trampling on people's prejudices with about as much consideration as a steamroller shows for the gravel it crushes even when mr ayrton was in the right he had a wrong way of showing it End of section 30section 31 of a history of our own times volume 4 by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 60 the black sea clause the alabama arbitration part 1 meanwhile the portentous changes which were taking place on the continent of europe had as was natural their effect on england and the english government the emperor napoleon having taken to himself a liberal minister m emile olivier one of the famous five who for years had represented opposition in the french legislative chamber had sought to get a renewed charter for himself and his dynasty by means of a plebiscite representing the question at issue as one of revolution or social order the emperor obtained a very large majority of eyes in favour of his policy in his house seven and a quarter million eyes against one and a half million noes but the minority was considerable and one peculiarity made it specially ominous there were more than fifty two thousand noes among the votes of the army and navy the mexican expedition and its ghastly failure had much injured the prestige of the emperor with the two services the truth could not be concealed that he had been peremptorily ordered out of mexico by the united states government and that he obeyed the command leaving maximilian to his fate louis napoleon saw that he must do something to recover his military popularity the overthrow of austria by prussia had roused a strong feeling of jealousy in france m thiers in particular had endeavoured to keep up an angry mood against the imperial government he constantly reproached the emperor for not interposing in some way to protect austria and restrict the ambition of prussia louis napoleon therefore found himself driven to try the gamester's last and desperate throw he seized the first excuse for forcing a war on prussia it is probable that war would have come in any case m prevost paradol had compared france and prussia to two express trains starting from opposite points along the same line of rails the collision must come it was merely a question of time the comparison was happy prussia knew very well that her success over austria had aroused the jealousy and the fears of france france began to revive the old talk of the frontier on the rhine bismarck had probably made up his mind that the quarrel would have to be fought out one day still it was a fatal mistake of the emperor napoleon to force the quarrel on such a pretext as the fact that the spanish people had invited a distant relation of the king of prussia to become sovereign of spain 
Louis Napoleon managed to put himself completely in the wrong. The King of Prussia at once induced his relative to withdraw from the candidature in order not to disturb the susceptibilities of France, and then the French government pressed for a general pledge that the King of Prussia would never on any future occasion allow of any similar candidature. When it came to this, there was an end of negotiation. It was clear then that the emperor was resolved to have a quarrel. Count Bismarck must have smiled a grim smile. His enemy had delivered himself into Bismarck's hands. The emperor had been for some time in failing health. He had not been paying much attention to the details of his administration. False security and self-conceit had operated among his generals and his war department to the utter detriment of the army. Nothing was ready. The whole system was falling to pieces. Long after France had declared war, the army that was to go to Berlin was only dragging heavily toward the frontier. The experience of what had happened to Austria might have told anyone that the moment Prussia saw her opportunity, she would move with the direct swiftness of an eagle's flight. But the French army stuck as if it was in mud. What everyone expected came to pass. The Prussians came down on the French like the rush of a torrent. The fortunes of the war were virtually decided in a day. Then the French lost battle after battle. The emperor dared not return to Paris. The defense, for the Prussians had long since become the invaders, was carried on with regard to the emperor's political fortunes rather than to the military necessities of the hour. There was nothing but French defeats until there came at last the crowning disaster of Sedan. The emperor surrendered his sword and was a captive in the hands of his enemies. The second empire was gone in a moment. Paris proclaimed the Republic, and the Empress Eugenie fled to England. The Second Empire was all in the dust. The conqueror at Versailles was hailed as German Emperor. We need not follow the fortunes of the war. France made many a brave and brilliant attempt to rally, but it was too late. Official neglect and mismanagement had done their work. No courage, no patriotism could now retrieve the fortunes of the field. Marshal Bazaine, the ill-omened soldier of the Mexican campaign, surrendered at Metz with a vast army. Paris was invested, was besieged, had to give up, or famine would have done the work for her. The conquering enemy had to be spoken with at the gate. France had nothing for it but to accept the terms imposed on her. She lost two provinces and had to pay an enormous fine, and the war was over. The sympathies of the English people generally were at first almost altogether with Prussia. The policy of the Emperor Napoleon had seemed so gross and outrageous that the public voice here applauded the resistance of Germany to his attempted dictation. But when the empire fell, the feeling suddenly changed. It was the common idea that the Prussians ought to have been content with Sidon, and the complete destruction of the Bonapartist empire and have made generous terms with the Republic. Great popular meetings were held in Trafalgar Square, London, and in various provincial cities, to express sympathy with the hardly entreated French. The sympathy of the Irish populations had been with France all through. The old bonds of comradeship dating from the Irish Brigade, and from long before it, had still their hold upon the emotional and impassioned Irish nature. Many persons everywhere thought the government ought to do something to assist the French Republic. Some were of opinion that the glory of England would suffer if she did not get into a fight with some power or other. It came out in the course of the eager diplomatic discussions which were going on that there had been some secret talk at different times of a private engagement between France and Prussia which would have allowed France on certain conditions to annex Belgium. This astounding revelation excited alarm and anger in England. The government met this possible danger by at once pressing upon France and Prussia a new treaty by which these powers bound themselves jointly with England to maintain the independence of Belgium and to take up arms against any state invading it. 
the government might fairly claim to have thus provided satisfactorily against any menace to the integrity and independence of Belgium, and they prepared against the more general dangers of the hour by asking for a large vote to enable them to strengthen the military defences of the country. But they were seriously embarrassed by the manner in which Russia suddenly proposed to deal with the Treaty of Paris. One article of that treaty declared that the Black Sea is neutralized its waters and its ports, thrown open to the mercantile marine of every nation, are formally and in perpetuity interdicted to the flag of war, either of the powers possessing its coasts or of any other power. And the Sultan of Turkey and the Emperor of Russia engaged to establish or maintain no military or maritime arsenals on the shores of that sea. Russia now took advantage of the war between France and Prussia to say that she would not submit to be bound by that article of the treaty any longer. The Russian statesman pleaded as a justification of this blunt and sudden proceeding that the Treaty of Paris had been ignored by other powers, and in a variety of ways since the time of its signature, and that Russia could not be expected to endure for ever an article which bore heavily directly and specially upon her. The manner of making the announcement was startling, ominous, and offensive, but there really was not much that any English statesman could do to interfere with Russia's declared intentions. Two of the great powers concerned in the Treaty of Paris were occupied too gravely with concerns of their own to have much interest in the neutralization of the Black Sea, it was not likely that France or Prussia would stop just then, from the death grapple in which they were engaged, to join in coercing Russia to keep to the disputed article in the treaty. Austria, of course, would not under any circumstances undertake to interfere. It would have been a piece of preposterous quixotry on the part of England to take on herself alone the responsibility of maintaining the sanctity of the treaty. Besides, it had long been clear to every practical politician that sooner or later, by one process or another, Russia would shake herself free from the obligation imposed on her by the clause which she now challenged. Literally, it affected all the great powers alike, but in fact it only concerned Russia, and it was devised as a means of restraining her alone. The Black Sea is virtually a Russian lake, at least it may be thus described, if we think of military and political questions only. For Turkey's use of the Black Sea could hardly be of vital moment to Europe, and Turkey and Russia divide between them the Euxine shores. However wise and just, therefore, the desire of the Western powers to have the war flag of Russia kept out of the waters of the Black Sea, it must have been clear to every statesman, even at the time when the treaty was made, that should Russia ever be in a position to demand a release from the conditions which her defeat in the Crimea imposed upon her, she would take advantage of the opportunity. It must have been expected that she would insist upon the abrogation of the clause in the Treaty of Paris, which shut her navy out of the waters that washed her own southern shores. But the manner of demanding the abrogation of the clause surprised and offended even more than the demand itself. There was something Kalmuk in the coarse bluntness of the obvious admission that Russia now insisted on new conditions because she found that there was no possibility of any Western alliance to interfere with her will. If England had gone to war with Russia, she would have gone to war for the maintenance of an article in the Treaty of Paris which no one believed could be long maintained in any case, and for which most of the European powers cared nothing either way. Lord Granville confined himself to remonstrating against the extraordinary assumption that any power which signed a treaty could legitimately and of its own motion repudiate any part of the treaty at any moment when it thought fit. If Russia cared about argument, it must be admitted that Lord Granville's argument was beyond reply. Lord Granville merely affirmed that when several parties have entered into a joint engagement, it cannot be open to any one of them to withdraw from it whenever he pleases, without consulting the others. But of course Russia cared nothing about argument or fairness in the matter. She saw that she had an unprecedented chance, 
a chance perhaps never to occur again, for getting out of her engagement with impunity, and she seized upon it and held to it. We do not see how even a Russian, outside the official world, could undertake to justify the action of the Russian government. On the other hand, we fear that the Russian emperor might find a good deal in the events then passing in Europe to plead in excuse of his policy. Public law did not seem for the time to be held in very high regard. The transactions between Prussia and France with regard to Belgium were disgraceful to the statesmen who took part in them. They were cynically avowed by Count Bismarck when he found it suited his convenience to betray his late accomplices. A feeble attempt was made on the part of the accomplices to disavow them, to deny them, or escape in some way from the shame of having set them going. Each party fell back upon the policy of the husband and wife, meeting by chance at the masked ball, each of whom makes overtures to the unrecognized other, and each of whom on a mutual recognition insists that the overtures were only made with the object of trying the other's virtue. Thus Europe was amused for a few days, and ought no doubt to have been scandalized by the controversy between France and Prussia as to which was the tempter, which was the tempted, and what was the real motive of the temptation. Then again, the King of Italy took advantage of the withdrawal of the French army of occupation from Rome to announce that in the interest of order, and to deliver Rome and the Pope from the tyranny of the Pope's foreign guards, he felt compelled to march the Italian troops into the city, taking forcible possession of it, and make it the capital of his dominions. We do not propose to discuss or even to touch upon the religious question then at issue between the Vatican and the King of Italy. We are willing to look at all that took place from the point of view of those who desired that Italy should become one united kingdom and should have Rome for her capital. Even from this point of view, it seems absolutely impossible to justify the course taken by the King of Italy. It is easy to understand how Italians and other men should say to themselves, now that the thing has been done, we are glad it is done and is over. But it would baffle the ingenuity of any casuist to find a justification for such a mode of solving a great political question, unless on the bold assumption that the stronger has always a right to do anything he thinks proper with the weaker. At all events, it is not surprising that when the Emperor of Russia saw such strokes of policy approved of by the cabinets of great powers like England, he should have said to himself that there was no reason why he alone of all other sovereigns on the European continent should not be at liberty to lay rude hands on opportunity. There was apparently a general scramble going on, and the Emperor Alexander may not have seen why there should be any law of morality or honor specially binding on him which was not binding on his neighbors. Such, of course, would not have been the view of a moralist, but the Emperor Alexander was perhaps of the way of thinking of that philosopher who has argued that it is immoral to be in advance of the morality of one's age. Perhaps Alexander thought that in acting as he did, he was only acting up to the morality of his contemporaries. End of section 31. Section 32 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording was in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 60, The Black Sea Clause, the Alabama Arbitration, Part 2. Lord Granville, however, continued to remonstrate. It was necessary to find some way of getting the European powers decently out of the difficulty in which they were placed. To enforce the treaty was out of the question, but on the other hand, it did not look seemly that they should put up quite tamely with the dictatorial resolve of Russia. The ingenious mind of Count Bismarck found a way of putting a fair show on the action of Europe. He suggested that a conference should be held in London to talk the whole matter over. On November 26, 1870, he addressed a circular to Austria, Turkey, Italy, and Russia, requesting them to authorize their representatives to assemble in London at a conference of the powers 
which had signed the treaty of March 30, 1856, in order to discuss the questions which are raised in connection with the communications in the circular of the Imperial Russian Cabinet. This invitation was stated to have been issued after the English Cabinet had assured Count Bismarck of its assent. Lord Granville politely assumed that the Russian government had merely announced its wish to have the clause in the treaty abrogated as a matter for the consideration of the European powers, and that the conference was to be assembled without any foregone conclusion as to its results. This graceful little fiction was welcomed by all diplomatists. The conference met with every becoming appearance of a full belief in the minds of all its members that they were about to consider a proposal which they might either accept or reject as their free judgment should determine. The conference assembled on January 17, 1871, and began its labors by an abstract declaration of principle. A special protocol was signed, affirming it to be an essential principle of the law of nations, that no state should release itself from the engagements of a treaty, unless with the consent of the other contracting powers. This important declaration, which amounted exactly to the announcement of the fact that there must be at least two parties to a bargain, was solemnly agreed upon, and then the conference felt itself quite free to finish its work on March 13, 1871, by agreeing to a treaty abrogating the clause for the neutralization of the Black Sea. There was something a little farcical about the whole transaction. We learn from Madame de Remusat that when the great Napoleon played chess, he liked to move the pieces occasionally in any way that suited his plans, and without any particular regard to the established rules of the game. If it seemed advantageous to him at some particular movement to give to his king the unlimited movement of the queen, he was in the habit of composedly adopting this new principle. Now we can perhaps imagine a few old-fashioned courtiers being a little offended at this arbitrary and one-sided plan of action, and conscious at the same time of their own inability to overrule the will of the great conqueror. What could be a more honorable and prudent way of reconciling principle and interest than to hold a chess conference, pass a resolution that it is one of the essential principles of the game that no player can alter its laws merely to please himself, and then, after this saving protest, proceed to authorize the Emperor Napoleon to make the particular moves that he happened just then to desire. Something like this was the policy pursued by the conference held in London. It did not tend to raise the credit or add to the popularity of the English government. We do not know that there was anything better to do, we can only say that the government deserves commiseration, which at an important European crisis can do nothing better. Other troubles began to press upon Mr. Gladstone's government. A few weeks after the reissue of the Russian circular, repudiating the neutralization clause in the Treaty of Paris, General Grant, in opening the Congress of the United States, announced that the time had come when the American government must take some decided steps for the settlement of the Alabama claims. This dispute had reached what we may call its second stage. The first was when the English government declined to admit any responsibility for the losses inflicted on American commerce. The second was arrived at when the more sober judgment of Lord Stanley acknowledged a willingness to submit the question to some manner of arbitrament. When the matters had gone so far, it was natural that attempts should be made at a convention for the settlement of the claims. In one instance, a convention devised by Mr. Reverdy Johnson, then American minister in England, had actually been signed by Lord Clarendon, foreign secretary, whose death in June 1870 was followed by Lord Granville's removal from the colonial to the foreign office. The Senate of the United States, however, rejected this convention by a majority of 54 to 1, and Mr. Reverdy Johnson resigned his office. The doom of the convention was chiefly brought about by the efforts of Mr. Charles Sumner, a leading member of the Senate of the United States. Most readers are probably aware of the fact 
that treaties concluded on behalf of the American government have to be referred for confirmation to the United States Senate, and that it is in the power of the Senate either to confirm or to reject them. In the foreign policy of the American Republic, the Senate exercises a direct and most important influence. Mr. Sumner was at that time the most eloquent and the most influential member of the Senate. He was a man of remarkable force of character, a somewhat masterful temperament, to use an expressive provincial word, a temperament corresponding with his great stature, his stately presence, and his singularly handsome and expressive face. He was one of the leaders of the anti-slavery movement, and the murderous assault made upon him some twelve years before in the old Senate chamber at Washington by a southern planter had filled the world then with horror and alarm. Sir George Cornwall Lewis happily described it as the first blow in a civil war. Mr. Sumner had been for the greater part of his life an enthusiastic admirer of England and English institutions. He had made himself acquainted with England and Englishmen, and was a great favorite in English society. He was a warm friend of Mr. Cobden, Mr. Bright, the Duke of Argyll, and many other eminent English public men. He was particularly enthusiastic about England because of the manner in which she had emancipated her slaves and the emphatic terms in which English society always expressed its horror of the system of slavery. In his own country, Mr. Sumner passed for an Anglomaniac. When the American Civil War broke out, he expected with full confidence to find the sympathies of England freely given to the side of the North. He was struck with amazement when he found that they were to so great an extent given to the South. But when he saw that the Alabama and other southern cruisers had been built in England, manned in England, and allowed to leave our ports, with apparently the applause of three-fourths of the representative men of England, his feelings toward this country underwent a sudden and a most complete change. He now persuaded himself that the sympathies of the English people were actually with slavery, and that England was resolved to lend her best help for the setting up of a slave-owning republic to the destruction of the American Union. In this, Mr. Sumner was mistaken. Great wrong was thoughtlessly done to the American Union by the acts of statesmen and others in England, but it is not true that there was any general sympathy with slavery or any national treachery to the American Union. The whole question has been already discussed in these pages, and the writer has not hesitated to condemn, in the strongest terms, much of the policy and many of the utterances of some of the leading statesmen of England. But Mr. Sumner was mistaken in his main conclusion, the conclusion that love of slavery and hatred of the Union dictated the foolish things that were often said and the unrightful things that were sometimes done. His mind, however, became filled with a fervor of anger against England. The zeal of his cause ate him up. All his love for England turned into hate. He was as little under the influence of sober reason when he discussed the conduct of England as Burke was when he declaimed against the French Revolution. During all his career, Mr. Sumner had been a professed lover of peace, had made peace his prevailing principle of action, and yet he now spoke and acted as if he were determined that there must be a war between England and the United States. Mr. Sumner denounced the convention made by Mr. Reverdy Johnson with a force of argument and of passionate eloquence which would have borne down all opposition if the Senate had not already been almost unanimously of one mind with him. It is right to say that the particular convention agreed on between Lord Clarendon and Mr. Reverdy Johnson does not seem to have been one that the American Senate could reasonably be expected to accept, or that could possibly give satisfaction to the American people. Mr. Reverdy Johnson was a Marylander, and may possibly have had some tinge of Southern sympathies. With a kindly and good-natured purpose to put an end to an international quarrel, he does not seem to have considered the difference between skinning over a wound and healing it. 
The defect of his convention was that it made the whole question a mere matter of individual claims. He professed to have to deal with a number of personal and private claims of various kinds, pending since a former settlement in 1853, claims made on the one side by British subjects against the American government, and on the other by American citizens against the English government, and it proposed to throw in the Alabama claims with all the others and have a convention for the general clearance of the whole account. Now it must be evident to anyone, English or American, who considers what the complaints made by the American government were, that this way of dealing with the question could not possibly satisfy the American people. It is surprising that a statesman like Lord Clarendon could, for a moment, have persuaded himself that there would be the slightest use in presenting such a convention to the American Senate. That he did so persuade himself and others is only one additional illustration of the curious ignorance of the condition of American political and national feeling which misguided England's policy during the whole of the American War. The claim set up by the United States on account of the cruise of the Alabama was first of all a national claim. The American government and people said, The course you have taken has prolonged the war against us. You have given comfort and strength to our enemies. You have allowed them to use your ports as arsenals and points of departure for their attacks on us. Your flag has protected their cruisers. Your sailors have manned their vessels and shotted their guns. We claim of you as a nation injured by a nation. To this the convention signed by Lord Clarendon made answer, We are willing that the two nations shall go into arbitration as to any individual claims for personal damages, which a few Englishmen may have on the one side and a few Americans on the other. We are willing to look into the items of any little bill which Mr. Thompson of New York may present for injuries done to his property, provided that you will do us the favor of perusing in the same spirit any bill which may be presented to you on behalf of Mr. Johnson of Manchester. This is really a fair statement of the difference between the convention which the United States Senate rejected and that which the American government afterwards accepted. The English government wisely gave way. They consented to send out a commission to Washington to confer with an American commission and to treat the whole question in dispute as national and not merely individual. The commission was to enter upon all the various subjects of dispute unsettled between England and the United States, the Alabama claims, the San Juan boundary, and the Canadian fishery question. The Dominion of Canada was to be represented on the commission. The English commissioners were Earl de Grey and Ripon, afterwards created Marquis of Ripon in return for his services in Washington. Sir Stafford Northcote, Mr. Montague Bernard, Professor of International Law at the University of Oxford, and Sir Edward Thornton, English Minister at Washington. Sir John A. Macdonald represented Canada. The American commissioners were Mr. Hamilton Fish, Secretary of State, General Schenck, afterwards American Minister in England, Mr. J. C. Bancroft Davis, Mr. Justice Nelson, Mr. Justice Williams, and Mr. E. R. Hoare. End of Section 32section thirty four of a history of our own times volume four by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter sixty the black sea clause the alabama arbitration part three the commissioners held a long series of meetings in washington and at length arrived at a basis of arbitration this was set forth in a memorable document, the Treaty of Washington. The Treaty of Washington acknowledged the international character of the dispute, and it opened with a remarkable admission on the part of the English government. It announced that Her Britannic Majesty has authorized her high commissioners and plenipotentiaries to express in a friendly spirit the regret felt by Her Majesty's government for the escape under whatever circumstances, of the Alabama and other vessels from British ports and for the depredations committed by those vessels. This was a very unusual acknowledgment 
to make as the opening of a document intended to establish a tribunal of arbitration for the claims in dispute. It ought not in itself to be considered as anything of a humiliation. In public, as in private life, it ought to be honorable rather than otherwise to express regret that we should even unwittingly have done harm to our neighbor or allowed harm to be done to him, that we had shot our arrow or the house and hurt our brother. But when compared with the stand which English ministers had taken not many years before, this was indeed a considerable change of attitude. It is not surprising that many Englishmen chafed at the appearance of submission which it presented. The treaty then proceeded to lay down three rules which it was agreed should be accepted by the arbitrators as applicable to the case. These rules were, a neutral government is bound first to use due diligence to prevent the fitting out, arming, or equipping within its jurisdiction of any vessel which it has reasonable ground to believe is intended to cruise or to carry on war against a power with which it is at peace, and also to use like diligence to prevent the departure from its jurisdiction of any vessel intended to cruise or carry on war as above. Such vessel, having been specially adapted, in whole or in part, within such jurisdiction to warlike use. Secondly, not to permit or suffer either belligerent to make use of its ports or waters as the base of naval operations against the other, or for the purpose of the renewal or augmentation of military supplies or arms or the recruitment of men. Thirdly, to exercise due diligence in its own ports and waters and as to all persons within its jurisdiction, to prevent any violation of the foregoing obligations and duties. The British commissioners followed up the acceptance of these three rules by a saving clause, declaring that the English government could not assent to them as a statement of principles of international law which were in force at the time when the claims arose, but that, in order to evince its desire of strengthening the friendly relations between the two countries and of making satisfactory provision for the future, it agreed that in deciding the questions arising out of the claims, these principles should be accepted, and the high contracting parties agreed to observe these rules between themselves in future and to bring them to the knowledge of other maritime powers and to invite them to accede to them. The treaty went on to provide for the settlement of the Alabama claims by a tribunal of five arbitrators, one to be appointed by the Queen and the others respectively by the President of the United States, the King of Italy, the President of the Swiss Confederation, and the Emperor of Brazil. This tribunal was to meet in Geneva and was to decide by a majority all the questions submitted to it. The treaty further provided for a tribunal to settle what may be called individual claims on either side, and another commission to meet afterwards at Halifax, Nova Scotia, and deal with the fishery question, an old outstanding dispute as to the reciprocal rights of British and American subjects to fish on each other's coasts. It referred the question of the northern boundary between the British North American territories and the United States to the arbitration of the German emperor. It also opened the navigation of the St. Lawrence and other rivers. Some delay was caused in the meeting of the Tribunal of Arbitration at Geneva by the sudden presentation on the part of the American government of what were called the indirect claims. To the surprise of everybody, the American case when presented was found to include claims for vast and indeed almost limitless damages, for indirect losses alleged to be caused by the crews of the Alabama and the other vessels, the loss by the transfer of trade to English vessels, the loss by increased rates of insurance, and all imaginable losses incident to the prolongation of the war were now made part of the American claims. It was clear that if such a principle were admitted, there was no possible reason why the claim should not include every dollar spent in the whole operations of the war, and in supplying any of the war's damages, from the first day when the Alabama put to sea. 
no one can undertake to say as a matter of certainty that the southern confederates might not have submitted at once if only the alabama had been seized and detained and therefore indirect claims might just as well be stretched out at once so as to cover all the subsequent expenses of the war in truth the indirect claims were not only absurd but even monstrous and the english government had not for one moment the slightest idea of admitting them as part of the case to be laid before the arbitrators at geneva the bare suggestion seemed more like a rude practical joke than a statesmanlike proposition even men like mr bright who had been devoted friends of the north during the war protested against this insufferable claim it was at last withdrawn we now know on the best possible authority that the american government never meant to press it mr john russell young's interesting account of his journey around the world with general grant gives an account of a conversation he had with the late president of the united states on the subject of the indirect claims mr young assures his readers that all his reports of statements made by general grant have been submitted to general grant's own revision general grant told mr young that he was personally opposed to the presentation of the indirect claims and that his secretary of state mr fish was also opposed to them i said general grant never believed in the presentation of indirect claims against england i did not think it would do any good i knew england would not consider them and that it would complicate our meritorious case by giving her something to complain about mr fish agreed in this view but was of opinion that mr sumner had to be considered mr sumner was the chairman of the senate's committee on foreign affairs a formidable man at such a time he was not cordial to the treaty and was displeased because general grant and mr fish had already overruled one of his suggestions that the first condition of peace with england should be the withdrawal of her flag from the north american continent that suggestion general grant rightly described as a declaration of war and i wanted peace not war mr sumner had laid great stress on indirect claims and not to offend him and not to leave an opening for future complaints on the part of demagogues it was thought by mr fish that the best way of getting rid of the indirect claims would be to let them go to the geneva arbitration general grant allowed himself to be convinced against his will but neither mr fish nor myself expected any good from the presentation it really did harm to the treaty by putting our government and those in england who were our friends in a false position it was a mistake but well intended it is a mistake ever to say more than you mean and as we never meant the indirect claims we should not have presented them even to please mr sumner it was indeed a profound mistake it was a stroke of policy which no statesman should ever have stooped to sanction the arbitration was on the point of being broken off the excitement in england was intense the american government had at last to withdraw the claims the geneva arbitrators of their own motion declared that all such claims were invalid and contrary to international law the mere fact of their presentation went far to destroy all the credit which the united states would have obtained by the firm maintenance of their just demands and their recognition by the court of arbitration the decision of the geneva tribunal went against england the court was unanimous in finding england responsible for the acts of the alabama a majority found her responsible for the acts of the florida and for some of those of the shenandoah but not responsible for those of other vessels they awarded a sum of about three millions and a quarter sterling as compensation for all losses and final settlement of all claims including interest sir alexander coburn who attended the sittings of the court as the representative of england presented a long and eloquent protest against a great part of the finding of the tribunal while admitting the decision in the case of the alabama and recommending submission to the general award sir alexander coburn made a sort of historical vindication or apologia of the conduct of the english government during the civil war it was an eloquent patriotic and impassioned plaidoyer which seemed oddly out of place in the somewhat dry and business-like records of the tribunal's transactions 
it occupied two hundred and fifty pages of the london gazette many readers admired it some smiled at it the great majority of englishmen did not read it it was not so much preserved as entombed in the ponderous pages of the official journal the german emperor was left to decide as to the ownership of the small island of san juan near vancouver's island a question remaining unsettled since the oregon treaty and already explained in this work the emperor decided that the american claim to the island was just san juan had for years been in a somewhat hazardous condition of joint occupation by england and the united states it was evacuated by england in consequence of the award at the close of november eighteen seventy three the principle of arbitration had not thus far worked in a manner calculated greatly to delight the english people in each case the award had gone decidedly against them no doubt it had gone against them because the right of each case was against them and those who submit to arbitration have no business to complain because a decision is not given in their favour england had in any case gained much by the policy which submitted the dispute to a peaceful tribunal she had saved her own people and her opponents as well from the terrible ordeal of a war in which victory would have been only one degree better than defeat she avoided all the legacy of reciprocal hate which is the inevitable penalty of war she had done her part toward the establishment of a great principle for the benefit of all coming generations yet it would be impossible to say that the feeling of the english people was one of unmixed satisfaction the bulk of a population is not made up of moral philosophers and what most of the english people saw was that england had been compelled in homely phrase to knuckle down to america the policy which accepted the arbitration seems to us to have been entirely wise honourable statesmanlike and just the fault to be found was with that earlier policy which gave the united states only too fair a ground for asserting their claims but it is certain that mr gladstone and his colleagues suffered in public esteem by the mere fact of their having accepted the arbitration which went so signally against england they were somewhat in the position of a government who have to submit to rigorous and humiliating terms of peace they may not have been responsible for the war it may have been no act of theirs which made the acceptance of the harsh terms a cruel necessity it may not be open to any one to say that they had any practical alternative but to submit to the demands of the occasion all this may be true yet none the less is the government to be pitied which has to submit to any terms of peace by which its people seem to be humbled the conservative party made it for a long time a great point against mr gladstone's government that he had accepted the treaty of washington they did not always seem to reflect that a leading conservative sir stafford northcote had been made one of the joint commissioners in order that the arrangement might not seem to be the mere act of a political party perhaps in one or two instances the manner in which the treaty was vindicated may have helped to embitter the sacrifice mr lowe for instance put it as a clear saving of money pointing out that a war would have cost much more than the expense of paying off the award this was not the happiest way of commending the transaction to the sympathies of a proud and somewhat unreasoning public however that may be it is certain that the effect of the geneva arbitration was to create a sore and angry feeling among englishmen in general the feeling found expression with some smouldered in sullenness with others it was unreasonable and unjust but it was not altogether unnatural and it had its effect on the popularity of mr gladstone's government the opening of the session of eighteen seventy two was made melancholy by the announcement that lord mayo the viceroy of india had been killed by a fanatical assassin in a convict settlement on one of the andaman islands which the viceroy was inspecting lord mayo had borne himself well in his difficult position and had won the admiration of men of all parties by his firmness his energy his humanity and his justice end of section thirty three
Section 34 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 61, The Turn of the Tide, Part 1. The liberal ministry continued somehow to fall off in popularity. They made a great many enemies. This fact was for the most part rather to their credit than otherwise. They came into office, pledged to carry out certain reforms, and they did carry them out, regardless of the offence they gave to class privileges and vested interests. A great reforming administration must always count on making enemies, and enemies whose hostility will be subtle and enduring. The Prime Minister himself was personally too much absorbed in the zeal of his cause, not sometimes to run counter to the feelings, the prejudices, the sensitive jealousies of men less earnest and less self-forgetting. Mr. Gladstone was profoundly serious in his purposes of reform, and very serious men are seldom popular in a society like that of London. The long series of bold and vigorous reforms was undoubtedly causing the public to lose its breath. People were getting tired of going on, as an ordinary walker gets tired of trying to keep up with some man who is bent on walking as fast and as far as he possibly can without rest or interruption. The inevitable reaction was setting in. It must have come in any case. No popularity, no skill, no cunning in the management of men, no quality or endowment on the part of the Prime Minister could have wholly prevented that result. Mr. Gladstone was not cunning in the management of men. He would probably have despised himself for availing of such a craft had he possessed it. He showed his feelings too plainly. If men displeased him, he seldom took the trouble to conceal his displeasure. He was too often preoccupied, as the French phrase puts it, to think of petty courtesies and small social arts. It was murmured among his followers that he was dictatorial, and no doubt he was dictatorial, in the sense that he had strong purposes himself and was earnest in trying to press them upon other men. His very religious opinion served to interfere with his social popularity. He seemed to be a curious blending of the English high churchman and the Scottish Presbyterian. He displeased the ordinary English middle class by leaning too much to ritualism, and on the other hand, he often offended the Roman Catholics by his impassioned diatribes against the Pope and the Church of Rome. One or two appointments made by or under the authority of Mr. Gladstone gave occasion to considerable controversy and to something like scandal. One of these was the appointment of the Attorney General Sir Robert Collier to a puny judgeship of the Court of Common Pleas, in order technically to qualify him for a seat on the bench of a new Court of Appeal. That is to say, to become one of the paid members of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. The statute required that every judge of the Court of Appeal should have been a judge of one of the ordinary courts, and Sir Robert Collier was passed through the Court of Common Pleas in order that he might have the technical qualification there was not the slightest suggestion of any improper motive on the part of Mr. Gladstone, or lack of legal or judicial fitness on the part of Sir Robert Collier. On the contrary, it was admitted that Sir Robert Collier had helped the government out of a difficulty by taking an appointment which several judges had declined, and which had not quite such a position as that which the traditions of his office entitled him to expect. It seemed, however, as if there was something of a trick in the act which thus passed him through the one court in order to give him a technical qualification for the other. A vote of censure on the government was moved in the House of Lords, and the universal impression was that it would be carried. Some of the opposition leaders did all they could to make it the means of injuring the government, and even went the length of including in their complaints the fact that the Lord Chancellor had given an appointment as judge of a county court to the Mr. Beals who was president of the Reform League when the Hyde Park railings were thrown down. The vote of censure was, however, rejected by 89 against 87. 
a similar attempt was made in the house of commons and was defeated only however by a majority of twenty-seven a small majority in the house where the strength of the government was supposed to lie another appointment which led to controversy was that of the rev w w harvey to the rectory of uelm the law required that the rector of uelm should be a member of the convocation of oxford and mr harvey who had been educated at cambridge was made a member of the oxford convocation by oxford not by mr gladstone in order to qualify him for the appointment in this instance too there was no question either as to the motives of the minister or the merits of the appointment but as in the former case there seemed to many persons something like a trick in the manner of obtaining the qualification each case gave a chance to mr gladstone's enemies which they were not slow to use he was accused of casuistry which to many englishmen seems a sort of crime and of jesuitry which to some englishmen seems the worst of crimes it was part of mr gladstone's curious fortune to be denounced by certain enemies as a roman catholic in disguise at the very time when he was estranging and offending some of his most earnest catholic supporters by the energy of his attacks upon the political influence of their church there can be no doubt that although in neither house of parliament could any expression of censure be obtained the colliery explosion as it was called and the u elm scandal gave a downward push to the declining popularity of mr gladstone's administration the liquor interest too was soon in arms against him the united kingdom alliance for the suppression of the liquor traffic had of late years been growing so strong as to become a positive influence in politics its object was to bring about the adoption of legislation which should leave it in the power of a two-thirds majority in each locality to stop altogether if it were so thought fit the public sale of intoxicating drinks the parliamentary leader of the agitation was sir wilfrid lawson a man of position of great energy and of thorough earnestness sir wilfrid lawson was not however merely energetic and earnest he had a peculiarly effective style of speaking curiously unlike that which might be expected from the advocate of an austere and somewhat fanatical sort of legislation he was a humorist of a fresh and vigorous order and he always took care to amuse his listeners and never allow his speeches to bore them the alliance was always urging on the government and public opinion against the drink traffic and it became clear that something must be done to regulate the trade mr bruce the home secretary brought a bill which the alliance condemned as feebleness and which the publicans resented as oppression the bill increased the penalties for drunkenness and shortened the hours during which public houses might be kept open on sundays and on weekdays as well the effect of the passing of this measure was to throw the publicans into open hostility to the government the publicans had an old grudge against mr gladstone himself in former days he had been guilty of passing a measure which allowed the light wines of france to be sold in bottles by the grocers and drunk in pastry cook shops and refreshment houses and the publicans highly disapproved of such innovations on the traditional ways of the british constitution some of their advocates indeed had denounced with a generous ardour the policy which would promote intemperance by allowing any one but a public housekeeper to sell a glass of wine the debaucheries of the pastry cook shops were described in language that recalled the days of colonel sibthorpe's prognostication as to the corrupting influence of french wines and french morals mr bruce's licensing act was a new wrong charged at the door of mr gladstone gin lane and beer street rose in rebellion against him the publicans were a numerous body they were well organized the network of their trade and their association spread all over the kingdom the hostile feelings of some were perhaps not unnaturally embittered by the fact that many speakers and writers treated all publicans alike made no distinction between the reputable and the disreputable and involved in a common condemnation honest mine host of the garter and roguish boniface of the bow stratagem it was well known that a large proportion of the publicans carried on a respectable trade and were losers rather than gainers by drunkenness 
yet in many instances these men found themselves classed with the owners of the most disreputable gin palaces with persons who flourished on the viciousness and degradation of their fellow creatures the natural result of indiscriminate attack was to cause an indiscriminate alliance for the purposes of defence these were difficulties thickening across the path of mr gladstone's government all the time too a sullen suspicion prevailed among many classes that there had been a lowering of the national pride many men regarded the reopening of the treaty of paris as a triumph for russia at the expense of england and the washington treaty as a submission of this country to the arrogance of the united states no one undertook to say that there was anything the government could have done other than what they did but the world must have changed indeed when men will cease to associate a government with the untoward events that occur during its time or to hold the minister who has to make the apology responsible for the humiliation which a moralist would see in the original fault and not in the atonement the establishment of a republic in france could not be without its influence on english politics a certain amount of more or less vague republican sentiment is always afloat on the surface of english radicalism for some time before the founding of the french republic this vague sentiment had been undergoing a crystallizing and strengthening process under the influence of two causes the success of the north in america and the gradual degradation of the french empire under napoleon the third de tocqueville had observed long before that the great doubt he felt as to the stability of the american republic was on the question whether it could stand the stress of a great war now it had stood the stress of a great war and had come out all the stronger for the trial imperial france or rather the empire imposed on france had come for a moment into peril of collision with the american republic and had gone down before it without even making an effort to maintain its arrogant attitude facts like these naturally produced a distinct impression upon certain classes in england the establishment of the French Republic now came as a climax. We have already spoken of the great meetings which were held in London and in most of the English cities to express sympathy with the struggling Republic, and at some of these meetings a good deal of very outspoken Republicanism made itself heard. There could be no doubt that a considerable proportion of the working men in the cities were Republicans in sentiment english writers who were not by any means of the sentimental school but on the contrary were somewhat hard and cold in their dogmatism began to publish articles in advanced reviews and magazines distinctly pointing out the logical superiority of the republican theory men were already discussing the possibility of a declared republican party being formed both in and out of parliament not indeed a party clamouring for the instant pulling down of the monarchy no one thought of that but a party which would avow itself republican in principle and acknowledge that its object was to bring about such a change in public sentiment as might prepare the way for a republic in the time to come mr frederick harrison a writer of ability and reputation declared in one of the reviews that the adoption of the republican form of government by the english people at some time or other was as certain as the rising of tomorrow's sun of course there have always been republican sentiments among certain classes of englishmen and any breath of change on the continent is sure to fan them into a little flame that flickers for a while this time however many people thought that the sentiment was really going to convert itself into a principle and that the principle might see itself represented by a political party France, which had given the impulse, gave also the shock that brought reaction. The wild theories, the monstrous excesses, the preposterous theatricism of the Paris Commune had a very chilling effect on the ardor of English Republicans. The movement in England had, however, one or two curious episodes before it sank into quiescence. In March 1872, Sir Charles Dilk brought on a motion in the House of Commons for inquiring into the manner in which the income and allowances of the crown are expended sir charles dilke had been for some months of the preceding autumn the best abused man in great britain 
His name appeared over and over again in the daily papers. He monopolized for weeks the first leading article in every journal. The comic papers caricatured Citizen Dilk every week. In the theatrical burlesques, his name was the signal for all manner of drolleries and buffooneries. The telegraph wires carried his doings and speeches everywhere. American correspondents interviewed him and pictured him as the future president of England. He went round the towns of the north of England delivering a lecture on the expenses of royalty, and his progress was marked by more or less serious riots everywhere. Life was sacrificed in more than one of these tumults. A Paris journal described his progress as a sort of civil war. The working men of London and of the North held great meetings to express their approval of his principles and conduct, and to pass resolutions in support of the young baronet who had dared to condemn the expenses of royalty and to avow himself a Republican. Many people really thought that for good or ill, the vague, fluent, incoherent movement toward republicanism in England had found its leader at last, that the hour had come and the man. To increase and perplex the excitement, the Prince of Wales fell ill, and if Sir Charles Dilke had personally caused his illness, he could not have been more bitterly denounced by some speakers and writers. He was represented as a monster of disloyalty who had chosen to assail the Queen, against whom it is only fair to say he had never uttered a disparaging word, while her eldest son lay struggling with death. The Prince of Wales, given over by all the doctors, recovered, and in the outburst of public gladness and loyalty that followed his restoration to health, Sir Charles Dilke was almost forgotten. But he had been challenged to repeat in the House of Commons the statements that he had made in the country. He answered the challenge by bringing forward the motion to inquire into the manner in which the income and allowances of the Crown were spent. There was unmistakable courage in the cool, steady way in which he rose to propose his motion. He faced his house full of antagonists with dogged calmness. It is a hard trial to the nerves to face such an audience. Sir Charles Dilke knew that every one in that house, save three or four alone, were bitterly opposed to him. He knew that the most overpowering eloquence was to pour out on him the moment he had finished his speech, but neither then nor after did he show the slightest sign of quailing. His speech was well got up as to the facts, well arranged and evidently well committed to memory, but it was not eloquent. The House began to grow apathetic before Sir Charles Dilke had nearly finished his address. The warmth of Mr. Gladstone's reply was almost startling by sheer force of contrast to Sir C. Dilke's quiet, dry, and labored style. No one expected that Mr. Gladstone would be so passionately merciless as he proved to be. His vehemence, forcing the house into hot temper again, was one cause at least of the extraordinary tumult that arose when Sir C. Dilke's friend and ally, Mr. Oberon Herbert, rose to speak and declared himself also a Republican. This was the signal for as extraordinary a scene as the House of Commons has ever exhibited. The tumult became so great that if it had taken place at any public meeting, it would have been called a riot, and would have required the interference of the police. Some hundreds of strong, excited, furious men were shouting and yelling with the object of interrupting the speech and drowning the voice of one man. The Speaker of the House of Commons is usually an omnipotent authority. Seldom, indeed, does anyone presume to question his decision or to utter a word when he enjoins silence. One of the peculiarities of the House of Commons, which all strangers admire, is the respect and deference it usually shows to the President, whom it has itself chosen. But on this occasion, the Speaker was literally powerless. "'What care these roarers for the name of King?' asked the boatswain in the tempest, as he points to the furious waves. "'What cared the roarers in the House of Commons for the name of Speaker?' there was no authority which could overawe them. They were all men of education and position, university men, younger sons of peers, great landowners, officers in crack cavalry regiments, the very elite, most of them, 
of the English aristocracy. But they became for the moment a merely furious mob. They roared, hissed, gesticulated with the fury of a sixpenny gallery disappointed in some boxing night performance. The shrill cock-crow unheard in the House of Commons for a whole generation shrieked once more in the ears of the bewildered officials. Probably nobody now reads Samuel Warren's once popular novel, Ten Thousand a Year, but those who did read it long ago may remember that when Mr. Tittlebat Titmouse got into Parliament, his one only contribution to debate was his admirable and distracting imitation of the crowing of a cock. Everyone supposed that Titmouse and his ways were dead and gone, but it would positively seem that some of his kith and kin were alive and in good voice that night in the House of Commons. The debate was chiefly remarkable for the fact that it noted the exact level to which the Republican sentiment had arisen in English political society. Three members of the House of Commons acknowledged in more or less qualified terms their theoretical preference for the Republican form of government. These were Sir C. Dilk, Mr. Oberon Herbert, and Professor Fawcett. There were doubtless some other men in the House who sympathized with Republican principles, but who well convinced that the monarchy had hitherto suited England, and was not likely to be soon changed, gave themselves no more trouble about the matter than if it were some purely speculative question. Such men could not be called Republicans. The name could only be given to the few who frankly declared that they would prefer to see England a republic, and even to these it must be given only in a qualified sense. Not one of them was anxious to see any sudden change. Not one of them was even inclined to set on foot any agitation for the propagation of Republican principles. The excesses of the Commune and the illness of the Prince of Wales were combining influences too strong for theory to contend against. End of section 34. Section 35 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 61 The Turn of the Tide, Part 2. Nothing more was then heard of republicanism in England. It was clear that there was no Republican Party, properly so called, in the country. Some of the philosophical radicals, who were most strongly Republican in sentiment and conviction, declared in the most explicit words that they would not make the slightest effort to agitate in favor of a republic, that they did not think the difference between a republic and the British Constitution was worth the trouble of a long agitation. If a republic were to come, they said, it would come in good time. England could afford to wait. When this philosophical mood of mind prevailed among Republicans, it was clear that the question of a republic had not, as the phrase is, come up. Mr. Bright expressed his opinion on the subject with his usual blunt good sense. Someone wrote to him, asking what he thought of republicanism. Mr. Bright replied that as to opinions on the question of monarchy or republicanism, I hope and believe it will be a long time before we are asked to give our opinion. Our ancestors decided the matter a good while since, and I would suggest that you and I should leave any further decision to our posterity. The whole condition of things was fairly set out in Mr. Bright's letter. There was no practical question, then, as to the relative advantages of monarchy and republic. If that question is to come up at some time, it had not come up then. A new figure did, however, arise about that time in English politics. It was one less expected than even the portentous form of a cosmopolitan republican. It was that of the English agricultural laborer as a political agitator and member of a trades union. For years and years the working man in cities had been a conspicuous personage. He had played an influential role in every agitation. Orators had pleaded for him and sought his applause. Statesmen had paid court to him. The newspapers were always filled with him. His trades unions were a scare to half society. He figured in novels and poetry and satire. He was positively beginning to be a sort of fourth power in the state. 
all the while the rural labourer was supposed to be entirely out of the play. No one troubled about him. When he appeared in the papers, it was only as the subject of some horrifying paragraph about the miseries of a labourer's family, who nine in number had all to sleep in one room, four of the unfortunate group being afflicted with fever or smallpox. Sometimes a London newspaper sent down a special correspondent to explore the condition of some village, and he wrote back descriptions which made the flesh creep and the blood run cold. Let any one picture to himself a poorly fed, half-clad, and wholly ignorant family of eight or nine, including, say, two grown young men and two grown young women, who habitually sleep in one room and in not a few instances in one bed. Let him think of all this and imagine what the worst consequences must be, and his imagination will probably have fallen short of the fearful reality. That was the rural laborer at his worst. At his best he seemed a picture of hard-working, cleanly, patient, and almost hopeless poverty. Mr. Disraeli and the Tory landlord said he was too contented and happy to need a change. Most other people thought that he was rendered too stolid by the monotonous misery of his condition. Suddenly, in the spring of 1872, not long after the opening of Parliament, vague rumours began to reach London of a movement of some kind among the labourers of South Warwickshire. It was first reported that they had asked for an increase of wages, then that they were actually forming a labourers' union, after the pattern of the artisans, then that they were on strike. There came accounts of meetings of rural labourers, meetings positively where men made speeches. Instantly the London papers sent down their special correspondents, and for weeks the movement among the agricultural labourers of South Warwickshire, the country of Shakespeare, became the sensation of London. The Geneva arbitration, which was then giving Parliament something to talk about every night, was thrown into the shade. Even the Tichborne case, the civil part of which had just come to a close, did not divert public opinion altogether from the agitation among the rural labourers. How the thing first came about is not very clear, but it seems that in one of the South Warwickshire villages was a wonderful man, a labourer, who had travelled, a wanderer, who had seen men and cities. This adventurous man had led a wild life. He had travelled out of his native village, away, far away, quite into the next county, and even, it was reported, into the county beyond that and had seen strange and unfamiliar ways of life. He had been in the iron manufacturing regions, the black country, and he had heard about strikes, and been present at meetings of grimy working men, who talked out and made their demands as boldly as the masters themselves could do. The wanderer returned to his native village, and he told of the wonders he had seen, and perhaps found incredulous listeners but there came a somewhat harder time than usual in South Warwickshire. The wages of eight or ten shillings a week utterly failed to keep up the family. There was sad and sullen talk of starvation. The farmers refused to give higher wages, declaring that the rents they had to pay to the great landlords would not allow them. The great landlords said they got no more than their land was worth and that they could do nothing. Meanwhile, it was evident that the farmers had plenty to eat, drink, and wear, that the landlords were living rather better than most princes, and that the labourer was on the verge of starvation. The travelled man whispered in his village the one word, strike. The thing took fire somehow. A few men accepted it at once. In the neighbouring village was a man who, although only a day labourer, had been accustomed to act as a volunteer preacher of Methodism, and who, by his superior intelligence, his good character, and his effective way of talking, had acquired a great influence among his fellows. This man was Joseph Arch. He was consulted, and he approved of the notion. He was asked if he would get together a meeting and make a speech, and he consented. Calling a meeting of day laborers, then, was almost as bold a step as proclaiming a revolution. Yet it was done somehow. 
there were no circulars no placards none of the machinery which we all associate with the getting up of a meeting the news had to be passed on by word of mouth that a meeting was to be held and where the incredulous had to be convinced that there was really to be a meeting the timid had to be prevailed on to take the courage and go the meeting was held under a great chestnut tree which thereby acquired a sort of fame there a thousand labourers came together and were addressed by joseph arch he carried them all with him his one great idea great and bold to them simple and small to us was to form a labourers union like the trades unions of the cities the idea was taken up with enthusiasm new branches were formed every day arch kept on holding meetings and addressing crowds the whole movement passed naturally and necessarily into his hands how completely it was a rural labourers movement how little help or guidance it received in its origin from other sources how profoundly isolated from the outer and active world was it seen may be understood from the fact that it was nearly six weeks in action before its very existence was known in london then the special correspondents went down to the spot and turned a blaze of light on it mr oberon herbert mr edward jenkins and other active reformers appeared on the scene and threw themselves into the movement meetings were held in various villages and mr arch found himself in the constant company of members of parliament leaders of political organizations and other unwonted associates the good sense of the sturdy labourer never forsook the leader of the movement nor did he ever show any inclination to subordinate his enterprise to any political agitation the danger apprehended by many that the rural labourers would allow their organization simply to drift in the wake of the mere political agitators proved to be unreal the labourers took the help of mr herbert and sir c dilk and mr odger and mr george potter so far as the mere conduct of the organization was concerned but they did not show any inclination to allow their project to expand as yet beyond its simple and natural limits on the other hand it was clear that so far as the labourers had any political sympathies they were with liberalism and against toryism this too was a little surprise for the public most persons had supposed that a race of beings brought up for generations under the exclusive tutorship of the landlord the vicar and the wives of the landlords and the vicars would have had any political tendencies they possessed drilled and drummed into the grooves of toryism the shock of surprise with which the opposite idea impressed itself upon the minds of the conservative squires found ready and angry expression the landlords in most places declared themselves against the movement of the labourers some of them denounced it in unmeasured language mr disraeli at once sprang to the front as the champion of feudal aristocracy and the british country squire the one great delight of the author of vivian gray when he was not engaged in parliament was to play at being a country squire in scott's guy mannering the attorney gilbert glasson who has managed to get possession of an estate makes it his grand ambition to pass off for a country gentleman and once gives a beggar half a crown because the knowing vagrant had accosted him as ellangowan according to the old-fashioned scottish custom which declares it the privilege of the landlord to be addressed by the name of his estate mr disraeli seemed to have the same ambition in birth in nationality in mental training in appearance in his instinctive way of looking at things he was essentially a foreigner in english society of all classes of english society that with which by intellect temperament and training he might be expected to have the least sympathy was the english landlord class yet it seemed that his pride was to be considered an english landlord or rather to be mistaken for an english landlord it used to be a remarkable sight to see mr disraeli presiding on certain occasions of annual celebration when by the bounty and subscriptions of some of the landlords the prize of a blue coat with brass buttons was to be conferred on the venerable labourer who had for the longest number of years contrived to support the largest family without having recourse to parish relief 
the dignified gravity with which Mr. Disraeli admonished and blessed the happy recipient of this noble prize, the seeming assumption that a long life of privation and labor was well worth any true man's endurance for the glory of being publicly endued at the age of seventy-five with a remarkable high-collared blue swallow-tail coat, the indignant repudiation of the unworthy levity of persons in London, newspaper writers and such like, who tried to make this ceremonial seem ridiculous, all this made up a performance of which caricature itself could hardly exaggerate the peculiarities. Joseph Arch himself mentioned in a speech the unlucky fact that one of the fortunate rustics who had actually been rewarded with this Montheon prize one of the proud wearers of this singular robe of honour, had been compelled, after all, to seek shelter in the workhouse, where they probably would not allow him to parade in the brass-buttoned blue coat even on Sundays. However that may be, Mr. Disraeli was none the less entitled, and none the less willing, to constitute himself the champion of the country squires, and when the agitation became public he stood forward to vindicate and glorify the impugned state of things. Mr. Disraeli insisted that everything was as it ought to be, and that the English laborer in the Midland and Southern counties was but another Corridon in an English Arcadia, piping for very happiness, as though, like the shepherd boy in Sir Philip Sidney's tale, he could never grow old. The controversy was taken up in the House of Commons and served, if it did nothing else, to draw all the more attention to the condition of the British laborer. An amusing little side controversy arose between Mr. Newdigate and Mr. Arch's party. As a landlord and a Tory of the Tories, Mr. Newdigate was, of course, an opponent of the laborers' strike. It so happened that at one of the public meetings in London, where Joseph Arch spoke, Cardinal Manning was likewise a speaker. That was enough for Mr. Newdigate. He immediately proclaimed his discovery of a new popish plot, and bluntly charged Mr. Arch with being a disguised emissary and agent of the Jesuits. Poor Arch, who so short a time before was only an obscure laborer with a turn for preaching Methodism in a little country village, found himself acclaimed by half England as the apostle of a new social revolution and denounced by the Tories generally as the pioneer of a lawless jacquerie. He heard his name mentioned every day in the speeches of statesmen and the debates in Parliament. He had to defend himself against the charge of being a secret agent of the Vatican, and to disclaim any intention of conducting an agitation for the establishment of a republic. One indirect but necessary result of the agitation was to call attention to the injustice done to the rural population when they were left unenfranchised at the time of the passing of the last reform bill. The injustice was strongly pressed upon the government, and Mr. Gladstone frankly acknowledged that it would be impossible to allow things to remain long in their anomalous state. In truth, when the Reform Bill was passed, nobody supposed that the rural population was capable of making any use of a vote. Therefore, the movement which began in Warwickshire took two directions when the immediate effects of the partial strike were over. A permanent union of laborers was formed corresponding generally in system with the organizations of the cities. The other direction was distinctly political. The rural population, through their leaders, joined with the reformers of the cities for the purpose of obtaining an equal franchise in town and country, in other words, for the enfranchisement of the peasantry. The emancipation of the rural laborers began under that chestnut tree where the first meeting answered the appeals of Joseph Arch. The English peasant was the newest and latest figure on the political stage of the world. He followed the Virginian Negro, and he came long after the Russian serf. Unlike these, however, he had for his leader no greater man than one of his own class. The rough and ready peasant preacher Joseph Arch had probably little idea when he began his speech under the chestnut tree that he was speaking the first lines of a new chapter of the country's history. A few lines ought perhaps to be spared to the Tichborne trial which has just been mentioned. A claim was suddenly made upon the Tichborne baronetcy and estates 
by a man who came from Australia and who announced himself as the heir to the title and the property. He declared that he was the Sir Roger Tichborne who was supposed to have gone down with the wreck of the Bella sailing from Rio in South America years before. The Tichborne case is certainly one of the most remarkable instances of disputed identity on record. Just now, the most wonderful thing about it seems to be the extraordinary amount of popular sympathy and credit which the claimant, as he was called, contrived to secure. He was undoubtedly an impostor, that is, if the most overwhelming accumulation of evidence, positive and negative, could establish any fact. The person who presented himself as the long-lost Roger Tichborne bore not the slightest personal resemblance to the young man who sailed in the Bella and was believed to have perished with her. The claimant was indeed curiously unlike what people remembered Roger Tichborne, not only in face but in figure and in manners. A slender, delicate, somewhat feeble young man of fair though not finished education, who had always lived in good society, and showed it in his language and bearing, went down in the Bella, or at least disappeared with her, and thirteen years afterwards there came from Australia a man of enormous bulk, ignorant to an almost inconceivable degree of ignorance, and who, if he were Roger Tichborne, had not only forgotten all the manners of his class, but had forgotten the very names of many of those with whom he ought to have been most familiar, including the name of his own mother, and this man presented himself as the lost heir and claimed the property. If this were the whole story, it might be said that there was nothing particularly wonderful in it. A preposterous attempt was made to carry on an imposture, and it failed. Such things happen every day. In this case, the attempt was only a little more outrageous and ridiculous than in others. But the really strange part of the tale is to come. Despite all the obvious arguments against the claimant, it is certain that this story was believed by the mother of Roger Tichborne, and by a very considerable number of persons of undoubted veracity and intelligence who had known Roger Tichborne in his youth. True, it seems impossible that a slender Prince Hal could in a few years grow into a Falstaff, but so much the more difficult must it surely have been for the Falstaff to persuade people that he was actually the Prince Hal. So much the more wonderful is it that he did actually succeed in persuading many into full belief in himself and his story. The man who claimed to be Roger Tichborne utterly failed to make out his claim in a court of law. It was shown upon the clearest evidence that he had gradually built together and built up around him a whole system of imposture. He was then put on trial for his frauds and found guilty and sentenced to fourteen years penal servitude. Yet thousands of ignorant persons, and some persons not at all ignorant, continued, and to this day continue to believe in him. He became the figurehead of a new and grotesque agitation. His own imposture was the parent and the patron of other impostures. His story opens up a far more curious study of human credulity than that of Joanna Southcote, or that of Mary Tofts, or Perkin Warbeck, or the Cock Lane Ghost. End of section 35. Section 36 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 62 The Fall of the Great Administration, Part 1. The first few days of 1873 were marked by an event which, had it occurred four or five years before, would have filled the world with a profound sensation. Happening as it did, it made comparatively little stir in the political waters. It was the death of Louis Napoleon, late Emperor of the French, at his house in Chislehurst, Kent. After his imprisonment, if it can be called so, at Wilhelmshohe in Kassel, where he was treated as an honoured guest rather than a captive, the fallen emperor came to England. He settled with his wife and son at Chislehurst and lived in dignified semi-retirement. The emperor became a sort of favourite with the public here. 
a reaction seemed to have set in against the dread and dislike with which he had at one time been regarded. He enjoyed a certain amount of popularity. He sometimes showed himself in public, as, for example, at a lecture given by Mr. Stanley, the adventurous New York special correspondent, who had gone out to Africa and discovered Dr. Livingston. Louis Napoleon had for a long time been in sinking health. His life had been overwrought in every way. He had lived many lives in a comparatively short space of time. Most of his friends had long been expecting his death from week to week, almost from day to day. He died on January 9th. The event created no great sensation. Perhaps even the news of his death was but an anticlimax after the news of his fall. For twenty years he had filled a space in the eyes of the world with which the importance of no man else could pretend to compare. His political bulk had towered up in European affairs like some huge castle dominating over a city. All the earth listened to the lightest word he spoke. For good or evil, his influence and his name were potent in every corner of the globe. His nod convulsed continents. His arms glittered from the Crimea to Cochin China, from Algeria to Mexico. A signal from him and the dominion of the Austrians over Lombardy was broken at Solferino, and a new Italy arose on the horizon of Europe. A whisper from him and Maximilian of Austria hastens across the ocean in hope to found a Mexican empire, in reality to find a premature grave. A wave of his hand on Garibaldi is crushed at Mentana. What wonder if such a man should at one time have come to believe himself the special favorite and the spoilt child of destiny? The whole condition of things seemed changed when Louis Napoleon fell at Sedan. Some forty years of wandering, of obscurity, of futile, almost ludicrous enterprises, of exile, of imprisonment, of the world's contempt, and then twenty years of splendid success, of supreme sovereignty, had led him to this, to the disgrace of Sidon, to the quiet fading days of Chislehurst. He had overshadowed France and Europe with the gloom of his glory, and now, to borrow John Evelyn's words, is all in the dust. In one of his Napoleonic ballads, Béranger, speaking of the fall of the first emperor, bitterly declares that the kings of Europe who despise him in his exile once crawl round his throne and still bear on their brows the traces of the dust which his footprint left when he set his conqueror's heel upon their heads. Europe had certainly at one time showed an inclination to grovel before Louis Napoleon's throne. He was regarded as a statesman of mysterious, infallible, superhuman wisdom. He was understood to be a Brutus, who had for a long time professed idiotcy in order to conceal inspiration. When he fell, the world shook its wise head pityingly, and seemed inclined to fall back upon the opinion that it must have been only idiocy trying to assume the oracular ways of inspiration. Toward the closing days there was a revival of a kindlier feeling and a fairer judgment. Louis Napoleon had, in his early and obscure days, lived in lodgings in King Street, St. James, and when he became a great emperor, a tablet was set up in the outer wall of the house to inform all the world of the fact. He came to London in the zenith of his power and his fame, and he drove by the house and looked at the tablet and said something oracular and appropriate, no doubt, and the newspapers chronicled the event and the world admired. When he came back again after Sedan, there was no account of his driving past the old place if he did so, but the tablet had not been taken down. It is only right to say that much. It was allowed to remain there even though Louis Napoleon had fallen, never to hope again. Perhaps we cannot better illustrate the manner in which the English public received him on his late return. There was no further allusion to the tablet, but it was not taken down. Death was very busy about this time, with men whose names had made deep mark on history or letters. Lord Lytton, 
the brilliant novelist, the successful dramatist, the composer of marvellous parliamentary speeches, died on January 18th, 1873. Dr. Livingston, the famous missionary and explorer, had hardly been discovered among the living by the enterprise and energy of Mr. Stanley when the world learned that he was dead. So many false reports of his death had been sent about at different times that the statement now was received with incredulity. The truth had to be confirmed on testimony beyond dispute before England would accept the fact that the long career of devotion to the one pursuit was over and that Africa had had another victim. John Stuart Mill died on May 8, 1873, at his home at Avignon, where the tomb of his wife was made. There's a great spirit gone, was the word of all men. A loftier and purer soul, more truly devoted to the quest of the truth, had not mingled in the worldly affairs of our time. There were clear evidences in the later writings of Mr. Mill published after his death that he had been turning toward a different point in quest of the truth from that on which early training and long habit had formerly fixed his mind. His influence over the thought and culture of his day was immense. Time has even already begun to show it in some decay. But most of Mr. Mill's writings may safely be regarded as the possession of all the future, and he has left an example of candor and investigation and fearless moral purpose in action such as might well leaven even the most thoughtless and cynical generation. A sudden accident, the stumble of a horse, brought to a close on July 19th the career of the Bishop of Winchester, the many-sided, energetic, eloquent Samuel Wilberforce. He had tried to succeed in everything, and he went near success. He tried to know everybody and understand everybody's way of looking at every question. He was a great pulpit and parliamentary orator, a great bishop, a wit, a scholar, an accomplished man of the world. In a different and more honorable sense than that conveyed in Dryden's famous line, he was everything by starts, but he was a good man and a good minister always. On the very day after the death of the Bishop of Winchester died Lord Westbury, who had been Lord Chancellor, a man of great ability, unsurpassed as a lawyer in his time, endowed with as bitter a tongue and as vitriolic a wit as ever cursed their possessor. Lord Westbury was a failure in spite of all his gifts, partly because of a certain want of moral elevation in his nature. It is only justice to his memory to say that he was in many ways the victim of the errors of some to whom his affections made him too lenient. From one cause and another, the close of his career became but a heap of ruins. The deaths of Sir Edwin Landseer the painter, Sir Henry Holland, the famous physician and traveller, whose patients and personal friends were emperors, kings, presidents, and prime ministers, and of Professor Sedgwick the geologist ought to be mentioned nor must we omit from our death roll the name of dr lushington who in addition to his own personal distinction is likely to be remembered as the depository of a secret confided to him in an earlier generation by lady byron the secret of the charge she had made against her husband the whole story was revived before dr lushington's death by a painful controversy but he refused even by a yes or no, to reveal Lady Byron's confidence. The year which saw so many deaths was a trying time for the Liberal government. The session of that year would in any case have brought them over what may be called the grand climacteric of the Parliament. The novelty of the reforming administration was well-nigh worn off, and there was yet some work which Mr. Gladstone was pledged to do. Here and there, when it happened, that the death or retirement of a member of Parliament gave an opportunity for a new election, it seemed of late to happen that the election went generally against the government. The Conservatives were plucking up a spirit everywhere, and were looking closely after their organization. Mr. Disraeli himself had taken to going round the country, doing what would be called in America stump oratory, and doing it remarkably well. 
in the Crystal Palace of London, in the Free Trade Hall and the Pomona Gardens of Manchester, in the Conservative Association of Glasgow, and in other places, he had addressed great assemblages and denounced and ridiculed the Liberal government. In the Manchester Free Trade Hall he made use of a remarkably happy expression. His rivals had entered into office, he said, with a policy of violence, of sacrilege, and of confiscation, and now having done their work, they sat in a row on the treasury benches, reminding him as he gazed across the table at them of a range of extinct volcanoes. The government had been unlucky in the naval department. Some of their ships had met with fatal accidents, and it was complained that there was defective organization and imperfect inspection. In one of his speeches, Mr. Disraeli had spoken of a new difficulty in Irish politics and a new form of agitation that had arisen in Ireland. The whole rule organization had sprung suddenly into existence. The home rule agitation came, in its first organized form, mainly from the inspiration of Irish Protestants. The disestablishment of the Church had filled most of the Protestants of Ireland with hatred of Mr. Gladstone, and distrust of the imperial parliament and English parties. It was therefore thought by some of them that the time had come when Irishmen of all sects and parties had better trust to themselves and to their united efforts than to any English minister, parliament, or party. Partly in a petulant mood, partly in despondency, partly out of genuine patriotic impulse, some of the Irish Protestants set going the movement for home rule. But although the actual movement came into being in that way, the desire for a native parliament had always lived among large classes of the Irish people. Attempts were always being made to construct something like a regular organization with such an object. The process of pacification was going on but slowly. It could only be slow in any case, the effects of centuries of bad legislation could not by any human possibility be effaced by two or three years of better government. But there were many Irishmen who themselves, patient and moderate, saw with distinctness that the feeling of disaffection or at least of discontent among the Irish people was not to be charmed away even by such measures as the disestablishment of the Irish Church. They saw what English statesmen would not or could not see, that the one strong feeling in the breast of a large proportion of the population of Ireland was dislike to the rule of an English Parliament. The national sentiment, rightly or wrongly, for good or ill, had grown so powerful that it could not be overcome by mere concessions in this or that detail of legislation. These Irishmen of moderate views felt convinced that there were only two alternatives before England. Either she must give back to Ireland some form of national parliament, or she must go on putting down rebellion after rebellion and dealing with Ireland as Russia had dealt with Poland. They therefore welcomed the home rule movement and conscientiously believed that it would open the way to a genuine reconciliation between England and Ireland on conditions of fair copartnership. The author of this history is, for obvious reasons, not inclined to discuss here the merits of the Home Rule demand, but he desires to put it on historical record that those who were chiefly concerned in promoting that movement were filled with the conviction that the principle of Home Rule contained the solution of the great problem of government, which unsolved had so long divided England and Ireland and offered a means of complete reconciliation between the two countries. Several Irish elections took place about the time when the Home Rule movement had been fairly started. They were fought out on the question for or against Home Rule, and the Home Rulers were successful. The leadership of the new party came, almost as a matter of course, into the hands of Mr. Butt, who returned to Parliament after a considerable time of exile from political life. Mr. Butt was a man of great ability, legal knowledge, and historical culture. He had begun life as a conservative and an opponent of O'Connell. 
he had become one of the orators of the short-lived attempt at a protectionist reaction in England. He was taken up by the leading protectionists, who were themselves somewhat deficient in intellect and eloquence, and who could not induce men like Mr. Disraeli to trouble themselves any more about the lost cause. Mr. Butt was a lawyer of great skill and success in his profession. As an advocate, he had for years not a rival at the Irish bar. He had taken part in the defense of Smith O'Brien and Mayer at Clonmel in 1848, and when the Fenian movements broke out, he undertook the defense of many Fenian prisoners. He became gradually drawn away from conservatism and brought round to nationalism. For some reason or other, the conservative chiefs had neglected him. There is extant a letter from a once conspicuous and clever unofficial conservative, in which, among other pieces of advice, to a leader of the party he recommends him to buy but. The frank cynicism of the advice was a proof that the writer did not understand Mr. Butt. It is certain that Mr. Butt was not a prudent man, and that he did not manage his private affairs well. There can be no doubt that he often fell into embarrassments which might have made observers think he would have welcomed any means of extrication. But it is certain that he was politically honest, even to chivalrous forgetfulness of his own most legitimate interests. Perhaps the neglect of the conservative chiefs came from their observation of the fact that Mr. Butt was gradually passing over from their side. Perhaps it was due to other and personal causes. Mr. Butt dropped entirely out of public life for a while, and when he reappeared, it was as the leader of the new Home Rule movement. There was not then in Irish politics any man who could pretend to be his rival. He was a speaker at once powerful and plausible. He had a thorough knowledge of the constitutional history and the technical procedures of Parliament, and he could talk to an Irish monster meeting with vivacity and energy. Almost in a moment a regular home rule party was set up in the House of Commons. Popular Irish members who had been elected previous to the organization of the movement gave in their adhesion to it, and there was in fact a sudden revival of the constitutional movement for the satisfaction of Irish national claims, which had fallen asleep after the death of O'Connell and the failure of the Young Ireland Rebellion of 1848. The Home Rule movement unquestionably put Mr. Gladstone in a new difficulty. The press and the public men of England failed altogether at first to appreciate the strength of the demand for Home Rule. Many voices cried out that no English statesman must listen to it, not to say condescend to argue with it. It was to be simply brushed away as a nuisance, bidden like a fretful child to hold its tongue and go to sleep. Mr. Gladstone was not a man to deal with political questions in that sort of way. He showed an anxiety to understand the new agitation and its objects. He asked questions of one or two prominent Irishmen. He even answered questions civilly addressed to him. He showed a willingness at least to receive information with regard to home rule. In the eyes of some jealous patriots in England, such conduct was in itself a tampering with the question, an encouragement of the agitation, and a conniving at the designs of wicked men who were anxious to dismember the empire. It was now certain that when Parliament met, an organized Home Rule Party would be found there, and a good many strong conservatives and weak liberals were inclined to hold Mr. Gladstone's Irish policy responsible for the uprise of this new agitation. There seemed to be an idea that if Irishmen got any measure of justice accorded to them, they ought not to seek for anything more, and that if they were so perverse and ungrateful as to ask for more, a large part of the guilt of their ingratitude must be put to the account of the minister who had been wrong-headed enough to give them any justice at all. The prospects were on the whole growing somewhat ominous for the liberal government, not only the Conservative Party were plucking up a spirit, but the House of Lords had more than once made it clear that they felt themselves emboldened to deal as they thought fit with measures sent up to them from the House of Commons. When the peers begin to be firm and assert their dignity, it may always be taken for granted that there is not much popular force at the back of the government. 
Parliament met on February 6th, 1873. The royal speech announced that a measure will be submitted to you on an early day for settling the question of university education in Ireland. It will have for its object the advancement of learning in that portion of my dominions, and will be framed with a careful regard to the rights of conscience. On February 13th, Mr. Gladstone introduced his measure. It is a remarkable illustration of the legislative energy with which the government were even yet filled, that on the very same night, at the very same hour, two great schemes of reform, reform which to slow and timid minds must have seemed something like revolution, were introduced into Parliament. One was the Irish University Education Bill, which Mr. Gladstone was explaining in the House of Commons. The other was a measure to abolish the appellate jurisdiction of the House of Lords and establish a judicial court of appeal in its stead. This latter measure was introduced by Lord Selborne, lately Sir Roundell Palmer, who had been raised to the office of Lord Chancellor, on the resignation of Lord Hatherley, whose eyesight was temporarily affected. Great as the change was which Lord Selborne proposed to introduce, public attention paid comparatively little heed to it at that moment. Everyone watched with eager interest the development of Mr. Gladstone's most critical scheme for the improvement of university education in Ireland. Irish university education was indeed in a very anomalous condition. Ireland had two universities, that of Dublin, which was then a distinctly Protestant institution, and the Queen's University, which was established on a strictly secular system, and which the heads of the Catholic Church had on that account condemned. In a country with a population of whom five-sixths were Catholics, there was one chartered university which would not accept the Catholic as such, and another which the Catholic as such would not accept. This is a rough but accurate description of the condition of things. The remedy, one might have thought, would have been obvious in an ordinary case. The Catholic themselves asked for a chartered Catholic university. The answer made by most Englishmen was that to grant a charter to a Catholic university would be to run the risk of lowering the national standard of education, and that to grant any state aid to a Catholic university would be to endow a sectarian institution out of public funds. The Catholic made rejoinder that a mere speculative dread of lowering the common standard of university education was hardly a reason why five-sixths of the population of Ireland should have no university education of that kind at all, that the University of Dublin was in essence a state-endowed institution, and that the Queen's University was founded by state money on a principle which excluded the vast majority of Catholics from its advantages. End of section 36. Section 37 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 62, The Fall of the Great Administration, Part 2. Mr. Gladstone's measure was a gallant and well-meant effort to reconcile the conflicting claims. He proposed to make the University of Dublin the one central university of the country, and to make it a teaching as well as an examining body. Trinity College, the colleges of Cork and Belfast, the existing Catholic university, a body supported wholly by private funds and which had no charter, were at once to become members of the new university. The College of Galway was to cease to exist. The theological faculty was to be taken away from Trinity College, Dublin, and handed over to the representative body of the Irish disestablished church. The new university was to have no chairs for theology, moral philosophy, or modern history. The governing body of the university was to be composed in the first instance of 28 ordinary members to be nominated in the act. Vacancies were to be filled by the crown and by co-optation alternately for 10 years. After that time, Four members were to retire annually, one successor to be named by the Crown, 
one by the council, one by the professors, and one by the senate. In addition to the ordinary members, the affiliated colleges would be allowed to elect one or two members of council according to the number of pupils in each college. The money to sustain the university was to come in proportionate allotments from the revenues of Trinity College, a very wealthy institution, from the consolidated fund, the fees of students, and the surplus of Irish ecclesiastical property. Trinity College and each of the other affiliated colleges would be allowed to frame schemes for their own government. Thus, therefore, Mr. Gladstone proposed to establish in Ireland one central university to which existing colleges and colleges to exist hereafter might affiliate themselves, and in the governing of which they would have a share, while each college would make what laws it pleased for its own constitution and might be denominational or undenominational as it thought fit. The legislature would give an open career and fair play to all alike, and in order to make the university equally applicable to every sect, it would not teach disputed branches of knowledge, or allow its examinations for prizes to include any of the disputed questions. The colleges could act for themselves with regard to the teaching of theology, moral philosophy, and modern history, the central university would maintain a neutral ground so far as these subjects were concerned and would have nothing to do with them this scheme looked plausible and even satisfactory for a moment it was met that first night with something like a chorus of approval from those who spoke but there was an ominous silence in many parts of the house and after a while the ominous silence began to be very alarmingly broken the more the scheme was examined the less it seemed to find favor on either side of the house. It was remarked that on the morning after the introduction of the measure, the Daily News, a journal which might have been expected to deal favorably with any proposal made by the government, came out with a criticism which, although courteous and cautious, was decidedly damaging. The defects of the scheme soon became evident. The one great defect was that it satisfied nobody. It proposed to break up and fuse together three or four existing systems, and apparently without the least prospect of satisfying any of the various sects and parties to compose whose strife this great revolution was to be attempted. The English nonconformists were indignant at the proposal to endow denominational education. The Irish Protestants complained bitterly of the breaking up of the old university system in Dublin. The Catholics declared that the measure did not in any way meet their claims for a Catholic university. The authorities of the Catholic Church in Ireland pronounced decisively against the measure. The men who proclaimed themselves devoted to culture sneered at the notion of a national university which professed to have nothing to do with moral philosophy or modern history. It may be remarked that Mr. Mill had already suggested that history is one of the branches of human knowledge which had best to be left to private cultivation. It would certainly be difficult to get a theory of modern history in an Irish national university which would be acceptable to all the sects and parties in the country. It is idle to plead that history is the study of facts. In no chapter of history, even the simplest, are the facts so clearly defined as to show the same to all eyes. Two eminent men had just been making a study of the same events in English and Irish history. One particular set of state papers was the subject of each man's examination. On the study of the same set of papers, the two men came to diametrically opposite conclusions, not merely as to inference, but as to fact. Again, how would it be possible to teach that chapter of history which describes the political career of O'Connell in such a way as to be acceptable to the Ulster Orangeman and the Munster Catholic? Let us fancy the University of London having a chair for the teaching of modern history and offering prizes for proficiency in an elucidation of the political careers of Mr. Gladstone and Lord Beaconsfield. Yet it does seem as if the difficulty in the way of teaching history from the chair of an Irish national university ought to have been a reason for not attempting under such conditions 
to set up a central and sole institution of that kind. Was it in fact possible that there could be one Irish national university available for all sects and parties? To us it seems that this was not possible, except at such sacrifices of the educational character of the university as to make it of little worth as a permanent institution. There was great justice in the complaint that soon began to be heard from both sides of the House of Commons. You are spoiling several institutions, and you are not satisfying the requirements of anybody whatever. The agitation against the bill grew and grew. The late Professor Cairns, then in fast-failing health, inspired and guided much of that part of the opposition which condemned the measure because of the depreciating effect it would have on the character of the higher education of Ireland. The English nonconformists were all against it, the conservatives were against it, and it soon became evident that the Irish members of Parliament would vote as a body against it for the second reading. The crisis came on an amendment to the motion. The amendment was moved on March 3rd by Mr. Burke, brother of the late Lord Mayo. The debate, which lasted four nights, was brilliant and impassioned. Mr. Disraeli was exulting, and his exultation lent even more than usual spirit to his glittering eloquence. He taunted Mr. Gladstone with having mistaken the clamor of the nonconformists for the voice of the nation. You have now had four years of it, he said. You have despoiled churches. You have threatened every corporation and every endowment in the country. You have examined into everybody's affairs. You have criticized every profession and vexed every trade. No one is certain of his property, and nobody knows what duties he may have to perform tomorrow. I believe that the people of this country have had enough of the policy of confiscation. There was, of course, extravagance in these charges, but their very extravagance suited the temper of the House, and Mr. Disraeli understood his audience and its mood. When Mr. Gladstone rose to speak at the close of the fourth night's debate, it soon became evident that he no longer counted on victory. How indeed could he? He was opposed and assailed from all sides. He knew that the Senate of the University of Dublin had condemned his measure as well as the Roman Catholic prelates. He had received a deputation of Irish members to announce to him frankly that they could not support him. His speech was in remarkable contrast to the jubilant tones of Mr. Disraeli's defiant and triumphant rhetoric. It was full of dignity and resolve. But it was the dignity of anticipated defeat, met without shrinking and without bravado. A few sentences in which Mr. Gladstone spoke of his severance from the Irish representatives with whom he had worked cordially and successfully on the church and land bills were full of a genuine and noble pathos. He touched the heart of many an Irish member who felt all that Ireland owed to the great statesman but who yet felt conscientiously unable to say that the measure now proposed was equal to the demand of the Irish Catholics. Mr. Gladstone was the first English Prime Minister who had ever really periled office and popularity to serve the interests of Ireland. It seemed a cruel stroke of fate which made his fall from power mainly the result of the Irish vote in the House of Commons. Such was, however, the fact the second reading of the bill would have been carried by a large majority if the Irish members, who were unable to give it their support, could even have conscientiously refrained from voting against it. The result of the division was weighted with breathless anxiety. It was what had been expected. The ministry had been defeated by a small majority. 287 voted against the second reading, 284 voted for it. By a majority of three, the great liberal administration was practically overthrown. The great minister had failed. Like the hero of Schiller's ballad, the brave swimmer had plunged once too often into the flood to bring out a prize, and he perished. The ministry did not indeed come to an end just then. Mr. Gladstone and his colleagues resigned office, and the Queen sent for Mr. Disraeli. But Mr. Disraeli prudently declined to accept office with the existing House of Commons. 
he had been carefully studying the evidences of conservative reaction, and he felt that the time for his party was coming. He had had bitter experience of the humiliation of a minister who tries to govern without a majority in the House of Commons. He afterwards drew an amusing picture of his experiences in that way. He declined to accept office with the existing Parliament. Why not, then, it was asked, dissolve Parliament? To that Mr. Disraeli answered, not unreasonably, that it was easy for statesmen in office to dissolve Parliament, but that it would be a very different thing for a man to have to form an administration and then immediately dissolve. He could, of course, form a government, he said, and dissolve in May, but then he had nothing in particular to dissolve about. The functions of an opposition were critical. He could not pretend to have a regular policy cut and dry on which the country might be asked to pronounce an opinion at a general election. The Irish University Bill was hardly a question on which to go to the country, and besides, it was not a question on which Mr. Disraeli could be expected to appeal to the constituencies, seeing that the House of Commons had decided it in a way of which he approved. The situation was curious. There were two great statesmen disputing, not for office, but how to get out of the responsibility of office. The result was that Mr. Gladstone and his colleagues had to return to their places and go on as best they could, there was nothing else to be done. Mr. Disraeli would not accept responsibility just then, and with regard to the interests of his party, he was acting like a prudent man. Mr. Gladstone returned to office. He returned reluctantly. He was weary of the work. He was disappointed. He had suffered in health from the incessant administrative labor to which he had always subjected himself with an unsparing an almost improvident magnanimity. He must have known that coming back to office under such conditions, he would find his power shaken, his influence much discredited. He bent to the necessities of the time and consented to be prime minister still. He helped Mr. Fawcett to carry a bill for the abolition of tests in Dublin University, as he could do no more just then for university education in Ireland the end was near. During the autumn, some elections happening incidentally turned out against the Liberal Party. The Conservatives were beginning to be openly triumphant in most places. Mr. Gladstone had made some modifications in his ministry. Mr. Lowe gave up the Chancellorship of the Exchequer, in which he had been singularly unsuccessful. Mr. Bruce left the Home Office, in which he had not been much of a success. Mr. Gladstone took upon himself the offices of First Lord of the Treasury and Chancellor of the Exchequer together, following an example set in former days by Peel and other statesmen. Mr. Lowe became Home Secretary. Mr. Bruce was raised to the peerage as Lord Aberdare and was made President of the Council in the room of the Marquis of Ripon, who had resigned. Mr. Childers resigned the office of Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Mr. Bright, whose health had now been restored, came back to the cabinet in charge of the merely nominal business of the duchy. There could be no doubt that there were dissensions in the ministry. Mr. Baxter had resigned the office of Secretary of the Treasury on the ground that he could not get on with Mr. Lowe, who had not consulted him with regard to certain contracts and had refused to take his advice. The general impression was that Mr. Childers gave up the Chancellorship of the Duchy because he considered that he had claims on the office of Chancellor of the Exchequer, which Mr. Gladstone now had taken to himself. These various changes and the rumors to which they gave birth were not calculated to strengthen the public confidence. In truth, the liberal regime was falling to pieces. Lord Salisbury, speaking at a Conservative banquet, expressed his conviction that the Conservatives would at last be able to draw the teeth and clip the claws of the Liberal administration, and exalted over the security obtained against revolutionary innovation by the fact that the country was likely to be governed for some time by a toothless Liberal ministry. Ne quisquam ayacet posset superare, nisi ayax, 
it was Mr. Gladstone himself who dealt the stroke which brought the Liberal administration to an end. In the closing days of 1873, the Conservatives won a seat at Exeter. In the first few days of 1874, they won a seat at Stroud. Parliament had actually been summoned for February 5th. On the night of January 23rd, an astonishing rumor began to fly through various limited circles of London politicians. Men were mysteriously beckoned away from dinner tables and drawing rooms and club rooms. Agitated messengers hurried to ministerial doors seeking for information. There was commotion in the newspaper offices. The telegraph was set in constant action. Next morning, all the world read the news in the papers. Mr. Gladstone had suddenly made up his mind to dissolve Parliament and to seek for a restoration of the authority of the Liberal government by an appeal to the people. He vindicated his decision in an address to his constituents which was unfortunately all too long for genuine popular effect. What the country understood by it was this, that Mr. Gladstone did not choose to bear the humiliation of seeming to have the authority he had received in 1868, now sunk below the point necessary for the due defense and prosecution of the public interests, that he proposed to obtain a new lease of authority by a popular verdict, and that if restored to power, he would introduce a series of financial measures which would include the total repeal of the income tax. The country was taken utterly by surprise. Many of Mr. Gladstone's own colleagues had not known what was to be done until the announcement was actually made. The feeling all over the three kingdoms was one of almost unanimous disapproval. Mr. Gladstone's sudden resolve was openly condemned as petulant and unstatesmanlike. It was privately grumbled at on various personal grounds. To us it seems to have been impatient, imprudent, irregular, but certainly spirited and magnanimous. Impolitic it no doubt was, but it ought not to have been unpopular. It must have caused great and at that time superfluous inconvenience to liberal politicians everywhere, and we cannot wonder if they complained. But to the country in general, there ought to have been something fascinating in the very quixotry of a resolve which proclaimed that the minister disdained to remain in office one hour after he had found reason to believe that he no longer possessed the confidence of the people. It was an error indeed but it was at least a generous error, the mistake of a sensitive and a chivalrous nature. Mr. Gladstone had surprised the constituencies. We do not know whether the constituencies surprised Mr. Gladstone. They certainly surprised most persons, including themselves. The result of the elections was to upset completely the balance of power. In a few days, the liberal majority was gone. Mr. Gladstone fought a gallant fight himself and addressed vast open-air meetings at Blackheath with the energy of another O'Connell. But it was a hopeless fight against reaction. When the result of the polls came to be made up, it was found that the Conservatives had a majority of about 50, even on the calculation far too favorable to the other side, which counted every home ruler as a liberal. Mr. Gladstone followed the example set by Mr. Disraeli six years before and at once resigned office. The great reforming liberal administration was gone. The organizing energy which had accomplished such marvels during three or four resplendent years had spent itself and was out of breath. Many causes indeed concurred to bring about the fall of the liberal administration. It had committed grave faults itself. Some of its members had done it serious harm. Various powerful interests were arrayed against it. But when all allowance has been made for such considerations, it will probably be seen that the most potent influence which bore down the Gladstone government was in fact that people in general had grown tired of doing great things and had got into the mood of the lady described in one of Mr. Charles Reed's novels, who frankly declares that heroes are her abomination. The English constituencies had grown weary of the heroic and would have a change. 
Had the liberal ministers consented to remain in power a few days, a very few longer, they would have been able to announce the satisfactory conclusion of a very unsatisfactory war. This was one of the least of all our little wars, a war from which it was simply impossible to extract anything in the way of glory, and in which the only honor could be just that which the skill of the English commander was able to secure. The honor of success, won in the promptest manner and with the least possible expenditure of life. The Ashanti War arose out of a sort of misunderstanding. The Ashantis are a very fierce and warlike tribe on the Gold Coast of Africa, they were at war with England in 1824, and in one instance they won an extraordinary victory over a British force of about a thousand men, and carried home with them as a trophy the skull of the British commander-in-chief, Sir Charles McCarthy. The Ashantis were afterwards defeated, and a treaty of peace was concluded with them by the governor of our Gold Coast settlements, Mr. McLean, the husband of Miss Landon, better known to literature by her initials L.E.L., a woman whose poetical gifts, not in themselves very great, combined with her unhappy story to make her at one time a celebrity in England. In 1863, as has been already told in these pages, a war was begun against the Ashantis prematurely and rashly by the governor of the Gold Coast settlements, and it had to be abandoned owing to the ravages done by sickness among our men. In 1872, some Dutch possessions on the Gold Coast were transferred by purchase and arrangement of other kinds to England, and this transaction ended, like most of the same nature, by entangling us in misunderstanding, quarrel, and war. The king of the Ashanti claimed a tribute formerly allowed to him by the Dutch and refused to evacuate the territory ceded to England. He attacked the Fontes, a tribe of very worthless allies of ours, and a straggling, harassing war began between him and our garrisons. The great danger was that if the Ashantis obtained any considerable success or seeming success, even for a moment, all the surrounding tribes would make common cause with them. The government therefore determined to take up the matter seriously and send a sufficient force under an experienced and well-qualified commander with instructions to take advantage of the cool season and penetrate to the Ashanti capital, Kumasi, and there inflict a blow that would prove that the Ashanti king could not harass the English settlers with impunity. When the choice of a commander came to be discussed, only one name, as it would seem, arose to the lips of all men. That was the name of Sir Garnet Wolseley, who had commanded the successful expedition to the Red River region in 1870. Sir Garnet Wolseley had the rare good fortune to sustain the reputation conferred upon him in advance by popular acclaim. He had a very hard task to perform. Of course he could have no difficulty in fighting the Ashantis. The weapons and the discipline of the English army put all thought of serious battle out of the question. But the king of the Ashanti had a force fighting on his side far more formidable than the general January and general February on which the Emperor Nicholas of Russia vainly relied. Wordsworth, in his noble ode to Toussaint Louverture, tells the fallen chief to be of good heart, for he has on his side powers that will work for him, great allies, and these are, he says, earth, air, and skies, not a breathing of the common wind, he declares, that will forget to support his cause. In a literal and terrible sense, the king of Ashanti had just such allies, earth, air, and skies. The earth, the air, the skies of the Gold Coast region would at the right time work for him, not a breathing of the common wind that would forget to breathe pestilence into the ranks of his enemies. The whole campaign must be over and done with within the limited range of the cooler months, or there would come into the field to do battle for the African king, allies against whom an Alexander or a Caesar would be powerless. Sir Garnet Wolsey and those who fought under him, sailors, marines, and soldiers, did their work well. They defeated the Ashantis wherever they could get at them, but that was a matter of course. They forced their way to Kumasi, compelled the king to come to terms, one of the conditions being the prohibition of human sacrifices, and they were able to leave the country within the appointed time. 
The success of the campaign was a question of days, almost of hours, and the victory was snatched out of the very jaws of approaching sun and fever. Sir Garnet Wolseley sailed from England on September 12, 1873, and returned to Portsmouth having accomplished all his objects on March 21, 1874. The war was not one to be proud of. It might easily have been avoided. It is certain that England was entirely in the right of the quarrel, first or last, but nothing could be more satisfactory than the ease, success, and completeness with which the campaign had been pushed through to its end. The Gladstone government had also had to deal with one of the periodical famines breaking out in Bengal, and if they had remained in office might have been able within a very short time to report that their efforts had been successful. Mr. Gladstone's sudden action, however, deprived them of any such opportunity. They bequeathed to their successors the announcement of a war triumphantly concluded and a famine checked, and they bequeathed to them also a very handsome financial surplus. So sudden a fall from power had not up to that time been known in the modern political history of the country. To find its parallel we shall have to come down six years later still. The great liberal administration had fallen as suddenly as the French Empire, had disappeared like Aladdin's palace, which was erect and ablaze with light and splendor last night, and is not to be seen this morning. End of section 37section thirty eight of a history of our own times volume four by justin mccarthy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter sixty three conservative reaction installed in office part one mr disraeli was not long in forming a ministry he reduced the number of the cabinet in the first instance to twelve Lord Cairns became Lord Chancellor, Lord Derby was made Foreign Secretary, an appointment which gratified sober-minded men, Lord Salisbury was entrusted with the charge of the Indian Department. This, too, was an appointment which gave satisfaction outside the range of the Conservative Party as well as within it. During his former administration of the India office, Lord Salisbury had shown great ability and self-command, and he had acquired a reputation for firmness of character and large and liberal views. He was now, and for some time after, looked upon as the most rising man and the most high-minded politician on the conservative side. The country was pleased to see that Mr. Disraeli made no account of the differences that formerly existed between Lord Salisbury and himself, of the dislike that Lord Salisbury had evidently felt toward him at one time, and of the manner in which he had broken away from the Conservative Ministry at the time of the Reform Bill of 1867. Lord Carnarvon became Colonial Secretary, Mr. Cross, a Lancashire lawyer, who had never been in office of any kind before, was lifted into the position of Home Secretary. Mr. Gathorne Hardy was made Secretary for War, and Mr. Ward Hunt, First Lord of the Admiralty. Sir Stafford Northcote, who had been trained in finance by Mr. Gladstone, accepted the office of Chancellor of the Exchequer. The Duke of Richmond, as Lord President of the Council, made a safe, inoffensive, and respectable leader of the government in the House of Lords. The Liberals seemed to have received a stunning blow. The whole party reeled under it, and did not appear capable for the moment of rallying against the shock. Nothing could be more disheartening than the appearance of the front opposition benches during the great part of the session. To accumulate the difficulties, Mr. Gladstone suddenly announced his intention of retiring from the position of leader of the Liberal Party. In a letter to Lord Granville, dated March 12, 1874, he explained that for a variety of reasons personal to myself, he could not contemplate any unlimited extension of active political service, and that it might be necessary to divest myself of all the responsibilities of leadership at no distant time. For the present, he held the rank of leader only in a sort of conditional way, and he had frankly announced to Lord Granville 
that he could not give more than an occasional attendance in the House of Commons during that session. This seemed the one step needed to complete the disorganization of the party. There were many complaints, not loud but deep, of the course taken by Mr. Gladstone. It was contrasted openly as well as secretly with the perseverance, the unwearying patience, which Mr. Disraeli had shown in keeping his place at the head of his party during long years of what must have seemed hopeless struggle. Mr. Gladstone pleaded his advancing years, but it was asked, are not the years of Mr. Disraeli still further advanced? Who brought us, some discontented liberals asked, into this difficulty? Who but the man who now deserts us in the face of the enemy? The opposition were for a while apparently not only without a leader, but even without a policy or a motive for existence. For a while it seemed as if to adopt the correct and concise description given by Mr. Claydon in his England under Lord Beaconsfield, the opposition had nothing to oppose. The ministry had succeeded to a handsome surplus of near six millions. It would be hardly possible under such circumstances to bring in a budget which should be wholly unsatisfactory. Mr. Ward Hunt contrived indeed to get up a momentary scare about the condition of the Navy. When introducing the Navy estimates, he talked in tones of ominous warning about his determination not to have a fleet on paper or to put up with phantom ships. The words sent a wild thrill of alarm through the country. The sudden impression prevailed that Mr. Hunt had made a fearful discovery, had found out that the country had really no navy, that he would be compelled to set about constructing one out of hand. The whole of the surplus, at least people said, would have to be given up to make a beginning, nor did men forget to point to the cheerful possibility of some foreign enemy taking advantage of the opportunity to assail England's unprotected coasts. Mr. Ward Hunt, however, when pressed for an explanation, explained that he really meant nothing. It appeared that he had only been expressing his disapproval on abstract grounds of the maintenance of inefficient navies, and never meant to convey the idea that England's navy was not efficient. The country breathed again. The surplus seemed safe, and the coasts. The idea of Germany or Russia coming down upon defenseless England like Achilles on the unarmed Hector in Troilus and Cressida passed away. Two new measures belonging to the same order disturbed for a while what Sir Wilfrid Lawson jocularly called the almost holy calm which prevailed in Parliament now that the Conservatives had it all their own way and the Liberals were crushed. One was the bill for the abolition of church patronage in Scotland, the other the public worship bill for England. The church patronage bill which was introduced by the government is well described by Mr. Clayton as a liberal measure which had become a reactionary scheme by being brought into the world a generation behind its time. It took away the appointment of ministers in the Church of Scotland from lay patrons, but only to give it to the male communicants of the parish kirk, not to the whole body of the parishioners. The patronage system was the cause of that great secession from the Church of Scotland under Dr. Chalmers, which has been described in an early chapter of this history. Such a measure as that now introduced by the government, or at least a measure having such a general purpose, would have prevented the secession in 1843 but it was useless for any purpose of reconciliation in 1874. Moreover, the measure of 1874, by confining the power of appointment to the actual communicants of each church, took away the national character of the Church of Scotland and converted it into a sectarian organization. In a historical sense, the passing of the measure can have little importance unless, as it may have given an impulse to the question of disestablishment in Scotland. Its introduction became of some present interest to the House of Commons, because it drew Mr. Gladstone into debate for the first time since the opening nights of the session. He opposed the bill, but of course in vain. 
Mr. Disraeli complimented him on his reappearance and kindly expressed a hope that he would favor the House with his presence as often as possible. Indeed, was quite friendly and patronizing to his fallen rival. The bill for the regulation of public worship was not a government measure. It was introduced into the House of Lords by the Archbishop of Canterbury and into the House of Commons by Mr. Russell Gurney. It was strongly disliked and publicly condemned by some members of the Cabinet, but after it had gone its way fairly towards success, Mr. Disraeli showed a disposition to adopt it, and even to speak as if he had had the responsibility of it from the first. Once or twice it would almost seem as if he had forgotten that it was not a measure of his own proposing. The bill illustrated a curious difficulty into which the Church of England had been brought in consequence partly of its connection with the state. We have already traced in these volumes the history of the Oxford movement, which was intended to quicken the state church with new life and freshness, and which before long sent some of the greatest divines of the church into the ranks of the Church of Rome. The influence of the movement made itself felt in other ways as well. It set thoughts stirring everywhere within the church. It appealed to much that was philosophical, much that was artistic and aesthetic, and at the same time to much that was skeptical. One body of churchmen were anxious to maintain the unity of the Christian church, and would not admit that the Church of England began to exist with the Reformation. They claimed apostolical succession for their bishops. They declared that the clergymen of the Church of England were priests in the true spiritual sense. Thus the Tractarians, as they were called for a time, were thrown into direct antagonism with the Evangelicals. The latter maintained that the Bible was the sole authority, the former held that the New Testament derived its authority from the Church. The Tractarians therefore claimed a right to examine very freely into the meaning of doubtful passages in the Scriptures, and insisted that if the authority of the Church were recognized as that of the heaven-appointed interpreter, all difficulty about the reconciliation of the Scriptural writings with the discoveries of modern science would necessarily disappear. The Tractarian Party we call them by that name now merely as a means of distinguishing them from their opponents, and not with the intention of suggesting that it properly describes them or applies at all to some of them, became divided into two sections. One section inclined toward what may almost be called free thought, the other to the sentiments and the ceremonies of the Roman Catholic Church. The state was frequently called upon to interfere. Here the world saw the prosecution of some clergyman for having published an essay supposed to teach infidel doctrine. There the ecclesiastical courts were engaged in trying to find out whether the church law had been broken by ritualistic practices in some Protestant temple. The taste for beauty and decoration which was growing up in English society everywhere had already made its influence felt in the English church. Clergymen and congregations loved to have their churches adorned like those of the Catholics. They delighted in the sweet and noble music, the incense, the painted windows, the devotional effigies and symbols, the impressive and gorgeous ritual. The astonished evangelists saw with dismay that the church as they knew it seemed likely to be torn asunder. On the one side was the philosophical clergyman writing his essay to show that a literal interpretation of certain parts of the Bible was absurd. On the other, there was the high church priest setting up his altar, swinging his censer, making his genuflections, and even establishing his confessional. The evangelicals had their strongest supporters among the middle and lower middle classes. The others found favor at once among the rich, who went in for culture, and among the very poor. The law which was often invoked proved impotent to deal with the difficulty. It could not punish the clergyman who contributed to the volume called Essays and Reviews. It could not prevent the author of the first essay in that volume from being made a bishop. It could not remove Dr. Colenso from his colonial bishopric. One clergyman was in 1871 deprived for heresy. 
he forthwith started a religion of his own, or at least found a place of worship after his own way of thinking and worshippers to fill it. But it would seem as if he might as well have been allowed to remain in the ranks of the clergy of the church as many others whom the law failed to reach, or might as well have refused to go out, as others have done. It was found impossible to put down ritualism by law. In some places the ritualistic practices led to grave scandal and serious riots. It happened occasionally that, although the clergymen and the congregation liked the elaborate and ornate worship, their neighbors all around disapproved of it. In some instances the neighbors got into the way of crowding into the church and endeavoring to put down ritualism by noise and even by violence. All this was becoming scandalous to the eyes of sober people. Many who were otherwise little disposed to approve of the dictatorship of the state in matters of religion, and who did not see how any decision of a court could prove a religious dogma to be right or wrong, were nevertheless inclined to demand that so long as the Church of England was a state institution, the authority of the state should be upheld. They took very clear and simple ground. They said, the state upholds the English church on certain conditions and to preach certain doctrines. No man is compelled to preach the doctrines if he does not feel equal in conscience to the task. But if he cannot teach them, he can go out of the state church. We do not take it on us to condemn his opinions. We do not want the law to punish him for holding them. But we say, the state employs him to teach one thing, and he is teaching another. We employ a man to teach German, and we find he is teaching French. We do not say that he is a wicked person because he teaches French. We only say that we want to have German taught, and that if he cannot do so, he must give his place to someone who can. On the other hand, the ritualists say, You tell us that we are bound by the state-made law. We say we are only bound by the doctrines of the church. But if we are to be bound by the law, show us first that we have broken the law. Appeal to your courts of law. Do your best. We say the decision has not yet gone against us. It was not easy to answer this practical argument. The law was not by any means so clear as some of the opponents of ritualism would have wished it. Moreover, even in cases where a distinct condemnation was obtained from a court of law, there was often no way of putting it into execution. A ritualistic clergyman was ordered to be suspended from his ministrations. He went on with his duties at his church just the same as ever. His congregation supported him, and the practices for which he had been condemned were carried on every Sunday without the slightest modification or interruption. In more than one case, a clergyman was actually deposed by authority and his successor appointed. The congregation held fast by the delinquent and would not admit the new man. The offender remained at his post just as if nothing had happened. It was clear that if all this went on much longer, the establishment must come to an end. One party would renounce state control in order to get freedom, another would repudiate state control because it proved unable to maintain authority. The state of things might be likened to that which prevailed in America for some years before the Civil War. There were two irreconcilable parties. If one did not soon secede, the other must. To remedy all this disorder, the Archbishop of Canterbury brought in his bill for the better regulation of public worship. The object of the bill was to give offended parishioners a ready way of invoking the authority of the bishop and to enable the bishop to prohibit by his own mandate any practices which he considered improper, or else to submit the question to the decision of a judge specially appointed to decide in such cases. The discussions were chiefly remarkable for the divisions of opinion that showed on both sides of the House. Lord Salisbury opposed the bill in the House of Lords. Mr. Hardy condemned it in the House of Commons. It was condemned as too weak. It was denounced as too strong. Mr. Gladstone came forward with all the energy of his best days to oppose it on the ground that it threatened to deprive the Church of all her spiritual freedom, merely to get a more easy way of dealing with the practices of a few eccentric men. 
Sir William Harcourt, who had been Solicitor General under Mr. Gladstone, rushed to the defence of the bill, attacked Mr. Gladstone vehemently, called upon Mr. Disraeli to prove himself the leader of the English people, and in impassioned sentences reminded him that he had put his hand to the plough and must not draw back. Mr. Gladstone dealt with his late subordinate in a few sentences of good-humoured contempt, in which he expressed his special surprise at the sudden and portentous display of erudition which Sir William Harcourt had poured out upon the house. Sir William Harcourt was even then a distinctly rising man. He was an effective and somewhat overbearing speaker, with a special aptitude for the kind of elementary argument and the knock-down personalities which the House of Commons can never fail to understand. The House liked to listen to him. He had a loud voice, and never gave his hearers the trouble of having to strain their ears or their attention to follow him. His arguments were never subtle enough to puzzle the simplest country gentleman for one moment. His quotations had no distracting novelty about them, but fell on the ear with a familiar and friendly sound. His jokes were unmistakable in their meaning. His whole style was good, strong, black and white. He could get up a case admirably. He astonished the House, and must probably even have astonished himself by the vast amount of ecclesiastical knowledge which, with only the preparation of a day or two, he was able to bring to bear upon the most abstruse or perplexed questions of church government. He had the advantage of being sure of everything. He poured out his eloquence and his learning on the most difficult ecclesiastical questions with the resolute assurance of one who had given a life to the study. Perhaps we ought rather to say that he showed the resolute assurance which only belongs to one who has not given much of his life to the study of the subject. Probably when Sir William Harcourt had forgotten all that he had read up a little time before concerning church history, and turned back to his remarkable speeches on the public worship bill, he was as much amazed as Arthur Pendennis, looking over one of his old reviews, and wondering where on earth he contrived to get the erudition of which he had made such a display. Mr. Disraeli responded so far to Sir William Harcourt's stirring appeal as to make himself the patron of the bill and the leader of the movement in its favour. Mr. Disraeli saw that by far the greater body of English public opinion out of doors was against the ritualists, and that for the moment public opinion accepted the whole controversy as a dispute for or against ritualism. The course taken by the Prime Minister further enlivened the debates, by bringing about a keen little passage of arms between him and Lord Salisbury, whom Mr. Disraeli described as a great master of jibes and flouts and jeers. All this was as good as a play to the unconcerned public. Nothing could be more lively and entertaining. People in general soon forgot all about the bill itself, and even about the ritualists, in the interest which was awakened by the splitting up of political parties the attacks of friend on friend, and the cheerful sallies of cabinet minister against cabinet minister. Mr. Gladstone brought forward a series of resolutions in the form of amendments defining his objections to the measure, but he forbore to press them to a division. The bill was passed in both houses of Parliament, and obtained the royal assent almost at the end of the session. Nothing in particular has come of it thus far, except lawsuits which it seems impossible to bring to any practical conclusion. The new judge and the strengthening authority have tried their hands more than once against refractory clergymen, and with no better effect than to prove that the refractory clergyman may still bid defiance to his superiors and the law. Ritualism was not put down. Doubtless it appealed to certain instincts in many hearts, which the colder and less ornate ceremonial of the ordinary Church of England service failed to satisfy. The interference of the law seemed to have the effect common in such cases. It made the followers of some ritualistic clergymen regard their leader not merely as an apostle but as a martyr. In some instances it exalted commonplace men into the worship of congregations and the idol of emotional women. In some instances it put good and pious men at the mercy of fussy and ignorant alarmists. On the whole, 
it promoted rather than suppressed ritualism. End of section 38. Section 39 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 63 Conservative Reaction Installed in Office, Part 2. One useful piece of legislation, or perhaps we ought rather to say, the first step in a new course of useful legislation was forced upon the government by Mr. Plimsoll. This was a measure for the protection of seamen against the danger of being sent to sea in vessels unfit for the voyage. Mr. Plimsoll was a man who had pushed his way through life by ability and hard work into independence and wealth. He was full of human sympathy and was especially interested in the welfare of the poor. His impassioned temperament made him apt to be eaten up by the zeal of his causes. He had many of the enthusiast's characteristic defects, but he was filled with the best qualities of a genuine enthusiasm. Mr. Plimsoll's attention happened to be turned to the condition of our merchant seamen, and he found that the state of the law left them almost absolutely at the mercy of the shipowner. The system which prevailed with regard to maritime insurances put a great temptation in the way of unscrupulous and selfish shipowners. It was easy to insure a vessel, and once insured, it mattered little to such a shipowner how soon she went to the bottom. The law dealt in very arbitrary fashion with the seaman who for any reason refused to fulfill his contract and go to sea. It gave to magistrates the power of sending him at once to the common prison. The poor seaman often made his contract with utter thoughtlessness, and when once he made it, he was bound to it. The criminal law bore upon him. Only the civil law applied to the employer. Mr. Plimsoll was convinced that a great many lives were lost by the unprincipled conduct of certain shipowners who sent men out in rotten but well-insured vessels and left them to their fate. He actually found cases of seamen sentenced to prison because they refused to sail in crazy ships, which, when they put to sea, never touched a port, but went down in mid-ocean. Letters were found in the pockets of drowned seamen, which showed that they had made their friends aware of their forebodings as to the condition of the vessel that was to be their coffin. All this stirred Mr. Plimsoll's blood to such a degree that he could not endure it. He began a regular crusade against certain shipowners. He published a book called Our Seamen and Appeal, in which he made the most startling and, it must be added, the most sweeping charges. Courts of law were invoked to deal with his assertions. The authority of Parliament was called on to protect shipowning members against the violence of the irrepressible philanthropist. The public had not much difficulty in understanding Mr. Plimsoll. They saw at once that he was a man likely enough to be betrayed into exaggeration, sometimes into very serious mistake, but that his purpose was genuine, that his cause was good, and that on the whole the case he made out was one calling for the instant attention of Parliament. He was clearly wrong in some of his charges against individuals, but a very general opinion prevailed that he was only too just in his condemnation of the system. Mr. Plimsoll brought in a bill for the better protection of the lives of seamen. It was a stringent measure. It proposed a compulsory survey of all ships before leaving port, various precautions against overloading, the restriction of deck-loading, and the compulsory painting of a load line, the position of which was to be determined by legislation. This measure was strongly opposed by the shipowners in the house, and by many others as well as they, who regarded it as too stringent, and who also feared that by putting too much responsibility on the government, it would take all responsibility off the shipowners. The bill came to the test of a division on June 24, 1874 and was rejected by a majority of only three, 170 voting for it and 173 against. The government then recognizing the importance of the subject 
and the strong feeling which prevailed in the country with regard to it, undertook to bring in a merchant shipping bill of their own. They introduced the bill in the session of 1875. It did not go nearly so far as Mr. Plimsoll would have desired, but it did promise to be at least part of a series of legislation which further developed might have accomplished the object. Such as it was, however, the government did not press it, and toward the end of July Mr. Disraeli announced that they would not go further that year with the measure. The 22nd of July saw one of the most extraordinary scenes that ever took place in the House of Commons. Mr. Plimsoll, under the influence of disappointment and of anger, seemed to have lost all self-control. He denounced some of the shipowners of that house. He threatened to name and expose them. He called them villains who had sent brave men to death. When interrupted by the speaker, and told that he must not apply the term villains to members of the house, he repeated it again and again, and in the most vociferous tones, that they were villains, and that he would abide by his words. He refused to recognize the authority of the speaker. He shouted, shook his fist at the leading members of the government, and rushed out of the house in a state of excitement that seemed little less than that of an actual maniac. Thereupon Mr. Disraeli moved that the speaker do reprimand Mr. Plimsoll for his disorderly behavior. Mr. A. M. Sullivan, one of the Home Rule members, returned for the first time at the general election, a man of remarkable eloquence and of high character, rushed into the house, pallid and almost breathless with excitement, and endeavored to interpose on behalf of Mr. Plimsoll. He pleaded that Mr. Plimsoll was seriously ill, and hardly able to account for his actions owing to mental excitement arising from an overwrought system, and from the intensity of his zeal in the cause of the merchant seamen. He asked that a week should be given Mr. Plimsoll to consider his position. Mr. Fawcett and other members made a similar appeal, and the government consented to postpone a decision of the question for a week. Mr. Plimsoll had offended against the rules, the traditions, and the dignity of the house, and many even of those who sympathized with his general purpose thought he had damaged his cause and ruined his individual position. Nothing, however, could be more extraordinary and unexpected than the result. It was one of those occasions in which the public out of doors showed that they could get to the real heart of a question more quickly and more clearly than Parliament itself. Out of doors, it was thoroughly understood that Mr. Plimsoll's behavior in the House of Commons was a gross offense against order. It was thoroughly understood that he was too sweeping in his charges, that he was entirely mistaken in some of them, that he had denounced men who did not deserve denunciation, that he had surrounded a good cause with an unfortunate adornment of exaggeration, extravagance, and ill-temper. All this the public understood and admitted. But the difference between the public and the House of Commons was that while understanding and admitting all this, the public clearly saw that as to the main question at issue, Mr. Plimsoll was entirely in the right. They saw that making allowance for all exaggeration and all ebullitions of temper, Mr. Plimsoll was the first man to take a just view of the hardships inflicted on merchant seamen, and that the heart of his case if we may use that expression, was sound. The country was therefore determined to stand by him. Great meetings were held all over England during the next few days, at every one of which those who were present pledged themselves to assist Mr. Plimsoll in his general object and policy. The result was that when Mr. Plimsoll appeared in the House of Commons the week after, and in a very full and handsome manner made apology for his offences against parliamentary order, it was apparent to every one in the House and out of it that he was master of the situation, and that the government would have to advance with more or less rapid strides along the path where he was leading. Finally, the government brought in and forcibly pushed through a merchant shipping bill which met for the moment some of the difficulties of the case and which they promised to supplement afterwards by a complete scheme of legislation. 
Mr. Disraeli indeed went so far as quietly to claim for himself and for the government some of the merit of having caused the extraordinary scene in the House of Commons. He suggested that the government were perfectly aware that nothing could be done until the temper of the country was thoroughly roused, and therefore implied, if he did not actually affirm, that it was partly by their design that Mr. Plimsoll was stirred to his extraordinary demonstration, and the assistance of the public thereby obtained for the passing of a strong measure. Even if one does call them names, said Mrs. Gamp, vindicating her treatment of her patients, it's only done to rouse them. The measure did not prove to be a very strong one, but it did something toward Mr. Plimsoll's object. The government afterwards promised to supplement it by legislation, regulating in some way the system of maritime insurances, which they justly declared to be essential to any satisfactory and final settlement of the question. It is clear that so long as the existing system of maritime insurance was allowed to prevail, the temptation to unscrupulous shipowners would continue to be almost irresistible, and that no legislation merely applying to the fabric of the ship could properly secure the lives of the seamen. Other things, however, interfered with the carrying out of the government proposals such as they were. The regulation of maritime insurance was forgotten. Mr. Disraeli's colleagues soon had too many questions of imperial interest on their hands in all parts of the world to have time or inclination for business of so homely a nature as a measure for the protection of the lives of English merchant seamen. Nothing further was done during the reign of the Conservative Ministry to complete the scheme which they had promised in the beginning, and many sessions after, the House saw another outburst of passion on the part of Mr. Plimsoll, another attempt of the government to put him to censure, and another distinct declaration on the part of the country that however Mr. Plimsoll might have offended against the rules of the House, his spirit and purpose were thoroughly in unison with the feelings of the public. The government seemed for a while, however, inclined to keep plotting steadily on with quiet schemes of domestic legislation. These were not usually very comprehensive or drastic schemes. They were rather of the kind which ill-natured critics would describe as tinkering. The government tinkered at a measure for the security of improvements made by agricultural tenants. They made it purely permissive and therefore thoroughly worthless. This one defect tainted many of their schemes of domestic reform, this inclination to make every reform permissive. It seemed to be thought a clever stroke of management to introduce a measure professedly for the removal of some inequality or other grievance, and then to make it permissive and allow all parties concerned to contract themselves out of it. Thus it was said in effect to the agricultural tenant, Behold, here is a bill to enable you to hold fast the fruits of your expenditure and your labor. And to the landlord, you have no cause to be alarmed, for you see this is only a permissive bill, and you can contract yourself out of it, if your tenants agree, and of course they must agree. Mr. Cross, the Home Secretary, however, proved a very efficient minister, and introduced many useful schemes of legislation, among the rest an artisan's dwelling bill the object of which was to enable local authorities to pull down houses unfit for human habitation and rebuild on the sites. The government made experiments in reaction here and there. They restored the appellate jurisdiction of the House of Lords, which had seemed actually doomed. They got into some trouble by issuing a circular to captains of war vessels on the subject of the reception of slaves on board their ships. The principle which the circular laid down was in substance a full recognition of the rights of a slave owner over a fugitive slave. The country rose in indignation against this monstrous reversal of England's time-honored policy, and the circular was withdrawn and a new one issued. This, too, proved unsatisfactory. The government made excuse by pleading that something of the same kind had been done before under a liberal administration, and attempted to satisfy public feeling by declaring that a slave was not to be handed back if the slave's life would be endangered by the withdrawal of the shelter of the English flag. Thereupon it was at once asked, Is a woman slave to be handed back to a ravisher? 
the government became entangled in a whole network of contradictions and difficulties, and after having tried various expedients, appointed commissions, and made other futile efforts to get out of trouble, they had at length to allow the old principle to reassert itself, and the flag of England, whether it floats on sea or land, to be a protection and a shelter for the slave. Of course it is not intended that English vessels of war shall hold out invitations to fugitive slaves or act as propagandist agents of the principles of personal freedom, but the broad plain principle long established was that when a slave does get on board an English vessel, just as when he touches British soil, he is free and is not to be restored to slavery, and that principle the government saw themselves at last compelled to reaffirm. It was impossible for them to resist the popular demand. Some of their own men in the House of Commons fell away from them, and insisted that the old principle must be kept up, and that the slave owner shall not take his slave from under the shadow of the English flag. All this time, what was Mr. Gladstone doing? He appeared to have withdrawn from the paths of parliamentary life, and almost from the political world. He was very busy, indeed, in another way. He had taken to polemical literature. He was writing a series of essays to prove that the doctrine of papal infallibility, if strictly acknowledged by Catholics, would place their allegiance to whatever sovereign entirely at the disposal of the Pope. He was stirring up a heated controversy by endeavoring to prove that absolute obedience to the Catholic Church was henceforward inconsistent with the principles of freedom and that the papal doctrine was everywhere the enemy of liberty. Cardinal Manning, Dr. Newman, and other great controversialists had taken the field against Mr. Gladstone, and the argument went on for a considerable time without abatement of eagerness. Grave politicians were not a little scandalized at the position taken by a statesman who only the other day was prime minister. There seemed something curiously undignified and unseemly in Mr. Gladstone's leading a theological controversy. A speaker at the evangelical meeting in Exeter Hall would have been quite in his place when using such arguments as those employed by Mr. Gladstone, but a sharp polemical controversy provoked by a great statesman was something new in the modern world. One conclusion was adopted everywhere— it seemed clear that Mr. Gladstone never meant to take any leading part in politics again. Surely, it was said, if he had the remotest idea of entering the political field anew, he never would have thus gratuitously assailed the religious belief of the Roman Catholic subjects of the Queen. Nor indeed did it appear as if it would be very suitable for England to have a statesman in office again who must have given offence to all the Catholic sovereigns and ministers of Europe. Unfriendly critics hinted that Mr. Gladstone was writing against the Pope and the Vatican in order to wreak his grudge because of the condemnation of his Irish University Bill by the heads of the Catholic Church in Ireland. It is not probable that any personal motive influenced Mr. Gladstone in a course which all his true admirers of whatever political party must have been sorry to see him follow. He had always a keen relish for theological disputation. He had in him much of the taste and the temper of the ecclesiastic. A religious controversy came to him as the most natural sort of recreation after the fatigue and disappointments of the political arena. Carteret, driven from office, retired laughing, says Macaulay, to his books and his bottle. Fox found relief from political work in his loved Greek authors. Dalleron played whist. Mr. Gladstone sought relaxation in religious controversy. He was as eager about it as ever he had been about a budget or a reform bill. He assailed the Pope as if he were attacking Mr. Disraeli. He declared against the Vatican as if he were overwhelming the Tory opposition with his rhetoric. There was an earnestness about him which made some men smile and others feel sad. Most of his friends shook their heads most of his enemies were delighted. Out of this depth, it seemed impossible that he could ever rise. Mr. Disraeli had once said, there was a Palmerston. Did he feel tempted now to say there was a Gladstone? 
in the beginning of eighteen seventy five mr gladstone had formally retired from the office of leader of the liberal party in the house of commons there was some difficulty at first about the choice of his successor two men stood intellectually high above all other possible competitors mr bright and mr lowe but it was well known that mr bright's health would not allow him to undertake such laborious duties and mr lowe was quietly assumed to have none of the leader's qualities sir william harcourt had not weight enough neither had mr goshen the time of these two men had apparently not yet come the real choice was between mr forster and lord hartington mr forster however knew that he had estranged the nonconformists from him by the course he had taken in his education measures and he withdrew from what he felt to be an untenable position lord hartington was therefore arrived at by a sort of process of exhaustion it is not too much to say that had he not been the son of a great whig duke no human being would ever have thought of him as leader of the liberal party but it is only right to add that he proved much better than his promise he had a robust straightforward nature and by constant practice he made himself an effective debater men liked the courage and the candid admission of his own deficiencies with which he braced himself up to his most difficult task to take the place of gladstone in debate and to confront disraeli end of section thirty nine section forty of a history of our own times volume four by justin mccarthy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 64. The Eastern Question Again. Part 1. A change soon came over the spirit of the administration. It began to be seen more and more clearly that Mr. Disraeli had not come into office merely to consider the claims of agricultural tenants and to pass measures for the pulling down of what Mr. Cross, the Home Secretary, called rookeries in the back slums of great cities. The Prime Minister was well known to cherish loftier ambitions. He was not supposed to have any warm personal interest in prosaic measures of domestic legislation if a great reform bill were brought forward he could fight against it first and adopt it and enlarge it afterwards if any question of picturesque theology were under discussion he was the man to sustain religion with epigram and array himself on the side of the angels in panoply of paradox but his inclinations were all for the broader and more brilliant fields of foreign politics the poetic young notary in richter's story was found with his eyes among the stars and his soul in the blue ether mr disraeli's eyes were among the stars of imperialist ambition his soul was in the blue ether of high policy since his early years he had not travelled he had hardly left england even for a few days he knew personally next to nothing of any foreign country perhaps for this very reason foreign affairs had all the more magical fascination for him the prosaic dullness of downing street may have sent his fancy straying over the regions of alexander's conquests the shortness of the daily walks between the treasury and the house of commons may have filled him with dreams of far extended frontiers and a new empire of the east the marked contrast between the political aptitudes and tastes of mr disraeli and mr gladstone came in to influence still further the difference between the policy of the new government and that of its predecessor mr gladstone delighted in the actual work and business of administration as dr johnson could grapple with whole libraries so mr gladstone could grapple with whole budgets he could assimilate almost in a moment vast masses of figures which other men would have found bewildering even to look at he could get into his mind almost in a flash all the details of the most intricate piece of legislation during the long involved and complicated discussions of the irish church bill and the irish land bill he had conducted the controversy chiefly himself 
and argued the legal details of perplexed clauses with lawyers like Cairns and Ball and Butt. He could indeed do anything but rest. Now Mr. Disraeli had neither taste nor aptitude for the details of administration. He could not keep his mind to the dry details of a bill. He could not construct a complicated measure, nor could he even argue it clause by clause when other men had constructed it for him and explained it to him. He enjoyed administration on a large scale. He loved political debate. He liked to make a great speech. But when he was not engaged in his favorite work, he preferred to be doing nothing. It was natural, therefore, that Mr. Gladstone's administration should be one of practical work, that it should introduce bills to deal with perplexed and complicated grievances, that it should take care to keep the finances of the country in good condition. Mr. Disraeli had no personal interest in such things. He loved to feed his mind on gorgeous imperial fancies. It pleased him to think that England was what he would persist in calling her, an Asiatic power, and that he was administering the affairs of a great Oriental empire. He was fond of legislation on a vague and liberal scale, legislation which gave opportunity for swelling praise and exalted rhetoric. It was not without justice that his opponents constantly insisted that he was not an Englishman but a foreigner, a descendant of an Oriental race. There was indeed something singularly narrow and ungenerous in the constant taunts thrown out against Mr. Disraeli on the score of his Jewish ancestry. Every one who was at all within the limits of the actual political world knew that these taunts came from Mr. Disraeli's political supporters as well as from his political opponents. Every discontented conservative was ready to whisper something about his chief's Jewish descent. But although there was an inexcusable want of generosity in thus making Mr. Disraeli's extraction and ancestral faith a source of objection, it must be owned that as a matter of historical fact, his foreign extraction has had a very distinct influence on his political tendencies and his ministerial career. Mr. Disraeli had never until now had an opportunity of showing what his own style of statesmanship would be. He had always been in office only, but not in power. Now he had for the first time a strong majority behind him. He could do as he liked. He had the full confidence of the sovereign. His party was now wholly devoted to him. They could not but know that it was he whose patience and sagacity had kept them together and had organized victory for them. They began to regard him as infallible. A great many on the other side admired him as much as they disliked his policy and believed in his profound sagacity as devoutly as any of his most humble followers. He had come to occupy in the eyes of Englishmen of all parties something of the position once accorded to Napoleon III by the public opinion of Europe. Even those who detested still feared. Men believed in his power nonetheless because they had no faith in his policy. That Mr. Disraeli could not be mistaken in anything began to be the right sort of thing to say. He was therefore now in a position to indulge freely in his own personal predilections with regard to the way of governing England. In the House of Commons, he had no longer any rival to dread in debate. Mr. Gladstone had withdrawn from the active business of politics. Mr. Bright was not strong enough in physical health to care much for controversy. There was no one else who could by any possibility be regarded as a proper adversary for Mr. Disraeli. The new Prime Minister, therefore, had everything his own way. He soon showed what sort of statesmanship he liked best. He soon turned away from the dusty and plodding paths of domestic legislation. He ceased even to pretend to have any interest in such commonplace and homely work. He showed that he was resolved to play on a vaster stage and to seek the applauses of a more cosmopolitan audience. Napoleon invited Talma to Erfurt that he might play to a pitful of kings. Mr. Disraeli 
was evidently determined to play to an audience of kings and emperors. In politics, as in art, the weaknesses of the master of a school are most clearly seen in the performances of his imitators and admirers. Mr. Disraeli's admirers began to manifest his tendencies more emphatically than he allowed himself to do. At all public meetings and dinners, where conservative orators declaimed, there was much talk about imperial instincts, imperial missions, and destinies, and so forth. A distinguished member of Mr. Disraeli's cabinet proclaimed that since the conservatives came into office, there had been something stirring in the very air which spoke of imperial enterprise. The Elizabethan days were to be restored, it was proudly declared. England was to resume her high place among the nations. She was to make her influence felt all over the world, but more especially on the European continent. The cabinets and chancelleries of Europe were to learn that nothing was to be done any more without the authority of England. A spirited foreign policy was to be inaugurated. A new era was to begin. Enthusiastic conservatives seemed almost literally to swell with pride when they talked of the things to be done under the administration of Mr. Disraeli. The long, ignoble reign of peace and non-intervention was at an end. Every man who did not proclaim that British influence was to reign paramount over Europe and Asia was anti-English, was cosmopolitan, was a member of the Peace Society, was a devotee of Cobden, a defender of the Alabama Treaty, a disciple of non-intervention, and generally speaking, a disgrace to his country and a traitor to his sovereign. Thoughtful men who were not in any sense political partisans, men who were not engaged in politics on either side, began to shake their heads at these new political manifestations. There was an ominous self-consciousness about them. Empires are not made or are not made great, they said, by persons who go about proclaiming an imperial mission. The statesmen who proved themselves truly imperial did not parade in heroic attitudes beforehand and say in pompous tones, Behold us, we have it for our task to be the makers of empires. Such utterances were not happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. The greatness of the age of Elizabeth is not to be revived by talking of an Elizabethan revival. Such attempts seemed insincere and shallow. They resembled some of the aesthetic pretenses and follies of the day, the sham medievalism, the affectation of the affectations of the Queen Anne age. There was too much posturing about the new statecraft to give comfort to plain and thoughtful minds. Goethe has said very well of a certain kind of affectation that it is a pleasant and harmless thing to dress up as a Turk once in a while when going to a masked ball, but that it is an unpardonable waste of time for an honest Western to try and make himself believe all day long that he is a Turk. Now England saw a few middle-aged or ancient gentlemen gravely trying to persuade themselves and their friends that they were Elizabethan conquerors of new worlds, heaven-ordained makers of new empires. The ordinary English mind was not imaginative enough for this sort of thing. Sensible and sober men would be certain to get tired of it soon. Perhaps the first indication of the new foreign policy was given by the purchase of the shares which the Khedive of Egypt held in the Suez Canal. English governments had in the first instance opposed the scheme for the construction of the Suez Canal, and English scientific men had endeavoured to prove that the scheme could never be carried out. Now, however, that the canal was open and was a success, some alarmists began to find a danger to England in the fact that it made the approach to India more easy for other European powers as well as for her. The Khedive of Egypt held nearly half the 400,000 original shares in the canal, and the Khedive was going every day faster and faster on the road to ruin. He was on the brink of bankruptcy. He had been living in the true fashion of an eastern prince, gratifying every expensive whim as it crossed his listless mind. 
stimulating himself by the invention of new ways of spending money when the old caprices tired him, lavishing on the purchase and the keep of fat women treasures that might have saved millions of his wretched subjects from starvation. His 176,000 shares came into the market, and on November 25, 1875, the world was astonished by the news that the English government had turned stock jobber and bought them for four million sterling. The idea was not the government's own. The editor of a London evening paper, Mr. Frederick Greenwood, was the man to whom the thought first occurred. He made it known in the first instance, it is believed, to a member of the cabinet, who threw cold water on it. Not discouraged, Mr. Greenwood tried the Prime Minister himself, and Mr. Disraeli was caught by the proposition, and the shares were instantly bought up in the name of the English government. Seldom in our time has any act on the part of a government been received with such general approbation. The London newspapers broke into a chorus of applause. The London clubs were delighted. The air rang with praises of the courage and spirit shown by the ministry. If here and there a faint voice was raised to suggest that the purchase was a foolish proceeding, that it was useless, that it was undignified, a shout of offended patriotism drowned the ignoble remonstrance. Some continental newspapers did a good deal to stimulate the feeling that prevailed in England by condemning the act as audacious, arrogant, and ominous of an intention to interfere too actively in foreign affairs. This was the very course to stir the feeling of an Englishman. There was a general sense of satisfaction at the idea that England was again regarded as an arrogant and dominating power. Men held up their heads grandly and went about, pride in their port, defiance in their eye, nobly overconscious of belonging to a nation which could make her influence felt once more in foreign affairs. When Parliament met, the liberal leaders ventured to make some objection to the purchase and to the mode of completing it, but all wise persons declared that the very attempt only showed how entirely the liberal leaders were out of sympathy with the English people. It is true that one member of the cabinet, Lord Derby, endeavoured to make as little as possible of the purchase and to represent it as a step taken merely to prevent any foreign influence from preponderating in the management of a canal which was chiefly important for English commerce. Mr. Disraeli and some of his colleagues, on the other hand, spoke in a grand and mysterious way, which gave people to understand that the buying of the shares was part of some great scheme of policy destined to make England mistress of the East and to checkmate the designs of a jealous world. Nothing in particular came of the bargain in the end, and the popular enthusiasm soon cooled down. The act, however, is of historical importance as the first of a series of strokes made by the government in foreign policy, each of which came in the nature of a surprise to Parliament and the country. It is probable that Mr. Disraeli counted upon making his government popular by affording to the public at intervals the exciting luxury of a new sensation. The public was undoubtedly rather tired of having been so long quiet and prosperous. They liked to know that their government was doing something. There were fashions in politics as in literature and in dress. Sensationalism was now decidedly the mode in the political world. Mr. Disraeli led the fashion and stimulated the public taste. The government tried to establish a South African confederation and sent out Mr. Froude, the romantic historian, to act as the representative of their policy. The Prince of Wales was sent on a tour of India, a very reasonable and proper thing in itself, but which the government endeavoured to surround with all the radiance of a new avatar. The prince was taken out to India and introduced to all the princes and other persons whom officialism thought it convenient for him to meet. He got no nearer to the knowledge of the real feelings of any of the Indian population than if he had remained at Marlborough House. The government, meanwhile, made some changes in the relations of the India office here to the Viceroy in Calcutta, which gave much greater power into the hands of the Secretary for India. One immediate result of this was the retirement of Lord Northbrook, 
a prudent and able man, before the term of his administration had actually arrived. Mr. Disraeli gave the country another little surprise. He appointed Lord Lytton Viceroy of India. Lord Lytton has been previously known chiefly as the writer of pretty and sensuous verse and the author of one or two showy and feeble novels. In literary capacity he was at least as much inferior to his father as his father was to Scott or Goethe. All that was known of him besides was that he had held several small diplomatic posts without either distinction or discredit. The world was certainly a good deal astonished at the appointment of such a man to the most important office under the sovereign, an office which had strained the intellectual energies of men like Dalhousie and Canning and Elgin. But people were in general willing to believe that Mr. Disraeli knew Lord Lytton to be possessed of a gift of administration which the world outside had not had any chance of discerning in him. Not much, it was remembered, was known of Lord Mayo's capacity for the task of governing India when he was sent out to Calcutta, and Lord Mayo's administration had undoubtedly been successful. There was no reason why Lord Lytton should not turn out a born administrator. There was no reason why he should not suddenly prove the possession of unexpected gifts, like another Cromwell, Clive, or Spinola. There was something, too, which gratified many persons in the appointment. It seemed gracious and kindly of Mr. Disraeli, thus to recognize and exalt the son of his old friend and companion in arms. There was a feeling all over England which wished well to the appointment, and sincerely hoped it might prove a success. End of section 40《Section 41 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 64. The Eastern Question Again, Part 2. Another little sensation was created by the invention of a new title for the Queen. At the beginning of the session of 1876, the royal speech announced that an addition was to be made to the sovereign's titles, and after several attempts on the part of the opposition to get at the nature of the change, Mr. Disraeli at last announced, in a somewhat hesitating way, that the Queen was to be called the Empress of India. A strong dislike was felt to this superfluous and tawdry addition to the ancient style of the sovereigns of England. The title of Emperor had been a good deal tarnished of late, the emperor of the French had but recently fallen in the dust. There had been an emperor of Mexico and an emperor of Haiti. The title of the German emperor was in one sense only a restoration of a dignity which had been historical, and in any case the restoration was not especially popular in England. But to convert the immemorial crown of the English sovereign into a brand new glittering imperial diadem seemed to most persons simply an act of vulgarity. The educated feeling of the country rose in revolt against this preposterous innovation. Some of the debates in the House of Commons were full of fire and spirit, and recalled the memory of more stirring times when the Liberal Party was in heart and strength. Mr. Lowe spoke against the new title with a vivacity and a bitterness of sarcasm that reminded listeners of his famous opposition to the Reform Bill of 1866. Mr. Joseph Cohen, member for Newcastle, who had been in the House for some sessions without making any mark, suddenly broke into the debates with a speech which had once won him the name of an orator, and which a leading member of the government, Mr. Gathorne Hardy, described as having electrified the House. Mr. Disraeli chaffed the opposition rather than reasoned with it. He pointed out, as one justification of the title, the fact that Spencer had dedicated his fairy queen to the most high, mighty, and magnificent Empress Elizabeth. Spencer, of course, only used the word after the fantastic ways of court flattery in his time, and because he thought Empress sounded well. Milton Satan twice addresses Eve as Empress. Mr. Disraeli also cited, in evidence, a letter from a young lady at school 
who had directed his attention to the fact that in Whitaker's almanac the Queen was already described as Empress of India. This style of argument did not add much to the dignity of the debate. Mr. Lowe spoke with justifiable anger and contempt of the Prime Minister's introducing the lispings of the nursery into a grave discussion, and asked whether Mr. Disraeli wished to make the House in general think as meanly of the subject as he did himself. The government, of course, carried their point. They deferred so far to public feeling as to put into the Act a provision against the use of the imperial title in the United Kingdom. There was indeed a desire that its use should be prohibited everywhere except in India, and most of the members of the opposition were at first under the impression that the government had undertaken to do so much. But the only restriction introduced into the Act had reference to the employment of the additional title in these islands. The unlucky subject was the occasion of a new and somewhat unseemly dispute afterwards. In a speech which he delivered to a public meeting at East Retford, Mr. Lowe made an unfortunate statement to the effect that the Queen had endeavoured to induce two former ministers to confer upon her this new title and had not succeeded. It was a very rash act on the part of a responsible public man to make such a statement without positive certainty as to its truth. Perhaps it would not have been a very wise or proper proceeding on the part of such a man to make the statement, even if it were true. Mr. Lowe proved to be absolutely wrong in his assertion. No attempt of the kind had ever been made by the Queen. Mr. Disraeli found his enemy delivered into his hands. The question was incidentally and indirectly brought up in the House of Commons on May 2nd, 1876, and Mr. Disraeli seized the opportunity. He denounced Mr. Lowe, thundered at him from across the table, piled up a heap of negative evidence to show that his assertion could not be true, and at the very close of his speech came down on the hapless offender with the crushing announcement that he had the authority of the Queen herself to contradict the statement. Nothing could have been in worse taste than Mr. Disraeli's way of making this very necessary contradiction. It is evident that the right course would have been to put into the fewest and simplest words the announcement which Her Majesty had very properly authorized the minister to make. The dignity of the sovereign required that her name and her word should not be introduced to the House by a somewhat coarse rhetorical artifice at the end of a speech, and that they should not be preluded by impassioned sentences of boisterous and furious denunciation. Mr. Lowe sat like one crushed, while Mr. Disraeli roared at him and banged the table at him. He said nothing that night, but on the following Thursday evening he made an apology, which assuredly did not want completeness or humility. The title, which was the occasion for so much debate, has not come into greater popular favor since that time. It is used in India, and we occasionally see evidences of an inclination to bring it quietly into use elsewhere, but there was a very general concurrence of opinion among educated persons in all parts of the country as to the impropriety of the measure adopted by the government and the vulgarizing effect of the new addition to the royal title. It was all part of an imperializing policy, some men said, part of a deliberate scheme to make the institutions of the country less liberal and popular. It is part, another man said, of a tawdry love of finery and frippery in language and policy. It savors of the taste which associated the banner of St. George with the mountains of Rasselas. Mr. Disraeli, however, had a large majority in both Houses of Parliament, and he carried his proposal by about the same preponderance of votes in the Commons as in the Lords. Then the country soon forgot all about the matter. More serious questions were coming up to engage the attention of the public. When Mr. Disraeli was pressed during the debates on the royal title to give some really serious reason for the change, it was observed as significant that he made reference more or less vague to the necessity of asserting the position of the Sovereign of England 
as supreme ruler over the whole empire of India. The Prime Minister spoke in the tone of one who feels more than he desires to express, of one who gives a warning which he wishes to be understood without need of fuller explanation. Everyone knew what Mr. Disraeli meant. He had undoubtedly let drop words which were calculated to produce a deep effect on the public mind. They decided the wavering opinions of many people. There were men who sincerely disliked the idea of the fire new title of Empress, and who yet felt that after what the Prime Minister had said, it would not be prudent to oppose the act of the government. Mr. Disraeli had purposely touched a chord which was sure to vibrate all over the country. The necessity to which he alluded was the necessity of setting up the flag of England on the citadel of England's Asiatic Empire as a warning to the one enemy whom the English people believed they had reason to dread. Mr. Disraeli had raised what has been called the Russian Spectre. No influence during our time has been so potent to direct the foreign and even the domestic policy, to disturb the relations of parties, and to rouse the passions of the people as that which is exercised by the dread and distrust of Russian ambition. A great crisis was now again at hand. It has been already mentioned that Lord Aberdeen was of opinion at the close of the Crimean War that that war might secure the peace of Europe for twenty-five years. His opinion was then thought to be hardly doing justice to the efficacy of the measures taken to sustain Turkey and to restrain the ambition of Russia. Lord Aberdeen, however, had overrated instead of underrating the endurance of the peace that was made by the Treaty of Paris. Only twenty-two years had passed when Turkey and Russia were at war again. During all the interval, Turkey had been occupied in throwing away every opportunity for her political and social reorganization. The influence of the statesmanship of Constantinople had been growing more and more baneful to all the populations under the control of the Sultan. There had been insurrections in Crete, in the Herzegovina, in other parts of the provinces misgoverned by Turkey, and they had been put down whenever the port was strong enough with a barbarous severity. Men on both sides of English politics were now losing all hope of Turkey's regeneration. Two plain facts were present to the consciousness of Europe. Turkey was sinking day by day. Russia was returning to the position she occupied before the Crimean War. Was Russia also returning to the ambition which she undoubtedly cherished before that time? She had lately been making rapid advances into Central Asia. Post after post, which were once believed to be secure from her approach, were dropping into her hands. Her goal of one day became her starting point of the next. Early in July 1875, Lord Derby received an account of disturbances in the Herzegovina and something like an organized insurrection in Bosnia. The provinces inhabited by men of alien race and religion over which Turkey rules have always been the source of her weakness. They have always, in one form or another, invited foreign intervention. Where the intervention was necessary and just, they had been its vindication. Where it was selfish and unnecessary, they had given it its excuse. The revolt which ended in the independence of Greece began in the Danubian provinces. The Crimean War had its origin in the same region. The disturbances of Herzegovina in 1862 and Crete in 1867 had each in its turn almost provoked the intervention of Western Europe. This time it became quite clear in a moment to almost every eye that a crisis had arrived and that a new chapter of the Eastern Question was to be opened. It is not less Turkey's misfortune than her fault, certainly not less her fault than her misfortune, that her way of governing her foreign provinces has been the cause of so much trouble to Western Europe. Fate has given to the most incapable and worthless government in the world a task which would strain the resources of the loftiest public spirit and the most accomplished statesmanship. Turkey has to rule over a great variety of nationalities and of creeds, 
all more or less jumbled together within a comparatively limited area. These different sects and races agree in hardly anything, but in their common detestation of Ottoman rule. Amongst themselves their rivalries are unceasing and bitter. Again and again Turkey has made it her plausible excuse for maintaining a system of stern repression in the southeast of Europe, that if she lifted a strong hand from these populations, they would be found carrying on something like an internecine struggle amongst themselves. The Slav dreads and detests the Greek. The Greek despises the Slav. The Albanian objects alike to Slav and to Greek. The Mohammedan Albanian detests the Catholic Albanian. The Slavs are drawn toward Russia by affinity of race and of religion. But this very fact, which makes in one sense their political strength, brings with it a certain condition of weakness, because by making them more formidable to Greeks and to Germans, it increases the dislike of their growing power and the determination to oppose it. It would indeed take a very wise, far-seeing, and flexible system of administration to enable a central government to rule with satisfaction and with success all these differing and contending races. The Turkish government managed the matter worse than it might seem possible for a government to do, which had been brought for centuries within the action of European civilization. Turkish rule seems to exist only in one of two extremes. In certain places it means entire relaxation of authority, in others it means the most rude and rigorous oppression. The hand of the statesman at Constantinople is absolutely unfelt in some of the remoter provinces supposed to be under Turkish sway. The warlike inhabitants of some highland region live their wild and lawless lives, levying blackmail on travelers and preying on the peaceable commerce of their neighbors with as much indifference to the officials of Stambul as to the remonstrances of Western statesmanship. But it may be that not far from their frontier line, there is some hapless province whose people feel the hand of Turkey strong and cruel on their necks at every moment of their lives. It happens, as is not unnatural in such a system, that the repression is heaviest where it is least needed, and that in the only cases where severity and rigor might be excused, there is an entire relaxation of all central authority. In the condition of things thus hastily sketched out, it is natural that there should be constant upheavings of political and social rebellion. To the Slav population, the neighborhood of Russia has all the disturbing effect which the propinquity of a magnet might have on the works of some delicate piece of mechanism, or which the neighborhood of one great planet has on the movements of another. The settlement made by the Crimean War had since that time been gradually breaking down. Servia was an independent state in all but the name. The Danubian provinces, which were to have been governed by separate rulers, came to unite themselves, first under one ruler, and then into one complete system, and at last emerged into the sovereign state of Romania under the Prussian prince Charles of Hohenzollern. Thus the result which most of the European powers at the time of the Congress of Paris endeavored to prevent was successfully accomplished in spite of their inclinations. The efforts to keep Bosnia and Herzegovina in quiet subjection to the Sultan proved a miserable failure. The insurrection which now broke out in Herzegovina spread with rapidity. The Turkish statesmen insisted that it was receiving help not only from Russia, but from the subjects of Austria, as well as from Serbia and Montenegro. An appeal was made to the English government to use its influence with Austria in order to prevent the insurgents from receiving any assistance from across the Austrian frontier. Serbia and Montenegro were appealed to in a similar manner. Lord Darby seems to have acted with indecision and feebleness. He does not appear to have appreciated the immediate greatness of the crisis, and he offended popular feeling and even the public conscience by urging on the port that the best they could do was to put down the insurrection as quickly as possible and not allow it to swell to the magnitude of a question of European interest. 
Lord Derby knew the anxiety existing among many of the European powers to interfere on behalf of the Christian populations of Turkey, and it almost seemed as if he dreaded the sort of public scandal this must occasion more than the possibility of Turkey using her repressive powers with an excess of rigor. End of section 41. Section 42 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4 by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 64 The Eastern Question Again, Part 3. The insurrection continued to spread, and at last it was determined by some of the Western powers that the time had come for European intervention. Count Andrassy, the Austrian minister, drew up a note which was to be addressed to the port. In this note, Austria, Germany, and Russia united in a declaration that the promises of reform made by the port had not been carried into effect, and that some combined action by the powers of Europe was necessary to insist on the fulfillment of the many engagements which Turkey had made and broken. The note declared that if something of the kind was not done, the governments of Servia and Montenegro would be compelled by the enthusiasm of their populations to support the insurrection in the Turkish provinces, and that the only means of preventing a general outbreak was a firm resolution on the part of the Western powers to compel Turkey to redress the grievances of which the Christian populations complained. This note was dated December 30th, 1875, and it was communicated to the powers which had signed the Treaty of Paris. France and Italy were ready at once to join in it, but England delayed. In fact, Lord Derby held off so long that it was not until he had received a dispatch from the port itself requesting his government to join in the note that he at last consented to take part in the remonstrance. The Turkish government seemed to have desired the presence of England in this movement, as one desires the presence of a secret ally. Rightly or wrongly, the statesmen of Constantinople had got it into their heads that England was their devoted friend, bound by her own interests to protect them against whatever opposition. Instead, therefore, of regarding England's cooperation in the Andrassy note as one other influence brought to compel them to fulfill their engagements, they seemed to have accepted it as a secret force working on their side to enable them to escape from their responsibilities. Lord Derby joined in the Andrassy note. It was sent to the port. The Ottoman government showed some cleverness in their way of meeting the difficulty. They accepted politely all or nearly all the demands addressed to them, expressed in cool and pleasant terms their entire satisfaction with the kindly suggestions made to them, declared themselves rather gratified than otherwise to have their attention called to any little omissions on their part, and promised to carry out in the readiest manner the suggestions which the note contained. Turkey did nothing more than promise. She took no step to meet the demands made by the European powers. After a few weeks, it became perfectly evident that she had not only done nothing, but had never intended to do anything. Russia therefore proposed that the three imperial ministers of the continent should meet at Berlin and consider what steps should be taken in order to make the Andrassy note a reality. A document called the Berlin Memorandum was drawn up in which the three powers pointed out the increasing danger of disturbance in the southeast of Europe and the necessity for at once carrying into effect the objects of the Andrassy note. It was proposed that arms should be suspended for two months between the port and the insurgent provinces, and that meanwhile peace should be negotiated, and that the consuls and the delegates of the European powers should watch over the carrying out of the proposed reforms. The memorandum ended with a significant intimation that if the period of suspension of arms were allowed to pass without the desired objects being attained, or at least approached, there must be an agreement among the powers as to the further measures 
which might be called for in the interest of the general peace. The meaning of all this was perfectly clear. The Andrasi note had invited Turkey's attention to her unfulfilled engagements. Turkey had admitted her deficiencies and promised to supply them. The Berlin Memorandum now proposed to consider the measures by which to enforce on Turkey the fulfillment of her broken promises. It was distinctly implied that should Turkey fail to comply, force would be used to compel her. But on the other hand, it is clear that this was a menace which would of itself have ensured the object. It is out of the question to suppose that Turkey would have thought of resisting the concerted action of England, France, Austria, Germany, Russia, and Italy. The threat of combined action was in itself the surest guarantee of peace. The situation was described very effectively by Lord Granville a year or two later. A man is making a disturbance in the street. If one peaceful inhabitant remonstrates and interferes, it is very likely that his interference will only lead to further violence. But if half a dozen policemen come up, it is more than probable that the disturber will go quietly away. This is a fair illustration of the condition of things in Europe and of the sense and spirit of the Berlin Memorandum. Overwhelming and irresistible force was to be brought to bear against Turkey in order that Turkey might have no possible excuse or opportunity for attempting resistance. Unfortunately, however, Lord Derby and the English government did not see their way to join in the Berlin Memorandum. Lord Derby, it seems, was of opinion that a secret agreement between Germany, Austria, and Russia had existed since 1873, and he feared to allow England to be drawn into what might have been a dangerous complication. Other English statesmen were convinced that Russia was all the while secretly stirring up that discontent in the Christian provinces which the Western powers were using as an argument for intervention. Lord Derby had to decide, and it seems to us he decided, in the wrong way. He refused to join in the Berlin Memorandum. Not merely did he refuse to join in it, but he made no suggestion as to any other course which might be taken if the memorandum was abandoned. The refusal of England was fatal to the project. The memorandum was never presented. Concert between the European powers was for the time at an end. From that moment, everyone in Western Europe knew that war was certain in the East. A succession of startling events kept public attention on the strain. There was an outbreak of Mussulman fanaticism at Salonika, and the French and German consuls were murdered. A revolutionary demonstration took place in Constantinople, and the Sultan Abdulaziz was dethroned. The miserable Abdulaziz committed suicide in a day or two after. This was the Sultan who had been received in England with so much official ceremony and public acclaim. It was he who had been welcomed at Windsor, had been entertained by the Corporation of London, had been the lion of the season and the sensation of the sightseeing public. At the time when he was feasted and applauded in London, the Cretan insurrection was going on, and his troops were doing the business of repression with an unsparing cruelty worthy of the soldans of the Middle Ages. His death by his own hand in a fit of despair as he found himself dethroned, deserted, lonely, and hated, was a strange close for the career which had begun with so much promise and amid such universal expectation at the time of the Crimean War. His nephew Murad was made sultan in his place. Murad reigned only three months and was then dethroned, and his brother Hamid put in his place. Suddenly, the attention of the English public was called away to events more terrible than palace revolutions in Constantinople. An insurrection had broken out in Bulgaria, and the Turkish government sent large numbers of Bashi bazooks and other irregular troops to crush it. They did not, however, stay their hand when the insurrection had been crushed. Repression soon turned into massacre. Rumors began to reach Constantinople of hideous wholesale murders committed in Bulgaria. The Constantinople correspondent of the Daily News investigated the evidence and found it but too true. In a few days after, 
accounts were laid before the British public of the deeds which ever since have been known as the Bulgarian atrocities. A story was told of the wholesale massacre of women and children, such as could hardly have found its parallel in the worst days of an earlier Byzantine rule, or under the odious reign of the later sovereigns of Delhi. Nothing could have been more ill-advised and unfortunate than the manner in which Mr. Disraeli at first dealt with these terrible stories. He treated them with a levity which jarred harshly on the ears of almost all listeners. It was plain that he did not believe them or attach any importance to them. No one ever supposed that he was really wanting in humanity. It is certain that if he had believed such crimes were committed, he would have been incapable of excusing them or making light of them. But he did not believe in any of the stories. He set them down too hastily as mere figment of rumor and the newspaper correspondent and what he called coffee-house babble. He took no trouble to examine the testimony on which they rested. He therefore thought himself warranted in dealing with them as if they were merely stories to laugh at. He evidently did not know much about the Turkish provinces of our day, or about Turkish affairs in general. He endeavored to make out that the Bashi Bazooks were really the residents and occupiers of Bulgaria. He described them as Circassians who had been settled there long since with the approval of all Europe. He reproached the Liberal Party with the lack of sympathy they now showed for a race of beings in whom they once professed such an interest. Mr. Disraeli's ideas of Bulgaria were evidently drawn from vague reminiscences of Voltaire's Candide, and he depicted the Bulgarians as cruel oppressors of the Bashi Bazooks. He expressed entire skepticism as to the tortures said to have been inflicted on their victims by the Turkish soldiery. Oriental races, he gravely observed, did not usually have recourse to torture. They generally terminated their connection with culprits in a more expeditious manner. All this might have been what the German quack and Scots antiquary calls very witty and comedy, but the house was not exactly in the vein for mirth. Mr. Disraeli had always the faculty of persuading himself to believe or disbelieve anything according as he liked. The statesman who could really persuade himself into the belief that Oriental races did not usually have recourse to torture might well persuade himself of anything. Probably for the time, Mr. Disraeli actually believed that the Bashi Bazooks were gentle exiles of the class of Thaddeus of Warsaw, sweetly incapable of harming any creature. But the house in the country would have preferred the Prime Minister in a different mood just then. The subject proved to be far too serious for light-hearted treatment. Mr. Disraeli felt this way afterwards, and made an attempt to persuade the country that there was no levity in his talk about the Oriental way of terminating the connection with a culprit. Mr. Baring, the English consul, sent out specially to Bulgaria to make inquiries, and who was supposed to be in general sympathy with Turkey, reported that no fewer than 12,000 persons had been killed in the district of Philippopolis. He confirmed substantially some of the most shocking details of the massacre of women and children, which had been given by Mr. McGann, a correspondent whom the Daily News had sent out to the spot, to see with his own eyes and report what he saw. There was no disputing the significance of some of that testimony. The defenders of the Turks insisted that the only deaths were those which took place in fight, insurgents on one side, Turkish soldiers on the other. But Mr. Baring, as well as the daily news correspondents, saw whole masses of the dead bodies of women and children piled up in places where the bodies of no combatants were to be seen. The women and children were simply massacred. The Turkish government may not have known at first of the deeds that were done by their soldiers, but it is certain that after the facts had been forced upon their attention, they conferred new honors on the chief perpetrators of the crimes which shocked the moral sense of all Europe. Mr. Bright happily described the agitation which followed in England as an uprising of the English people. At first it was an uprising without a leader. Soon, however, it had a chief of incomparable energy and power. Mr. Gladstone, 
came out of his semi-retirement. He threw aside polemics and criticism. He forgot for a while Homer and the Pope. He flung himself into the agitation against Turkey with the impassioned energy of a youth. He made speeches in the House of Commons and out of it. He attended monster meetings indoors and out of doors. He published pamphlets. He wrote letters. He brought forward motions in Parliament. He denounced the crimes of Turkey and the policy which would support Turkey, with an eloquence that for the time set England aflame. After a while, no doubt, there set in a sort of reaction against the fervent mood. The country could not long continue in this white heat of excitement. Some men began to protest against the sentimental in politics. Others grew tired of hearing Turkey denounced. Others again complained that they had got too much of the Bulgarian atrocities. Moreover, Mr. Disraeli and his supporters were able to work with great effect on that strong, deep-rooted feeling of the modern Englishman, his distrust and dread of Russia. Mr. Gladstone was accused of acting in such a manner as to make himself the instrument of Russian designs on Constantinople. He had in his pamphlet, Bulgarian Horrors and the Question of the East, insisted that the only way to secure any permanent good for the Christian provinces of Turkey was to turn the Turkish officials bag and baggage out of them. What people called the bag and baggage policy was denounced as a demand for the expulsion of the Turks, all the Turks, the Turkish men and women, out of Europe. Of course, what Mr. Gladstone meant was exactly what he said, that the rule of Turkish officialdom should cease in the Christian provinces, that these provinces should have autonomous governments subject to the Sultan, not that all the individual Turks should be turned out. But the cry went forth that he had called for the expulsion of the Turks from Europe, and that the moment the Turks went out of Constantinople, the Russians must come in. Nothing could have been better suited to rouse up reaction and alarm. A sudden and strong revulsion of feeling took place in favor of the government. Mr. Gladstone was honestly regarded by millions of Englishmen as the friend and instrument of Russia, Mr. Disraeli as the champion of England, and the enemy of England's enemy. Mr. Disraeli was, like another Chatham, bidding England be of good cheer and hurling defiance at her foes. Mr. Disraeli? By this time, there was no Mr. Disraeli. The 11th of August, 1876, was an important day in the parliamentary history of England. Mr. Disraeli made then his last speech in the House of Commons. It was a speech filled for the most part with banter and ridicule directed against those who were leading the agitation against the government. But toward the close, Mr. Disraeli struck a louder and a stronger note. He sustained and defended the policy of the government as an imperial policy, the object of which was to maintain the empire of England. Nor will we ever agree to any step, though it may obtain for a moment comparative quiet and a false prosperity that hazards the existence of that empire. The House of Commons little knew that these were the last words it was to hear from Mr. Disraeli. The secret was well kept. It was made known only to the newspapers that night. Next morning, all England knew that Benjamin Disraeli had become Earl of Beaconsfield. The title once intended for Burke had come to the author of Vivian Grey. Everybody was well satisfied that if Mr. Disraeli liked an earldom, he should have it. His political career had had claims enough to any reward of the kind that his sovereign could bestow. If he had battled for honor, it was fair that he should have the prize. Coming as it did just then, the announcement of his elevation to the peerage seemed like a defiance flung in the face of those who would arraign his policy. The attacks made on Mr. Disraeli were to be answered by Lord Beaconsfield. His enemies had become his footstool. End of section 42. Section 43 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 65, The Congress of Berlin, 
Part 1 Lord Beaconsfield went down to the county which he had represented so long and made a farewell speech at Aylesbury. This occasion must for him have been one to call up genuine emotion. The speech was in many parts worthy of the occasion. Lord Beaconsfield set forth his reasons for consenting to quit that splendid arena on which he had so long played a brilliant part. Years were telling on him, he explained in some sentences full of feeling and of good taste. He was no longer as young as when forty-three years before he addressed the electors of Buckinghamshire in that same place. He said that his colleagues had been more careful of his feelings than Gilles Blas was of those of the Archbishop of Granada, but he added that he was less self-complacent than the Archbishop. He was willing, therefore, to retire from the field in good time and to be content to serve his country in the more quiet ways of the House of Lords. Unfortunately, Lord Beaconsfield soon went on to make a fierce attack on his political opponents. He marred the effect of his speech artistically as well as politically by the overwrought and acrimonious language in which he allowed himself to indulge. Speaking of the sublime sentiments which had been evoked by the crimes done in Bulgaria, he pointed to the danger of designing politicians taking advantage of them for their own sinister ends, and described such conduct as worse than any of those Bulgarian atrocities which now occupy attention. Nothing could be in worst taste. It was impossible to doubt that Lord Beaconsfield's picture of the designing politicians was meant to be understood as a picture of Mr. Gladstone and those who supported him. The controversy, bitter enough before, became still more bitter now. Lord Beaconsfield and Mr. Gladstone were thrown into as sharp an antagonism as that of two gladiators in a Roman arena or two duelists standing at twelve paces from each other. They had been lifelong opponents this now seemed like a duel to the death. The policy each represented may be described in a few very summary words. Lord Beaconsfield was for maintaining Turkey at all risks as a barrier against Russia. Mr. Gladstone was for renouncing all responsibility for Turkey and taking the consequences. Men who prided themselves on being practical politicians, above all things, went naturally with Lord Beaconsfield. Men who held that sound politics cannot exist without sound morals went with Mr. Gladstone. It is our business, the one set of men said, to secure the interests of England. If Turkey is useful to us as a barrier against Russia, we are bound to keep her in her place for our own sake. Her private character is of no account to us. The other men argued that it was the duty of England to release herself from all responsibility for the crimes of Turkey and to refuse to stand in the way of the developing freedom of the Christian populations. The public conscience of England, said the one, the interests of England, said the other. Be just and fear not, Mr. Gladstone urged. No sentiment rejoined Lord Beaconsfield. The crimes of Turkey was the cry of one party. The ambition of Russia made the alarm note of the other. Each statesman made a mistake, and each mistake was characteristic of the man. Lord Beaconsfield misunderstood the condition of public feeling and the gravity of the case when he thought he could get rid of the Bulgarian events by a laugh and a light word. Mr. Gladstone afterwards made a mistake when he acted on the assumption that mere sympathy and mere sensibility could long prevail in the English public mind against the traditional distrust of Russia. When Lord Beaconsfield and his supporters once had their opportunity of laying that card, they had the game absolutely in their hands. The common expectation was soon fulfilled. At the close of June 1876, Servia and Montenegro declared war against Turkey. Servia's struggle was short. The Servians were assisted by the advice and the active presence of a large number of Russian officers who volunteered for the purpose. The small Servian army, however, proved no match for the Turks. 
At the beginning of September, the struggle was over and Serbia was practically at Turkey's feet. The hardy Montenegrin mountaineers held their own stoutly against the Turks everywhere, but they could not seriously influence the fortunes of a war. England proposed an armistice of not less than a month. Turkey delayed, shuffled, paltered, at length suggested an armistice till the end of the following March. The suggestion was preposterous. Such a period of suspense would have been ruinous to Servia and Montenegro, intolerable to Europe. Russia then intervened and insisted upon an armistice at once, and her demand was acceded to by Turkey. Meanwhile, the general feeling in England on both sides was growing stronger and stronger. Public meetings of Mr. Gladstone's supporters were held all over the country, and the English government was urged in the most emphatic manner to bring some strong influence to bear on Turkey. On the other hand, it cannot be doubted that the common suspicion of Russia's designs began to grow more keen and wakeful than ever. Lord Derby frankly made known to the Emperor Alexander what was thought or feared in England, and the Emperor replied by pledging his sacred word that he had no intention of occupying Constantinople, and that if he were compelled by events to occupy any part of Bulgaria, it should be only provisionally, and until the safety of the Christians should be secured. Then Lord Derby proposed that a conference of the European powers should be held at Constantinople in order to agree upon some scheme which should provide at once for the proper government of the various provinces and populations subject to Turkey, and at the same time for the maintenance of the independence and integrity of the Ottoman Empire. The proposal for a conference was accepted by all the great powers, and on November 8, 1876, it was announced that Lord Salisbury and Sir Henry Elliot, the English ambassador at Constantinople, were to attend as the representatives of England. Lord Beaconsfield was apparently determined to recover the popularity that had been somewhat impaired by his unlucky way of dealing with the massacres of Bulgaria. His plan now was to go boldly in for the denunciation of Russia. He sometimes talked of Russia as he might of an enemy who had already declared war against England. On November 9, 1876, he spoke at a banquet given by the new Lord Mayor at the Guildhall. He glorified the strength and the resources of England. If the struggle comes, he said, there is no country so prepared for war as England. In a righteous cause, England is not the country that will have to inquire whether she can enter upon a second or a third campaign. In a righteous cause, England will commence a fight that will not end until right is done. It was clear that the allusions in the speech were to Russia. The words about the second and third campaign were of unmistakable application. Either by coincidence or otherwise, the Russian emperor delivered a speech the very next day to the nobles of Moscow, which sounded like a direct answer to Lord Beaconfield's challenge. Alexander declared that if he could not succeed in obtaining with the concert of Europe such guarantees as he thought necessary to require of Turkey, he was firmly determined to act independently and was convinced that the whole of Russia would respond to his summons. The words of Lord Beaconsfield were spoken somewhat late on the evening of Thursday. The emperor addressed the nobles at Moscow the very next day. Still there was ample time for the ordinary telegraphic report of Lord Beaconsfield's speech to be in Alexander's hands long before the hour at which he had to address the Moscow assembly. Most persons assumed that the speech of the Russian emperor was undoubtedly an answer to that of the English prime minister. The prospects of a peaceful settlement of the European controversy seemed to have become heavily overclouded. Lord Beaconsfield appeared to be holding the dogs of war by the collar and only waiting for the convenient moment to let them slip. Every eye was turned upon him. He must have felt that his ambition was fast reaching the very sea mark of its utmost sail. The decision of peace or war seemed to be absolutely with him. 
he held the destinies of millions in the hollow of his hand. Everyone knew that some of his colleagues, Lord Derby, for example, and Lord Carnarvon, were opposed to any thought of war, and felt almost as strongly for the Christian provinces of Turkey as Mr. Gladstone did. But people shook their heads doubtfully when it was asked whether Lord Derby or Lord Carnarvon, or both combined, could prevail in strength of will against Lord Beaconsfield. The conference of Constantinople came to nothing. The Turkish statesmen at first attempted to put off the diplomatists of the West by the announcement that the Sultan had granted a constitution to Turkey, that there was to be a parliament at which representatives of all the provinces were to speak up for themselves. There was, in fact, a Turkish parliament called together. The first meeting of the conference was disturbed by the sound of salvos of cannon to celebrate the opening of the first constitutional assembly of Turkey. Of course, the Western statesmen could not be put off by an announcement of this kind. They knew well enough what a Turkish parliament must mean. A parliament is not made by the decree of an autocrat calling a number of men into a room and bidding them debate and divide. To have a parliament, there must be, first of all, something like a free people. Europe had seen a brand new Egyptian parliament created not long before, and had felt at first a sort of languid curiosity about it, and then after a while learned that it had sunk into the ground or faded away somehow without leaving any trace of its constitutional existence. It seems almost superfluous to say that the Turkish parliament was ordered to disappear very soon after the occasion passed away for trying to deceive the great European powers. Evidently, Turkey had got it into her head that the English government would at the last moment stand by her and would not permit her to be coerced. It is not certain, perhaps cannot be known during this generation, whether there was any truth in the report so freely spread abroad in England that private hints were given to Turkish statesmen by an English diplomatist encouraging them to resist the demands of the great powers and directly or indirectly promising them the support of England. What is certain is that Turkey held out in the end and refused to come to terms, and the conference broke up without having accomplished any good. New attempts at arrangement were made between England, Russia, and others of the great powers, but they fell through. Some unfortunate cause seemed always to prevent any kind of cordial cooperation. Then at last, Russia took the field against Turkey. On October 24, 1877, Russia declared war, and on June 27, a Russian army crossed the Danube and moved toward the Balkans, meeting with comparatively little resistance while at the same time another Russian force invaded Asia Minor. For a while the Russians seemed likely to carry all before them. Suddenly, however, it appeared that they had made many mistakes in their arrangements. They had made the one great mistake of altogether undervaluing their enemies. Their preparations were hasty and imperfect. The Turks, to do them justice, have never wanted fighting power. They have at all times shown great strength and skill in the mere work of resistance. Long after they had ceased to be anything of a terror to Europe as an aggressive power, they again and again showed tremendous strength and energy in defense. In this instance they were quick to see the mistakes which the Russians had made. They turned upon them unexpectedly and made a gallant and almost desperate resistance. One of their commanders, Osman Pasha, suddenly threw up defensive works at Plevna in Bulgaria, a point the Russians had neglected to secure, and maintained himself there, repulsing the Russians many times with great slaughter. For a time success seemed altogether on the side of the Turks, and many people in England were convinced that the Russian enterprise was already an entire failure, that nothing remained for the armies of the Tsar but retreat, disaster, and disgrace. Cooler observers, however, still assumed that where great superiority of strength and resources existed, military superiority must come in the end. It was evidently only a question of time to enable Russia to make good her mistake and to recover her energies. 
Thus far the defeats of the Russians had really been inflicted by themselves. Their own blunders had given the battle into the hands of their enemies. Taught by experience, the Tsar confided the direction of the campaign to the hands of General Totleben, the great soldier whose splendid defense of Sebastopol had made the one grand military reputation of the Crimean War. Under his directing skill, the fortunes of the campaign soon turned. Just at the very moment when English critics were proclaiming that the campaign in Asia Minor was over and that Plevna never could be taken, there came a succession of crushing defeats inflicted by the Russians on the Turks, both in Europe and Asia. Kars was taken by assault on November 18, 1877. Plevna surrendered on December 10. At the opening of 1878, the Turks were completely prostrate. The road to Constantinople was clear. Before the English public had time to recover their breath and to observe what was taking place, the victorious armies of Russia were almost within sight of the minarets of Stamboul. Meanwhile, the English government were taking momentous action. In the first days of 1878, Sir Henry Elliot, who had been ambassador in Constantinople, was transferred to Vienna, and Mr. Layard, who had been minister at Madrid, was sent to the Turkish capital to represent England there. This step was doubtless meant as an evidence that the English government were determined to give to the Sultan an energetic support, but at the same time to exert their influence more decisively than before in compelling him to listen to reason and to friendly remonstrance. Mr. Laird was known to be a strong believer in Turkey, more Turkish in some respects than the Turks themselves. But he was a man of superabundant energy, of what might be described as boisterous energy. The Ottoman government could not but accept his appointment as a new and stronger proof that the English government were determined to stand their friend. But they ought to have accepted it too as evidence that the English government were determined to use some pressure to make them amenable to reason. Unfortunately, it would appear that the Sultan's government accepted Mr. Laird's appointment in the one sense only, and not in the other. Parliament was called together at least a fortnight before the time usual during recent years. The speech from the throne announced that Her Majesty could not conceal from herself that should the hostilities between Russia and Turkey unfortunately be prolonged, some unexpected occurrence may render it incumbent on me to adopt measures of precaution. This looked ominous to those who wished for peace, and it raised the spirits of the war party. There was a very large and a very noisy war party already in existence. It was particularly strong in London. It embraced some liberals as well as nearly all Tories. It was popular in the music halls and the public houses of London. The class whom Prince Bismarck once called the gentlemen of the pavement were in its favor at least in the metropolis, almost to a gentleman of the pavement. The men of action got a nickname. They were dubbed the Jingo Party. The term applied as one of ridicule and reproach was adopted by chivalrous Jingos as a name of pride. The Jingos of London, like the beggars of Flanders, accepted the word of contumely as a title of honor. In order to avoid the possibility of any historical misunderstanding or puzzlement hereafter about the meaning of Jingo, such as we have heard of concerning that of Whig and Tory, it is well to explain how the term came into existence. Some Tertius of the Tap Tub, some Kühner of the Music Halls, had composed a ballad which was sung at one of these caves of harmony every night amid the tumultuous applause of excited patriots. The refrain of this war song contained the spirit-stirring words, We don't want to fight, but by jingo, if we do, we've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too. Someone whose pulses this lyrical outburst of national pride failed to stir called the party of its enthusiasts the jingos. The writer of this book is under the impression that the invention of the name belongs to Mr. George Jacob Holyoke, but he declines to pledge his historical reputation to the fact. The name was caught up at once, and the party were universally known as the Jingos. 
the famous abjuration of the lady and the vicar of Wakefield had proved to be too prophetical. She had sworn by the living Jingo, and now indeed the Jingo was alive. The government ordered the Mediterranean fleet to pass the Dardanelles and go up to Constantinople. The Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that he would ask for a supplementary estimate of six millions for naval and military purposes. Lord Carnarvon, the colonial secretary, at once resigned. He had been anxious to get out of the ministry before, but Lord Beaconsfield induced him to remain. He disapproved now so strongly of the dispatch of the fleet to Constantinople and the supplementary vote that he would not any longer defer his resignation. Lord Derby was also anxious to resign, and indeed tendered his resignation, but he was prevailed upon to withdraw it. The fleet, meanwhile, was ordered back from the Dardanelles to Bezica Bay. It had got as far as the opening of the Straits when it was recalled. The liberal opposition in the House of Commons kept on protesting against the various war measures of the government, but with little effect. The majority of the government kept on increasing. The strength of that majority did not lie in mere jingoism. There can be no doubt that a great many members of the House of Commons voted with Lord Beaconsfield in the sincere conviction that he was the man whom it was safest to trust, and that the protestations of pacific purpose which the government were always making would be most likely to be realized if Lord Beaconsfield had full power to carry out the policy he thought best. While all this agitation in and out of Parliament was going on, while the opposition was now proposing and now withdrawing amendments, while the government were protesting their desire for peace, and the champions of the government out of doors were screaming for war, while the music halls were cheering for the great name of Jingo, and monster meetings in Hyde Park on either side of the question were turning into mere faction fights, generally to the defeat and rout of the peace party, the news came that the Turks, utterly broken down, had been compelled to sign an armistice and an agreement containing a basis of peace at Adrianople. Then following quickly on the heels of this announcement came a report that the Russians, notwithstanding the armistice, were pushing on towards Constantinople with the intention of occupying the Turkish capital. A cry of alarm and indignation broke out in London. One memorable night a sudden report reached the House of Commons that the Russians were actually in the suburbs of Constantinople. The House for a time almost entirely lost its head. The lobbies, the corridors, St. Stephen's Hall, the Great Westminster Hall itself and Palace Yard beyond it became filled with wildly excited and tumultuous crowds. If the clamor of the streets at that moment had been the voice of England, nothing could have prevented a declaration of war against Russia. Happily, however, it was proved that the rumor of the Russian advance was unfounded. The fleet was now sent in good earnest through the Dardanelles and anchored a few miles below Constantinople. Russia at first protested that if the English fleet passed the Straits, Russian troops ought to occupy the city. Lord Derby was firm, and terms of arrangement were found. English troops were not to be disembarked, and the Russians were not to advance. Russia was still open to negotiation. Probably Russia had no idea of taking on herself the tremendous responsibility of an occupation of Constantinople. She had entered into a treaty with Turkey, the famous Treaty of San Stefano, by which she secured for the populations of the Christian provinces almost complete independence of Turkey, and was to create a great new Bulgarian state with a seaport on the Aegean Sea. The English government refused to recognize this treaty. Lord Derby contended that it involved an entire readjustment of the Treaty of Paris, and that could only be done with the sanction of the great powers assembled in Congress. Lord Beaconsfield openly declared that the Treaty of San Stefano would put the whole southeast of Europe directly under Russian influence. Russia offered to submit the treaty to the perusal, if we may use the expression, of a Congress, but argued that the stipulations which merely concerned Turkey and herself 
were for Turkey and herself to settle between them. This was obviously an untenable position. It is out of the question to suppose that as long as European policy is conducted on its present principles, the great powers of the West could consent to allow Russia to force on Turkey any terms she might think proper. Turkey, meanwhile, kept feebly moaning that she had been coerced into signing the treaty. The government determined to call out the reserves, to summon a contingent of Indian troops to Europe, to occupy Cyprus, and to make an armed landing on the coast of Syria. All these resolves were not, however, made known at the time. Everyone felt sure that something important was going on, and public expectancy was strained to the full. On March 28, 1878, the House of Lords met as usual. Lord Derby was seen to come in and seat himself, not with the ministers on the front bench to the right of the Lord Chancellor, but below the gangway on the same side. This created some surprise. But for a moment, some peers and strangers believed that he had only taken his seat there for the purpose of conversing with a friend who sat behind. The ministers came in one by one and took their places. The business of the house began. Lord Derby remained as before, in a seat below the gangway, and then it was clear to everyone that he was no longer a member of the government. In a few moments he rose and made his explanation. Measures, he said, had been resolved upon of which he could not approve, and he had therefore resigned his office. He did not give any explanation of the measures to which he objected. Lord Beaconsfield spoke a few words of good feeling and good taste after Lord Derby's announcement. He had hoped, he said, that Lord Derby would soon come to occupy the place of Prime Minister which he now held. He dwelt upon their long friendship. Not much was said on either side of what the government was doing. The last hope of the peace party seemed to have vanished when Lord Derby left his office. End of section 43《Section 44 of A History of Our Own Times, Volume 4, by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 65, The Congress of Berlin, Part 2. Lord Salisbury was made foreign minister. He was succeeded in the India office by Mr. Gathorne Hardy, now created Lord Cranbrook. Colonel Stanley, brother of Lord Derby, took the office of Minister of War in Lord Cranbrook's place. Sir Michael Hicks Beach had already become secretary for the colonies on the resignation of Lord Carnarvon. The post of Irish secretary had been given to Mr. James Lowther, an unfortunate appointment as it afterwards proved. Lord Salisbury's first act in the office of foreign secretary was to issue a circular in which he declared that it would be impossible for England to enter a Congress which was not free to consider the whole of the provisions of the Treaty of San Stefano. The very day after Parliament had adjourned for the Easter recess, the Indian government received orders to send certain of their troops to Malta. This was a complete surprise to the country. We may anticipate matters a little by saying that nothing in the end did more harm to Lord Beaconsfield's government than his constant practice of taking the country by surprise. Some of his more vulgar admirers were delighted by these successive sensations. They thought it highly agreeable to be ruled by a minister who had always something new to amuse and excite them but the common sense of the country was painfully shaken by these galvanic shocks administered every now and then. The summoning of the troops to Malta became the occasion also for a very serious controversy on a grave constitutional question. It was debated in both houses of Parliament. The opposition contended that the constitutional principle which left it for Parliament to fix the number of soldiers the Crown might maintain in England was reduced to nothingness if the Prime Minister could at any moment, without even consulting Parliament, draw what reinforcements he thought fit 
from the almost limitless resources of India. No reasonable person can deny the justice of this argument. It only needs to be stated in order to enforce itself. The majority then supporting Lord Beaconsfield were not, however, much disposed to care about argument or reason. They were willing to approve of any step Lord Beaconsfield might think fit to take. Prince Bismarck had often, during these events, shown an inclination to exhibit himself in the new attitude of a peaceful mediator. He now interposed again and issued invitations for a congress to be held in Berlin to discuss the whole contents of the Treaty of San Stefano. After some delay, discussion, and altercation, Russia agreed to accept the invitation on the conditions proposed and it was finally resolved that a congress should assemble in Berlin on the approaching June thirteenth. To this congress it was supposed by most persons that Lord Salisbury would be sent to represent England. Much to the surprise of the public, Lord Beaconsfield announced that he himself would attend, accompanied by Lord Salisbury, and conduct the negotiations in Berlin. The event was, we believe, without precedent. Never before had an English Prime Minister left the country whilst Parliament was sitting to act as the representative of England in a foreign capital. The part he had undertaken to play suited Lord Beaconsfield's love for the picturesque and the theatrical. It seemed a proper culmination to his career that he should take his seat at a great European Council chamber and there help in dictating terms of peace to Europe. The temptation was irresistible to a nature so fond of show and state and pomp. Lord Beaconsfield went to Berlin. His journey thither was a sort of triumphal progress. At every great city, almost at every railway station as he passed, crowds turned out, drawn partly by curiosity, partly by admiration, to see the English statesman whose strange and varied career had so long excited the wondering attention of Europe. The Congress was held in the Radzivill Palace, a building with a plain, unpretending exterior, in one of the principal streets of Berlin, and then in the occupation of Prince Bismarck. The prince himself presided, and it is said departed from the usual custom of diplomatic assemblages by opening the proceedings in English. The use of our language was understood to be a kindly and somewhat patronizing deference to the English Prime Minister, whose knowledge of spoken French was supposed to have fallen somewhat into decay of late years. The Congress discussed the whole or nearly the whole of the questions opened up by the recent war. Greece claimed to be heard there, and after some delay and some difficulty was allowed to plead in her own cause. The Congress of Berlin had to deal with four or five great distinct questions. It had to deal with the condition of the provinces or states nominally under the suzerainty of Turkey. It had then to deal with the populations of alien race and religion actually under Turkey's dominion. It had to take into its consideration the claims of the Greeks, that is, of the Kingdom of Greece, for extended frontier and of the Greek populations under Turkey, for a different system of rule. Finally, it had to deal with the Turkish possessions in Asia. The great object of most of the statesmen who were concerned in the preparation of the treaty which came of the Congress was to open for the Christian populations of the southeast of Europe a way into gradual self-development and independence. But on the other hand, it must be owned that the object of some of the powers, and especially, we are afraid, of the English government, was rather to maintain the Ottoman government than to care for the future of the Christian races. These two influences, acting and counteracting on each other, produced the Treaty of Berlin. That treaty recognized the complete independence of Romania, of Servia, of Montenegro, subject only to certain stipulations with regard to religious equality in each of these states. To Montenegro it gave a seaport and a slip of territory attached to it. 
Thus one great object of the mountaineers was accomplished. They were able to reach the sea. The treaty created, north of the Balkans, a state of Bulgaria, a much smaller Bulgaria than that sketched in the Treaty of San Stefano. Bulgaria was to be a self-governing state tributary to the Sultan, and owning his suzerainty, but in other respects practically independent. It was to be governed by a prince whom the population were to elect with the assent of the great powers and the confirmation of the Sultan. It was stipulated that no member of any reigning dynasty of the great European powers should be eligible as a candidate. South of the Balkans, the treaty created another and different kind of state under the name of Eastern Rumelia. That state was to remain under the direct political and military authority of the Sultan, but it was to have, as its interior condition, a sort of administrative autonomy, as the favorite diplomatic phrase then was. East Rumelia was to be ruled by a Christian governor, and there was a stipulation that the Sultan should not employ any irregular troops, such as the Circassians and the Bashi Bazooks, in the garrisons of the frontier. The European powers were to arrange in concert with the port for the organization of this new state. As regards Greece, it was arranged that the Sultan and the King of the Hellenes were to come to some understanding for a modification of the Greek frontier, and that if they could not arrange this between themselves, the great powers were to have the right of offering, that is to say in plain words, of insisting on their mediation. The Sultan also undertook, scrupulously to apply to Crete, the organic law of 1868. Bosnia and Herzegovina were to be occupied and administered by Austria. Romania undertook, or in other words was compelled to undertake, to return to Russia that portion of Bessarabian territory which had been detached from Russia by the Treaty of Paris. Romania was to receive in compensation some islands forming the delta of the Danube and a portion of Dobrushka. As regarded Asia, the port was to cede to Russia Ardahan, Kars, and Batum with its great port on the Black Sea. The Treaty of Berlin gave rise to keen and adverse criticism. Much complaint was made of the curious arrangement which divided the Bulgarian populations into two separate states under wholly different systems of government. This, it was said, is only the example of the Congress of Paris over again. It is just such another futile attempt as that which was made to keep the Danubian principalities separate from each other in the hope of thereby diminishing the influence of Russia and securing greater influence for Turkey. The simple and natural arrangement, it was urged, would have been to unite the whole of these populations at once under one form of government. To that, it was insisted, they must come in the end, and the interval of separation is only more likely to be successfully employed by Russia in spreading her influence, because each division of the population is so small as to be unable to offer any effective resistance to her advances. On the other hand, it was argued by the supporters of the treaty that the Bulgarian question was not so simple and straightforward as might have been supposed, that there was a considerable variety of races, of religions, and of interests enclosed in what some people chose to call Bulgaria, and that no better arrangement could be found than to keep one portion still under the protection of the port, while allowing to the other something that might almost be styled independence. The arrangement which gave Bosnia and Herzegovina to the occupation of Austria became afterwards the subject of sharp controversy. The Prime Minister himself at a later day actually declared that this step was taken in order to put another power, not Russia, on the high road to Constantinople, if the succession to the port should ever become vacant. On the other hand, Austrian statesmen themselves denied that any such intention was in the mind of the Emperor of Austria. They insisted that the occupation was accepted by Austria out of no feeling of individual advantage, but on the contrary, at much inconvenience and some sacrifice, and solely in the interest of the common peace of Europe. Very bitter indeed was the controversy provoked by the surrender to Russia 
of the Bessarabian territory taken from her at the time of the Crimean War. Romania, the gallant and spirited little state, which had thriven surprisingly under her new system of government, was thus plundered in order to satisfy Russia's self-love. Russia had set her heart upon recovering every single one of the advantages, real or only nominal, which she had been compelled to sacrifice at the close of the Crimean War. This was the last remnant of the victory obtained over her at so much cost, and after such a struggle by the combined powers of the West. Now she had regained everything. The Black Sea was open to her war vessels and its shores to her arsenals. The last slight trace of Crimean humiliation was effaced in the restoration of the territory of Bessarabia. Profound disappointment was caused among many European populations, as well as among the Greeks themselves, by the arrangements for the rectification of the Greek frontier. The impression left in the minds of the Greek delegates was that the influence of the English ministers had in every instance been given in favor of Turkey and against the claims of Greece. Thus speaking roughly, it may be said that the effect of the Congress of Berlin on the mind of Europe was to make the Christian populations of the southeast believe that their friend was Russia and their enemies were England and Turkey, to make the Greeks believe that France was their especial friend and that England was their enemy, and to create an uncomfortable impression everywhere that the whole Congress was a pre-arranged business, a transaction with a foregone conclusion, a dramatic performance carefully rehearsed before in all its details and merely enacted as a pageant on the Berlin stage. The latter impression was converted into a conviction by certain subsequent revelations. It came out that Lord Beaconsfield and Lord Salisbury had been entering into secret engagements both with Russia and with Turkey. The secret engagement with Russia was the occasion of a good deal of scandal. The secret engagement was prematurely divulged by the heedlessness or the treachery of a person who had been called in at a small temporary rate of pay to assist in copying dispatches in the Foreign Office. The authenticity of his revelation was denied in the first instance with what appeared to be genuine earnestness but it came out that the denial was a mere quibble as to the meaning of the word authentic. The version of the agreement thus prematurely published by the Globe, a London evening paper, was to all intents and purposes perfectly genuine. The secret treaty proved to be almost exactly as it had been described in advance. It was signed at the Foreign Office on May 30th, some days before Prince Bismarck issued his invitation to the Congress, it was a memorandum determining the points on which an understanding had been come to between Russia and Great Britain, and a mutual engagement for the English and Russian plenipotentiaries at the Congress. It bound England to put up with the handing back of Bessarabia and the cession of the port of Batum. It conceded all the points in advance which the English people believed that their plenipotentiaries had been making brave struggles for at Berlin. Lord Beaconsfield had not then frightened Russia into accepting the Congress on his terms. The call of the Indian troops to Malta had not done the business, nor the reserves, nor the vote of the six millions. Russia had gone into the Congress because Lord Salisbury had made a secret engagement with her that she should have what she specially wanted. The Congress was only a piece of pompous and empty ceremonial. Another secret engagement was that entered into with Turkey. The English government undertook to guarantee to Turkey her Asiatic possessions against all invasion, on condition that Turkey handed over to England the island of Cyprus for her occupation. Lord Beaconsfield afterwards explained that Cyprus was to be used as a place of arms, in other words, England had now formally pledged herself to defend and secure Turkey against all invasion or aggression, and occupied Cyprus in order to have a more effectual vantage ground from which to carry on this project. The difference, therefore, between the policy of the conservative government and the policy of the liberals was now thrown into the strongest possible relief. 
Mr. Gladstone and those who thought with him had always made it a principle of their policy that England had no special and separate interest in maintaining the independence of Turkey. Lord Beaconsfield now declared it to be the cardinal principle of his policy that England, especially England above all, was concerned to maintain the integrity and the independence of the Turkish Empire, that in fact the security of Turkey was as much part of the duty of English statesmanship as the security of the Channel Islands or of Malta. For the moment, the policy of Lord Beaconsfield seemed to be entirely in the ascendant. His return home was celebrated with pomp and circumstance befitting the temperament of the statesman if not indeed quite becoming of such an occasion. The Prime Minister got a great public reception in London. Crowds awaited him at the railway station, which was gaudily decorated and bedizened for the occasion. He made a conquering hero's progress through the streets. Arrived at the Foreign Office, he addressed from the windows an excited and tumultuous crowd, and he proclaimed in words which became memorable that he had brought back peace with honour. This, so far as human eye can yet see, was the climax of that strange career. From the day when Mr. Disraeli first addressed the electors of Wickham, from the day when his first speech was hooted and laughed at in the House of Commons, up to this triumphal reception in the streets of London, and this oration from the windows of the Foreign Office, what a distance he had traversed! years of struggle against what seemed almost insurmountable difficulties, years of steady faith in himself undisturbed by almost universal ridicule, years of rise and fall, of action and reaction, of success and disaster had conducted him appropriately to this climax. At this moment he was probably the most conspicuous public man in the world, unless we make one single exception in favor of Prince Bismarck. He had attained to a position of almost unrivalled popularity in England. Not even in his most successful days was Lord Palmerston ever pursued by such a clamour of noisy public acclamation. The head of the English Prime Minister might well have been turned as he stood at the window of the Foreign Office and addressed his few oracular words to the crowd and heard the wild cheering which followed and knew that all the world had its eyes then fixed on that single figure. He ought to have followed classic advice, and sacrificed at that moment his dearest possession to the gods. No man without sacrifice could buy the lease of such a position and the endurance of such a success. Meanwhile, so far as could be judged by external symptoms and in the metropolis, Mr. Gladstone and his followers were down to their lowest depth their very zero of unpopularity. The London morning newspapers, with the one conspicuous exception of the daily news, were entirely on the side of Lord Beaconsfield. Indeed, with the exception of the daily news, the spectator and the echo, there were no metropolitan papers of any literary name, no papers lying on club tables, which had not declared themselves emphatically in support of Lord Beaconsfield against Mr. Gladstone. The cheap weekly papers, which were read by hundreds of thousands of the working population, were not known to the calculations of society. Nor did society concern itself much about the public opinion of the provinces. In the Midland counties, and still more especially in the north of England, the condition of public feeling was somewhat different from that of London. In the provinces, men examined more coolly the political conditions. They were not carried away by the gossip of the House of Commons and the clubs, and the influence of that which in London is called society. In the provinces on the whole, liberalism still remained popular. Mr. Gladstone would still have been sure of the cheers of a great provincial meeting. But there came a day in London, when passing with his wife through one of the streets, he was compelled to seek the shelter of a friendly hall door, in order to escape from the threatening demonstrations of a little mob of patriots boisterously returning from a jingo carnival. End of section 44